Mobile development is for children. All the cool people are doing web development. So in this free course, we will learn how to build a MERN app from scratch. MERN stands for MongoDB, Express, React and Node. And those four together make a very popular tech stack to build full stack web applications. Full stack means that we are building both the front end, which is the part that you see on the screen in your web browser, and the back end, which is the server that your website communicates with. And the server, on the other hand, has a connection to the database and so on. But we will learn the details of this throughout this course. We will also be using TypeScript in this course instead of vanilla JavaScript. TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, so it's basically a, like a layer on top of it. You can use it anywhere you can use normal JavaScript, but it adds strong typing to the language. Because if you build a medium-sized or a larger project in pure JavaScript, then you are a lunatic. Because in normal JavaScript, you don't have types. And you can basically put every value into any variable at any time. And it's just a matter of time until this whole thing explodes into your face. TypeScript is absolutely superior. It's an awesome language. And this is why we will use it in this course. So before we continue, let's take a look at the project we will actually be building here. Now, as you can see, the project is relatively simple, but it will build a full foundation that you need to build your own MERN applications. And I'm actually not a fan of these tutorials that add too many features because usually no single topic is explained really properly. The tutorial is really bloated and lengthy and no one actually finishes it. So I like to focus on the important parts, make sure that you understand these concepts and then you can add more features on top of it later. The goal of this course is to actually have you finish the project and we will even deploy it to a real web server so you can run it on the internet and not just your local machine. We will do that in a second video. I will talk about this later. And if you ever had trouble understanding the MERN stack, then this video will fix it because I will explain all the concepts that you need to know properly. And as you can already tell, we are building a Tinder clone. No, just kidding. We are building a note-taking application and it will teach you all the CRUD operations. So we will learn how to create new nodes and add it to the database and the screen. We will learn how to update existing nodes, how to delete nodes and of course how to display all these nodes on the screen. We will also do some other stuff like simple form validation which is important. So uh, for example, this title field here is required and only when we actually type something in, we can save this node. When we update a node, this little uh, text down here changes from created to the last updated timestamp. We will learn how to navigate between different pages using React Router DOM. And for the UI, we will use Bootstrap, which is a package that you can use, for example, with React that gives you different UI components and design features. And I know that Tailwind CSS is very popular at the moment, but I still prefer Bootstrap because I think it's easier to use. It already brings stuff like modal dialogues, for example, that you have to build yourself when using Tailwind, like this. It's completely free. It's, in my opinion, just easier to use. And if we use CSS modules, which we will do in this course, then uh, we don't have problems with clashes between different CSS classes. So this makes the organization of the CSS pretty uh, simple, in my opinion. But if you don't know what any of this means, don't worry. We will learn all of this throughout this course. So the navigation bar up here, these buttons, this modal dialog that opens when we click a node, all of this comes from Bootstrap. And we will also make our layout responsive so that when the screen size changes, the layout changes, which again is made easier by Bootstrap. So as you can see, at the full size, we have three columns of nodes, but when the screen gets smaller, we have only two, and then eventually we only have one column. And also the menu up here collapses, and as you can see, this is a really nice view for displaying this website on a mobile phone. So it's completely mobile responsive, which Bootstrap again makes pretty easy in my opinion. And we will learn some CSS tricks like fading out this text here when a node gets too long. So some of these little tricks and of course this hover shadow effect. And since this is supposed to be a full foundation to build your own MERN apps, we also handle authentication in this course. 
using sessions and cookies. So we can log out of our current account, which makes all our nodes disappear. And we can log into a different account or create a whole new one. So because of my insane creativity, I'm gonna call it ASD ASD. The email will be similar and the password is ASD ASD. Okay, this is a password suggestion. This is not my actual password. Just making sure that I'm not leaking my personal data here. Anyway, we can create a new account. Oh, this email address already exists. So we also have validation for this on the back end. So let's choose a different email address and try it again. And we have our new account. Yeah, yeah, let it go, man. <laughs> Which doesn't have any notes yet. So let's add a new node here as well. Which now belongs to this account. When we log out and into our other account, we won't see this node. Because each node is tied to a particular user. Isn't that amazing? And again, this is the foundation for you to later build more stuff on top of it. This is the important pieces. Now we will talk about all these different features later in more detail. And if you're wondering why I use cookie sessions here instead of JWT tokens, I explain my reasoning behind this throughout the series, but it's a nice and easy way to handle user sessions and it doesn't have some downsides that JWTs have. And after we have finished our project here, we will deploy everything to a real web server on Linode, which is a hosting provider. You will find the second video on Linode's channel and I will put a link to it into the video description below. After you have finished this, make sure to also watch the second video. It will not be as long, we will just deploy this whole thing. And then you will have a real full stack web application on real web hosting. Then you can connect it to a domain and then you have your own website for your portfolio or you can build your own project out of it, whatever you want. And Linode was also so nice to provide a free credit for my viewers. So you can go to linode.com slash coding and flow and you get a hundred dollars free credit available for 60 days. Again, I will put a link to this into the video description below together with the link to the second video where we deploy everything. Now let's talk about the prerequisites of this course because this is not a full beginner course. We will not learn the absolute JavaScript basics. So we will not learn what a for loop is or what a variable is. I assume that you already know that, but you don't have to know JavaScript for that. To be honest, if you know any programming language, you will be able to follow along because they're very similar. And I will explain the more advanced language features that we will use. I will also explain how TypeScript works and we will install everything together. If you know a language like Kotlin, for example, also uh, I think Swift is similar or Java, then it will be very easy for you to uh, understand TypeScript because it's the same thing at the end. It's very similar. We will also be using asynchronous JavaScript features, so promises and async and await. And I will again not explain this from scratch, but you can just follow along in my opinion because these features are very straightforward. And when you don't understand something, either just follow along or Google it, which is even better. And again, if you know Kotlin, for example, then async await is very similar to Kotlin coroutines. And there are similar features in other languages as well. The same goes for HTML and CSS. I don't explain everything from the absolute ground up, but you just need to follow along. And unless you are a complete beginner and have never touched any programming language, then I think you will be able to understand everything. And whatever you don't understand, just Google it. I'm also a fan of not learning everything from the absolute basics upwards because I think it's a boring approach to learning programming. I much rather create a project and be okay with not understanding every detail at the beginning and then you can still fill in the gaps later. For example, I never formally learned CSS. I never learned the basics of it, but I built actual projects that use CSS. And when I later was wondering what a specific um, keyword or feature meant, then I Googled it and learned it when I actually needed it. I think that's a much more fun approach to learning programming than going through these beginner courses where you spend three weeks just learning the fundamentals of CSS. That's super boring. We will also install all the necessary software together. So we will install Node.js, all the necessary packages. We will set up our MongoDB database. You don't need to know anything about that. And if something is unclear, either Google it or you can also leave a comment below and ask other people or ask me. I'm reading all of my comments basically. I don't respond to all of them, but I read all of them. 
Just one more learning tip for this course. Instead of just following along everything step by step, I recommend that you build a project that's slightly different. For example, create a slightly different layout. Use different data types. Maybe even don't build a node app like I do here. Maybe build a to-do list app so that you use the same concepts that you learn here, but you apply them in a slightly different way. I really like this approach because it forces you to understand what I'm explaining here and not just blindly follow along. If you are a beginner and it's too difficult for you, then you can also just follow along step by step. No problem. It's just a little learning tip. I also want to quickly explain how uh, React works overall. So let's take a look at the app again. When you use a React website, then you will notice that it feels more like a mobile app almost rather than a classical website. For example, when we navigate to a different page, you notice that the navbar here at the top stays in place and it doesn't reload. So we are not actually reloading the whole page because a React app by default is a single page, basically. And all the contents within the single page are loaded by JavaScript. This is why when we switch back to the node screen, you see this progress bar for a short moment. This is because we are not actually getting the full page sent from the server. We are only getting the shell, which is this page with all the static elements, but without the data that we are loading from the server, so without our nodes. And then with JavaScript code, we are loading these nodes. And this is why we see a short progress bar and then all this pops up here on the screen. Just like a normal app, our code is sending a HTTP request to the server and it gets back JSON and then turns it into these nodes, which you can see on the screen. You don't need to understand this right now. We will take a closer look at this later. But if you're coming from mobile app development, for example, then this will feel very familiar to you because React websites are basically apps on the internet. Now, since JavaScript is used to load the data, this also means that React apps by default don't work without JavaScript. So in the Chrome developer tools, we can actually uh, disable JavaScript, reload the page, and you can see this little text here. You need to enable JavaScript to run this app. But this is usually not a problem because about 98% of all websites on the internet use JavaScript. So it's very rare for a client to not have JavaScript enabled because it's required to view almost any website on the internet. So let's turn this back on here. And then we can see our website again. Now this so-called client-side rendering approach where the website loads more data from the server after it is already displayed in the browser has benefits and downsides. You can Google them and read up on them if you want. And there are also frameworks that combine the best of both worlds. For example, Next.js, which is another framework on top of React, where you have more control over what data you will load client-side and what pages you load server-side where all the data is already in the page that comes from the server. I'm a huge fan of Next.js. It's my favorite framework for my own projects, but it's quite an advanced framework. And again, it's built on top of React. So you should learn normal React before putting hands on Next.js. And this course here will teach you all the foundations that you need to know. Okay, and now the actual course starts and we will focus on the backend first. So we will build the server and the endpoints first. Then we will build our React website and connect everything together. I will also put a link to the project on GitHub into the video description below so you can check out the code there. And then I wish you a lot of fun. And don't forget to like this video, please, and share it with someone that could need it. It really helps the channel and it makes it more interesting for me to create more free courses in the future. So it's a win for both of us. All right, have fun. All right, in order to write code, we need a code editor. And a very popular choice among web developers is Visual Studio Code, or short VS Code, which is a free code editor by Microsoft. You can use this one, you can use a different one, it's up to you. If you want to use VS Code, just go to code.visualstudio.com or type VS Code into Google, download it, install it. The installation process is not difficult. Next, we need Node.js installed. Node is the N in the MERN acronym. And Node allows JavaScript code to run in a server environment. So normally JavaScript is meant as a language for web browsers. So it only runs like in like Chrome, for example. But Node.js brought JavaScript to a server so we can write our backend in JavaScript too. So again, this is of course completely free. You can go to Node.js.org or just type Node.js into Google. And here we want to download the latest LTS version. LTS stands for long-term support. 
And it basically means that you can use this version for many years without having to update it. All right, so we click this and download this. And when it's finished downloading, we click the installer file. Okay, so now we just have to follow this wizard here. Next, um, we read all the license agreement. Okay, I've read everything. Next, then we can keep this as it is. Next, we can keep the defaults here as well. Add to path, yeah, looks fine to me. Particularly important is the node package manager, which we later need to install packages and stuff like that. But the default options here should suffice. We click next again. This option here should not be necessary for us, so we can skip this, click on next and then install. And then we wait until this is finished. All right, looks like this succeeded, so we click on finish. And to check if this actually worked, we want to open the command line. So on Windows, just hit the Windows key and type CMD. And on a Mac, it works similarly. You probably already know how, otherwise Google it. And if you use Linux, then you are a nerd anyway. And you probably use the command line all the time. We just want to check if Node was installed properly. So what we do is we type in Node minus minus version. And this should show us the latest version here we installed. If it says something like node is not a recognized keyword or command, then uh, try to install it again. Maybe restart your computer, maybe this helps. Otherwise, Google the installation instructions or leave a comment below so others can help you. But if you followed along, it should have installed it properly. And when we type in npm dash dash version, then it should show us the version of npm that we installed, which is again the node package manager. Okay, we can close this. Close this here as well. Before we start building our server, let's first understand why we need a backend server in the first place. In short, we use a backend server for everything that we can't trust the front end to handle. Because whatever code we write for the front end, in our case, our React code later, is loaded into the web browser. And everyone who is a bit technical or a programmer is able to actually look into this code, even though it will be minified they can look into it and they can tinker with it. Which means that we can't put anything secret or critical in there. For example, we can't put the credentials for our database into this code because users would be able to see this if they inspect the code. We also can't trust form validation on the front end because even though it will be enforced if they use the website the normal way as it's intended, they can still change it by tinkering with the code and this way circumvent the restrictions we set up. The backend, our server on the other hand, is like a black box that people can't look into because it runs on a different machine, it doesn't run in the browser, and the only way to get data from the server is by sending a message there, sending a request and saying, hey server, I want this piece of information. And then the server says, okay, but do you have the correct credentials for that? Are you authenticated? Then uh, the front end can send the password or whatever authentication method we use as an example and then the server ultimately decides if it fulfills the request or not. But users can't go into our server and change code there or anything like that. For outsiders it's just a black box. So to summarize our front end can't contain anything that's critical or anything that's secret. This all goes into our back end. The front end is only the user interface that communicates with the back end but it's not safe, it's not secure. All right, now let's set up our node server. And the first step is to create a folder somewhere on your computer where you wanna save this project, that's up to you. And in here we create another folder, which I'm gonna call backend. This will contain the code of our node backend project. We go into this folder and in here we wanna open the command line. On Windows, you do this by holding shift down and then right clicking and then open PowerShell window here. Depending on your configuration, this might open the older command line, but it doesn't matter, both are fine for what you want to do. If you are on Mac or Linux, you also have a command line available, just look up how you open it. If you don't know how to do it, there are instructions in Google. Okay, let's make this here a bit bigger so we can see everything. And in here we type in npm init, dash y. And whenever we write something in the command line, you have to write it the exact same way as I do, otherwise it won't work. The command line is not very forgiving. Okay, we type this in and press enter. 
and it looks like it did something. It created this package file here. Uh, we don't see the file extension here in Windows right now, but this is a JSON file. So the full name is package.json. Next, we want to open this project with this file we just created. And we could be old, boring boomers and open it through VS Code, but cool modern people open projects over the command line. So we stay in here because, as you can see, we are still inside this backend folder. That's important. And then we type in code and then a space and a period. So code dot enter and this opens this project in VS Code. Now if this window here pops up, we uh, want to trust this project, but this might not pop up for you. And here's our package.json file, which we created a moment ago. This package.json file is basically the configuration for our project, where we will also later have all the dependencies listed that we need, all the packages that we use. Now, since we typed in dash y, it used the default settings for all this metadata here. And actually, uh, this stuff, or most of it, is only important if you want to release a library, if you want to release a package. For our server project that we use ourselves, this is actually not important. We don't need a description and the name and version doesn't matter. Keyword authors. You can fill this out if you want, but you don't need to. We also don't need to specify a license because no one else will have access to our code. And now it's actually time to install our first dependency. Oh, that's exciting. Our first dependency will be TypeScript, which we have to install in order to use this language instead of JavaScript. So we want to open a command line again, and we can do this directly inside VS Code as well. So we click up here on Terminal and on New Terminal. And here next to it, you can see the shortcut. For me, it's Control shift ö uh, If you're not a German, you probably don't have an Ö can use whatever shows up there. Okay, now we have a terminal here. And now we type in npm install dash dash save dash dev like this. Just type it the exact same way. TypeScript, all lowercase. Enter. And this installs TypeScript in this project. And as we can see, this new entry here popped up in our package.json under this dev dependencies key. Dependencies are just packages that we use for our project. For example, later Bootstrap is a dependency as well for our layout. All these different libraries that others have made for us and that we can use. And there are two types of dependencies, normal dependencies and dev dependencies. Dev dependencies are the ones that we don't actually need in production. We only need them while we are writing the code. So we put this into this separate key here so that we later save space when we deploy this project to production because those ones here will be skipped. Those are only for development. Okay, down here it also says new major version of npm available. It's always good to update this. So let's copy this command here and type it in. You can paste it with a right click and press enter to install the latest version of npm. We also see that it created two new entries up here in our file directory. One is the package log JSON, which is related to the package.json. We don't have to worry about this. This is generated automatically. And node modules contains yeah, the packages that we installed, the dependencies, which is TypeScript in this case, but there will be more in there later. All right, and a TypeScript project needs a TypeScript configuration file, which contains some information on how TypeScript should behave. Otherwise, it won't work. So we go into the terminal again and we type in npx. This time it's not npm, it's npx. And the difference is that npx doesn't install packages, it executes packages basically. That's all we need to know. So we type in npx tsc, which is short for TypeScript, but we have to type in tsc, not TypeScript. It might be short for TypeScript compiler, I'm not sure actually. Just type in npx tsc dash dash init. Enter, and this creates a new file for us, which is this tsconfig.json here. Let's open it and take a look in it. Oh, a lot of scary stuff. Most of the options in here are commented out, so they are inactive because they are optional. And the ones here, if you want to know what they are for, you can read up on them. Uh, we don't have to change anything in here right now. It's all set up properly for us, but we have to make some changes here later. Then we will get back into this file. Okay. Now it's time to install Express, and Express is the E in the MERN stack. 
It's the framework that allows us to build a server, basically. So Node.js is just the, the foundation where the code runs on, and Express is the actual library that allows us to write the server code and the endpoints and everything. So again, in the terminal, we type in npm, so not npx this time, npm again, install. And by the way, there's a short form for install, which is just I. Let's use this in the future without save dev this time, because this is not a dev dependency that goes in here like TypeScript, it's a normal dependency, which we need in production. And then we type in express, enter. And this installed express here under this dependencies key. For a normal JavaScript project, this is enough. In a TypeScript project, we often have to install also a, a package that contains the type so that our code works properly and TypeScript knows what types the different variables and functions have. So once again, we type in npm i for install. Types are dev dependencies because we don't need them in production. So again, dash dash save dash dev. Add types slash express. Type it exact same way I did and press enter again, which adds another entry in the dev dependencies, the express types. Now, this always installs the latest version of these dependencies. If you watch this tutorial sometime in the future, then these version numbers will be higher than the ones you can see on the screen. And sometimes when these packages get updated, things break, especially when the number here at the very front changes. If this happens, some things I show in the tutorial might stop working because they changed this meanwhile. Then the best way for you to go about this is to Google the changes. You can read the release notes for the dependency on GitHub, for example, and try to implement the changes yourself. If you can't get this to work and you can't figure out how to use the latest version, then you can always install the version I used here in this tutorial. So for example, instead of just npm i express, you can also add at the end an add and then the version number, which in this case would be 4.18.2. If you do it like this, it will install this exact version and everything will work like it works in my tutorial. But again, it's better for you if you actually try to figure this out by yourself. And now let's actually create our first little server. So here on the left side in this file explorer, we right click and create a new file, which we call server.ts. TS stands for TypeScript. If it was a normal JavaScript file, then it would be .js but we are not peasants, we use TypeScript here. All right, and for now, just type exactly what I type here. First, we have to uh, import express into this file. Express is the package we just installed. So we type import express from, and then in quotation marks, and in JavaScript and TypeScript code, we can use single quotes and double quotes. Um, in most situations, it doesn't matter. I will use double quotes here just to keep it consistent. And here we type in express and semicolons at the end of a line are optional in JavaScript as well, but it's good practice to add them. So that's what we're going to do here. In the next line, we write const app with const, we create a, a variable that we can change the value of later. But again, those are JavaScript basics. And then we call express like this. And the app is basically our server. This is where we later add different endpoints and everything. We also have to define a port, which we set to 5000. Port is basically a connection point on a server, and you have to set this to a number. Some numbers are occupied already, so there are certain numbers that people use by convention, like 5000 or 8000, but a lot of different ones will work. You could probably type in 4993 and it would work as well, but you will go fine with 5000. And also some web hosting services require a specific port number. So this always has to go into a consideration. React, for example, uses port 3000 by default. So we want to use different ports for both of them. Otherwise, we can't run them simultaneously on our local machine. Okay, and then below, we take our app variable again and call.get. And between the parentheses, we pass a slash as a string, so in quotation marks, comma, and then we pass an arrow function here, which looks like this, another pair of parentheses, rec, comma, and res. Those are the two arguments that this function gets passed. Then we make a right arrow like this with an equal sign and a greater than symbol. 
curly braces. And in here we can uh, write the code of this function. So this is an error function here. It's like a function without a name. There's a similar feature in Kotlin and other languages as well. At the end of this get curl here, we put a semicolon before we forget it. And in here we take this res curl.send and pass hello world as a string, semicolon. This is our first endpoint, which we will call in a moment and we will get the string back. But before this works, we have to uh, start the server, which we do the following way. Below we call app.listen, pass the port we defined up there, 5000, and another error function, but this time it doesn't take any arguments, so it looks like this. And this will start the server, and this is basically just a callback. And in this callback, we want to show a log message just so that we can see, okay, we actually started the server and there was no crash or anything. So let's just write the log message in here, which in JavaScript we do like this. Server running on port colon. And then we append the port number at the end again, not pots, port. Okay, nice. And in VS Code, by default, you actually have to save your files. It doesn't happen automatically. So I press Control S. And now we want to start this whole server. And normally in Node, if you want to start a file, you type in Node in the command line and then the name of the file. So this would be server.ts. The problem is this only works with JavaScript files because Node doesn't know how to execute TypeScript by default. It has to be compiled to JavaScript first. And we do this with the following command npx again, tsc. Enter, and this turns this TypeScript code that we have in our project into JavaScript code. As you can see here on the left, it now created this server.js file. And this is the JavaScript version of our server.ts file. This is automatically generated. We don't have to understand this. This is not how a human would write JavaScript. It's how the compiler writes it with optimizations and everything. We don't actually have to understand this file. It's just interesting to take a look at it because this is the file we now can run when we type in node server.js this time. And as we can see, it now says server running on port, which is our own text that we typed into the callback. And here on Windows, I also have to allow access. That's fine. Okay, and now our server is running on port 5000. And now you can just open the web browser and type in localhost colon 5000 into the URL bar. And this is now our server here. It says hello world. Congratulations, you are now a Node backend developer. The tutorial is over. Happy birthday. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, this is just the beginning. A real web server is much more complex than what we have set up here. And by the way, what we have set up here, let's close this, is a an endpoint for an HTTP GET request. If we open a website in a web browser, it will do a GET request. If you have built apps with networking features before, then you might know that there's also, for example, POST request to send data to a server, patch, delete, and so on. We will use these other HTTP methods later to uh, modify our nodes. But yeah, this is a GET request, and this is how we set it up by calling .get on our Express app. It's also a good idea to organize our code better because otherwise later when we compile our code, we have this huge mix between JavaScript and TypeScript files. For now, let's delete this. We don't need this right now. We only need this when we actually run our server later in production. So we delete this and for organization, we create a folder in here, which we call SRZ, which is short for source. Well, that's the source code of our project. That's just a naming convention. And we put the server.ts file in there. Everything that's configuration for our project goes outside of source and into source we put actual TypeScript files that contain the code for the different endpoints and so on. And next we want to tell the TypeScript compiler that it should put these generated JavaScript files also into a, its own folder so our project isn't cluttered with it. So we open the tsconfig file again and we search for the option that's called out dir, so output directory. We remove the comment here at the beginning. So we activate this basically, and we append dist here at the end, which puts the generated code into a folder called dist, which is short for distribution. And just because I have OCD, let's align this here again properly and save this file. Let's try running our npx tsc 
command again. But first we have to stop our server. While it's running, we can't add any commands here. So we press Ctrl Z, which stops our server. Now it's not running anymore. And again, we try our npx tsc to compile our TypeScript code. You don't have to do this right now. You can just watch me do it. And now our code is properly organized into this dist folder here, which mimics the shape of our source folder. And now if we want to run this file, we have to type in node like before, but this time dist slash server.js because it's inside this dist folder, right? So let's try it again. The server is running localhost 5000. It's still there. Nice. Oh, here was the old window. But of course, it's annoying to uh, repeat this whole process every time we make a change to our code. Every time compile the project, type in node this server and so on. So we can install some dependencies that make this process much easier for us. So let's stop the server again and delete this dist folder here because we will only need this compiled code in production. In development, we will use something different. The package we are used to automatically restart our server whenever we make changes to the code is called Nodemon. And as you can see on the NPM page, by the weekly downloads, it's a very popular package. If you want to learn more details about this package, you can check out its page here, but it's pretty straightforward to use. As you can see, we install it as a dev dependency because we only need it in development. So let's copy this and paste it in the command line. And again, it adds another entry in our dev dependencies here. Now, this only works with JavaScript by default, but luckily there is another dependency that automatically works together with Nodemon to uh, transpile our TypeScript code into JavaScript on the fly, which is called tsnode. So again, we want to install this as well. And here's the command for that. And by the way, this minus D with an uppercase D is the short form for dash dash save dev. So we copy this, paste it in here, install this as well. And now instead of compiling our server TS file and then starting this server JS file that's generated, we can just start our server TS file directly. And we do this by typing in npx nodemon to execute nodemon and then our server TS file, but it's inside our source folder. So we type src slash server.ts. And this now starts our server file. It works because we have TS node installed, which compiles the TypeScript code on the fly. And not only that, now if we make changes to any file, the server automatically restarts. So let's add a comma here between hello world, because I think this is the correct way to write it. Save it with control S. And as you can see down here, it automatically restarts our server. So now when I open localhost again, we see the new version. We don't have to uh, compile anything manually, it just works. But we can make this even shorter. We can go into our package.json file and add a script here. A script is basically a shorthand to execute a command. We call this script start, which is just a convention, I think. And then in uh, quotation marks, we type in the command that we want to execute. And when we do it in here, we don't need the npx. We can just type in nodemon. And the same as before, src server.ts. Let's save this and try it out. So I'm going to stop the server down here with control Z and then I have to uh, confirm it with a Y, short for yes. And now when we type in npm start, we execute the script here, which now starts nodemon the same as before. Nice. We can also specify the main entry point of our server up here. For our use case, that's not necessary because on our production server later, we will just run our server file directly. But I think some web hostings need this. So it's probably a good idea to still define it. And our main entry point will be uh, the server.js file in the dist folder later. This is where our server is actually started. Because Nodemon and TS node are not suitable for production use. Let's save this again. And there's one more thing we want to set up in this part, and that's ESLint. So once again in the command line, we stop our running server, type npm install, short i, minus uppercase d, 
short for safe dev, ESLint. So we install ESLint to the dev dependencies. Enter. And there it is with the latest version. And then we type in npx eslint dash dash init, which creates a new file, which is a configuration file for eslint. But we have to go through some short steps here in order to set this up. We need to install the following packages. Okay, to proceed, we type in y for yes to install this. And then we configure this file. And you switch options with the arrow keys on your keyboard. How would you like to use ESLint? To check syntax and find problems, that's reasonable. What type of modules does your project use? JavaScript modules, import-export, this is what we use. Which framework does your project use? React, Vue.js or none of these, none of these because we are in Node here. Does your project use TypeScript? Yes, of course. Where does your code run, browser or Node? As I explained earlier, this is running with Node.js, so we select it. What format do you want your config file to be in? And here we select JavaScript again. And now it has to install some new dependencies, which of course we do. Which package manager do you want to use? NPM, which we have been using all the time. And then it installs some stuff. As we can see, some new dependencies pop up and this new .eslint rz.js file which is the configuration for ESLint. Now, even though we selected Node in the configuration, it adds browser colon true. I don't know why, I don't know if this is a bug, but we should change this to Node and save this. And Lint helps us find problems in our code. Some of those problems are errors, where we just write invalid syntax and we can't run our code at all. But some of these problems are just bad habits that we should avoid because they can cause problems later. Let's see an example of this. One such bad habit is circumventing TypeScript's null safety or undefined safety. So for example, let's say this port could be undefined. For example, because we get this value from somewhere else and we don't know if this actually contains a value or not. This would work here because this method can work with an undefined port, but some functions would complain. And they would say, hey, we don't accept an possibly undefined value here, we need a number. And one way to fix this is to actually check if the value is undefined or not, just with a normal old if statement. But another way is to tell the compiler, hey, relax, we know that this value will never be undefined, which we do with this non-null assertion operator, which is an exclamation mark behind the variable. This way we tell the compiler, hey, we know that this port number will always have a value. But as we can see here, we don't actually know this. We can make mistakes this way. This is why it's a bad habit. And ESLint will tell us that this is a bad habit by running it. So we type in npx ESLint. Then a dot, which executes ESLint in this folder, if I'm not mistaken right now, dash dash ext. This way we define the extensions of the files that we want to check. And we want to check our .ts files. So this is what we type in. We press enter and now this checks our code. And as you can see, it found one problem, forbidden non-null assertion. This is just a warning, it's not an error. So our code would still run. But this tells us, hey, this is probably not a good idea and we should do something else with it. So let's change this back, run it again, and this problem will not show up again. Now, of course, it's a good idea again to uh, create a script for this, so we don't have to type this out all the time. So in our package.json file, let's add the lint command. Again, we don't have to type the npx this time, just eslint period ext.ts and then we can run this with npm run lint. Now why do we have to enter run now and before we just typed npm start and not npm run start? This is because start has this shorthand. So npm start is a shorthand for npm run start. However, for other types of commands like lint, we have to type it out like this. npm run lint Let's add our problem here again to see if it still works. And yeah, it works. Change this back because we are not bad coders, right? But it's still a bit annoying to always execute this over the command line. 
it would be much nicer if the IDE or the code editor would show us this directly. And there's an IDE extension for this. So here in VS Code on the left side, we can open this extensions tab. And it's already here under the popular extensions, ESLint. And this extension will check our code directly with our ESLint configuration. So we don't have to execute this in the command line. So let's install this and see if this changed anything. Make this here bad once again. And as you can see now, we have this yellow squiggly line and the ESLint warning shows up directly in our code. Nice. So this will save our behind in the future. Of course, you can check out the other extensions here as well. There are some really cool ones in there. We will get back to this later, but for now we are done with this. Now there's one more file we want to add to our project and that's the git ignore file. If you already have programming experience, then you probably already know what git ignore is. It's a file that defines other files and folders in our project that we don't want to commit to Git. This is important, for example, if you want to push your project to GitHub for others to see, because some folders are just big and we don't need them. So we save space and bandwidth by not committing them. But there are also certain files that we must not commit because they contain, for example, database passwords. And all these files have to be added to this Git ignore file. So we create a new file here in our project outside of the source folder. And the name is dot, that's important, it has to start with this dot, git ignore, just as one word like this. Now, how do we know what we have to put in there? Either we can decide this ourselves, but there are templates for this available on GitHub. And as you can see, it's from GitHub's very own account, so those are basically official files. We can copy this, here copy raw contents. And you can either look this up yourself or you can go to my GitHub project in the description below and go into the git ignore file there and copy its contents. And then we just paste this whole stuff in here and save it. This contains more than we actually need, but that's not a problem. It's better to have too much in here than too little and accidentally expose stuff that we don't want to expose. As you can see, the node modules folder is in here as well. So if we commit this to git, then this will be ignored. And it's not necessary because this contains only uh, the code of the packages we installed, but we can always install these packages from our package.json file here. So here we have to find what packages we need. And later, for example, when we pull this code on our web server without the node modules folder, we just type in npm install and all the latest versions here will be installed and this node modules folder will be uh, recreated. And the main reason why we don't push this is just because it's a huge folder and we don't actually need it. Our ESLint and tsconfig files, on the other hand, are pushed to GitHub because they contain configuration that we want to keep when we work in a team, right? Then everyone should use the same lint rules and TypeScript configuration. So those are not in this git ignore file because we want to push them usually. Okay, the next step is to set up the MongoDB database and connect it to our backend server. But there's one more thing I want to clarify before we start with this. And that is, you might be wondering, is this what we are building here, a RESTful API? Is this a so-called REST API? And if not, what's the difference between a REST API and our server that we are building here? A REST API is also a backend server, but it fulfills certain constraints. And REST APIs are usually servers that are accessed by many different clients. And this is why they follow certain rules. One of those rules is that they don't contain any state. Our server will later contain state because users will be able to log in. And for each login, there will be a session in our database that connects this user and lets the server know that this user is logged in. And this is a violation of the RESTful constraints because this is not a public REST API we are building here, it's our own backend server for only our own single client. But you can build a RESTful API with the exact same stuff we are using here, with Express and Node, the same code, the same endpoints. You can also use this to build a public API. Maybe that's an interesting project for you to build, a public API that serves some data that people can get from your server, just as an idea. Okay, and now in the next section, we will install MongoDB. Okay, the next step is to set up our MongoDB database. MongoDB is the M in the MERN acronym, and it's the place where we put our data later, like our nodes and also our user data. 
And MongoDB is a so-called schemaless database, which basically means that we can put any data into any document we want in any combination and it will work. That's the opposite of a database like SQL, where you have a certain schema that you have to adhere to. And all entries within a table basically have the same columns and the same data types. And if you want to change this structure, then you have to migrate this table. A schemaless database is a bit like the wild west of databases, but it's also how Firebase's database works, for example. It's also schemaless, so it's a very popular concept and it works in many situations. It has downsides and benefits like everything in life, and if you want to learn more about the differences, then you can look them up in Google. But we will use this here, and again, it's a very popular choice, and it works for many big companies. And to host this database, you basically have two choices. You can either self-host it on your own server, or you can use a service like MongoDB Atlas, which is a hosting provider for MongoDB databases. The benefit of using a service like Atlas is that it takes care of many things that you would have to do yourself otherwise, like scaling, security concerns, encryption, backups, and so on. So I'm a fan of using these services because it saves us time. The downside is that in production, we have to pay money for this. We don't have to pay money for this tutorial because they have a free tier, but if you want to scale up, of course, this costs money, but I think it's worth the convenience you get. That's why we will use MongoDB Atlas in this tutorial. And to create an account there, we go to mongodb.com slash cloud slash Atlas, or just type MongoDB Atlas into Google. It's probably the faster way. And we click on start free. And by the way, this is the most ugly <laughs> button animation I've ever seen but it's probably a rich company and it works for them. So maybe we should take an example of that. All right, so we have to fill out some data here. First name, last name, no company. And here I'm gonna use a email address that I've prepared just for recording. So we have a completely new setup, which is recording at codinginflow.com. And we pick a secure password, which I've already prepared. All right, we agree the terms of service and privacy policy, which you can read if you want and create an Atlas account. And we have to verify our email. So let's do that real quick. Okay, so I've verified the email. So let's go back to MongoDB slash account. Remove this part here from the URL to get to the login screen. It locks us in automatically. Otherwise, just type in your email and password you just signed up with. And another cool thing about MongoDB Atlas is that they give you this backend, this UI to work with. And you don't have to do this over the command line. So let's start setting this up. First of all, as they say here, the current IP address should be added to a whitelist. So let's do this by clicking on this button here. And it does this automatically. We later have to go to the network settings again and add the IP address of our server, but not for now. And now we can actually create a new database by clicking on this button. And then we have to do some setup here. We want to start with a free account, so we have to select the shared hosting option. Later, if you are in production, you can decide to use a dedicated or serverless configuration, most likely dedicated, but for now we use shared. So we click on create and we have to do some setup here. We have to select where our database will be hosted because MongoDB Atlas works together with these big hosting providers. You can select whatever you want. I'm gonna stick to Amazon. A location for our database. And it makes sense to pick a location that's close to the location of your deployment server later. I'm gonna stick with Frankfurt, which is here in Germany where I live. Cluster tier M0 Sandbox is the free tier, which of course has some limitations, but it's enough for playing around and it's also enough even for small production projects. Backup is not enabled in uh, M0 clusters, but that's fine. And termination protection is a relatively new feature. It makes sense, it just adds an additional step before you can delete your cluster, which is always good to have, because you never want to delete this by accident. We can give it a name. The name doesn't really matter in my opinion. You can give it something descriptive, but I'm just going to stick to cluster zero. And we click on create cluster. And now it charges your credit card with $120. No, I'm just kidding. It's completely free unless you upgrade to a higher cluster. And now we have to do some more setup here. How would you like to authenticate your connection? We uh, keep username and password. So here we type in our username. I'm going to call it Florian and I'm going to auto generate a secure password. 
copy it because we later need this in our code, of course, and we create this user. Now the user is created here. We want to connect from a local environment and we already added our current IP address to this list, so this should be enough. And then we click finish and close. And here is our shiny new database. Can you smell that? That's the smell of a fresh database. We can browse collections, but we don't have any yet. But we want to connect our code, our backend server to this database. So we click on connect. Then we have different options. You can connect over the command line with a tool they have, which is called Compass. But we want to click on connect your application. And then we want to copy this string here by clicking on this button because we need this in our code. And then we open our code again. And this time I will open the project one layer higher. The last time we were inside this backend folder and opened the project from here. But now I want to open it from this folder here where we can see the backend folder. The only reason for this is that this way we have the backend and later the front end folders both opened in VS Code. You don't have to do this, you can also open them separately. I do this because I want to push them to the same GitHub repository so you can look at the code later. This is also where there is this .git folder which probably doesn't exist on your side. It doesn't have to, you can ignore this. So again I'm going to open this by shift right clicking to open the command line here. And then I just type in code then a space and then a period to open this folder. And we can close this. And this is what I meant. Now we open this whole coding and flow MERN folder here so we can see the back end and later the front end both inside this project view. Now our MongoDB credentials are of course data that we don't want to uh, give to anybody willy nilly. It's sensitive data. That's why it's a good idea to also not push this information into the GitHub repository. In other words, we want to put it somewhere in a file that's included in our git ignore. And the correct place for this kind of stuff is the env file, which is included in this git ignore we pasted earlier. And in there you put environment variables, which can be configuration that changes depending on where you run your server, for example on localhost or on a real deployment. But it's also the place where people usually put sensitive data like database credentials. So what we do is here on the root folder, we right click and create a new file, which we call .env. The same name as you can read here on the git ignore. And in here we want to put our MongoDB connection string. So we put yeah, a variable in here that we have to give a name. You can call it whatever you want. I'm going to name it mongo underscore connection underscore string. And the convention for these kind of constants is to write them in all uppercase with underscores, but you can also use camel case or whatever you want. Then an equal sign. And then we paste the connection string we just copied. And since this is just one string without spaces, we don't have to add quotation marks here. We can if we want, but we can also keep it like this. This part here in front of the colon is our username we just defined when we set up our cluster. And we have to replace this part here for the password. I'm just going to paste the password here because it's just for this course. I don't actually use this in production, but of course you should keep your password secret and only share it with team members or whoever is allowed to know it. And let's also put our port number in here because this can also change between deployments. So you usually want to put this into your env file. So you just write port equals and 5000. Then we save this with Control S. Remember in VS Code by default you have to save your files. And by the way you can see that node modules here is grayed out now, which indicates that this folder is not pushed to a GitHub. It might not be grayed out on your side if you didn't actually deploy this project to GitHub just as a node and env will later also be grayed out on my side because it's included in the git ignore file. But I did a little mistake. We have to put this env file into our backend folder, not here on the root folder because it belongs to our backend code. So let's move it in here, drag and drop, very simple. And now you can also see that it's actually grayed out because now it recognizes the git ignore file in the same folder. But this is only necessary if you open this parent folder like I did. If the backend folder is your root folder, then of course the end file goes in there. So just put the end file in your backend folder basically. And now we need to install another package that allows us to load this env file because Node doesn't do this by default. So we want to open the terminal again. 
but it's important that we are inside the backend folder. So we type in CD and it should be the same on Windows, Mac and Linux. Backend. CD stands for change directory. We go in here and in here we want to install our new package. So the same as before we type npmi.env which is the name of the package that allows us to load n files. And if you want to learn more about this package, there is a page for basically all of them on this npmjs.com website. You can basically read about any package here. As you can see, it's a popular package as well. It shows us the configuration options and so on. But don't worry, I'll show you how this works. But first we want to install another dependency, npmi. This one is called mongoose. And Mongoose is a object modeling for Node.js. So it's basically a package that makes it easier to work with the MongoDB database. So it's less of an arcane language as the original. As you can see, it creates these objects and types and it's really cool. It has a Umongos documentation, which can make you lose the will to live if you see how much information is in there. But you don't have to know all of this. And I'll show you the stuff you have to know, of course, in this course. And just as a reminder, all the packages we install are inside our package.json file here. They get added to the dependencies block. And by the way, in the last video, before I pushed the code, I swapped the order of dev dependencies and dependencies because I think they should be at the top, but it's not necessary. The order here doesn't matter. Okay, and now let's go into our server TS file again and start this connection to our database. So we want to add two more dependencies here at the top. The first one is the .env dependency we just installed and we should import it as early as possible. That's why I put it in the very first line. This makes sure that our environment variables are available when the app starts. So up here we type import and then in quotation marks .env slash config, which is basically all that's necessary to set up and configure .env and our env file. And we also want to import mongoose to use it. So again import, but this time without the quotation marks here, the same way we imported express. Because this up here is actually just a shorthand over writing import.env like we did for express and then calling config on it. By importing it like this, we uh, automatically call this config. I found this somewhere in Stack Overflow. So mongoose, we uh, import the following way. Import mongoose and it auto completes it by default. Isn't that amazing? Otherwise type it out as you can see it here. And this allows us to use the mongoose package in this file here, in the server TS file. And now we connect mongoose to our MongoDB database the following way. And again, I have this from the documentation or other tutorials, but you can just follow my instructions here. We call mongoose.connect. And as you can see, we have nice auto completion in VS code. And here we want to insert our MongoDB connection string, which is inside our end file. So we uh, copy the name of this variable and then we type process.env to access our environment variables and the name of this variable. Now this shows us a warning because this environment variable could be undefined, but connect is expecting a string that actually has a value. We will take care of this in a moment. Here we call dot then. Because connect returns a promise, which is basically an asynchronous operation, an operation that takes a moment, and with dot then we can define what we want to do after this succeeded. Now later we will use async await, which is some synthetic sugar around promises, which makes them a bit nicer to use, but we can't use async await here on the top level, in case you're wondering. If you don't know yet what this all means, just follow along. So inside then we have to pass a function. So we add another pair of parentheses, then a right arrow as we did before, and a pair of curly braces. And we can also put a semicolon down here. And here we define what we want to do after this connection succeeded. Let's write a log message with console.log, which says mongoose connected. And we also want to start our server here after our MongoDB connection was successful. We could keep it like this, following one after another. But if the connection failed for some reason, we don't want to start our server because it wouldn't work properly without the database, right? So we can actually cut this out and put it in here. And to let the code editor format our code, we can press Shift Alt F, which should align it properly. 
okay, but we also added our port to the environment variable files. So we shouldn't be getting it from here. We should get it from the process env here as well. So let's create a variable for our port so we don't have to repeat process.env all the time. We write it as a const because this value shouldn't change. And the port is process.env.port in all uppercase. But again, as you can see, the value could be undefined because we never have the guarantee that we actually put these values into our environment variables. Now app.listen and console.log, they don't show a warning because they would accept an undefined port. The code will still run. Mongoose is not so forgiving, they want a real value. Now there are different ways to handle this. One way is to uh, do what I already showed earlier when we uh, took a look at ESLint, is adding this non-null assertion operator. This way we tell the compiler, hey, we know that this value is not null, please just accept it. As you can see, ESLint doesn't like this because it's a bit dangerous. But our code would run, so let's try it out. Let's save the file and run npm start. And if everything is successful, we should see mongoose connected and then server running on the port, blah, blah, blah. We should also add a catch block here after then. So before the semicolon actually, we call dot catch, which is basically the opposite of the dot then for promises. So we have then for when the promise was successful and we have catch for when there was an error. And in here we can just call console.error, but without the parentheses, because we are not actually calling this function here, we are referencing it. So catch will call this error function and pass the arguments that it gets, and this argument is the error itself. So this way it will print this to the error console, which is basically the same as console.log, just that it's red text, basically, and a different place where we can see it, depending on where we deploy it. Now what happens if we forget to define this value here? Let's remove it for a moment, save this file, and try to run this without the valid connection string. As you can see, we get an error here. The UI parameter must be a string, got undefined, and this is good, we want a crash. We don't want our server to start with an invalid configuration. So it's good that this actually crashes right away. However, if we delete the port here, and run this again with an undefined port. Then our server actually runs, mongoose connected, server running on port undefined. And this is a problem because this will not work, but our code still runs. And there are situations where this could be even more problematic, where an undefined value could do some real harm and we don't know where it's coming from. So this is why ESLint complains about these non-null assertion operators, we should avoid them. One way to handle this would be to just have checks for each of them, like, if port with an exclamation mark in front of it, which basically means it's false here, which is the case if it's undefined, then we want to throw an error here to crash our server right away. But this is a bit verbose and we still don't have a warning here because this listen function doesn't complain about a possibly undefined value. So a better way to handle this is use another package, which is called nValid. It's another popular package that is used to define how our environment variable should look which one we have in the .env file, and then it enforces this schema. So if one is missing, it actually throws an error and our server won't start. So let's install this. We have to stop our server with control Z and then a while to confirm it. npm i invalid. And it's a normal dependency because we want to use this in production as well. And now what we do is inside our source folder, we create another folder which we call util, short for utility, code, and utility functions. And in here we create a new file, validateenv.ts. You can write it like this in camel case, but the name of this file doesn't matter. It's up to you. And in here we want to import, then between curly braces we write clean env from the invalid package. Now, why do we write this in curly braces here and not just the name as before? This depends on how this clean env is exported inside this package. But to explain it in simple terms, sometimes there is a single default export, which is when we import it like mongoose with this one name, and sometimes there are multiple things that are exported from a module, like in this case where we can list them in curly braces, and if there's another thing, then we write a comma and export this other thing as well. 
And we will actually see an example of this right now, because we will do a default export ourselves. Because from this file we want to export one single thing, which is basically the sanitized version of our environment variables. So here we write export default. We want to export the same clean env that we imported here, but we want to call it because this is a function. So we don't actually export this function, we export its return value. Again, if this is confusing to you, just follow along. The first argument we pass here are our normal environment variables, process.env, comma, and still inside the parentheses, we add a pair of curly braces, because in here we do the configuration. To be more exact, we want to list all the environment variables that we expect, which is our Mongo connection string and our port. So we paste the names here, colon, and then we call this str, short for string function, which should automatically import this dependency here. And this comes from the invalid library as well. This basically defines that Mongo connection string should be of type string later. We also add the port after a comma here, because this is a JSON object. And this time we call port. We could also use number or string, but port has a special type. I think it makes sure that this has a certain length or shape. And now since we export this clean env call here, we can import it in another file. And this will give us our cleaned up and sanitized environment variables. So let's save this file, go back to server.ts. And we want to import, I put it up here. Env from from our validate env file here. And now we have to pass the location of this file relative to the file we are currently in. So we want to go into the parent folder, which is source, then inside util and validate env. So we write a dot to go into the parent folder and auto completion already suggests util validate env. This is where we want to import it. But this depends always on your file structure, but auto completion will help you with finding the correct one. Now, since this is the default export here, we can give this import any name we want and it will recognize it because it's, there is only this one export. We could also call this banana or chocolate, doesn't matter, but env makes sense because it mirrors the name of the normal environment variable here. And now it's pretty simple. Instead of process.env, we just want to call env because this now relates to our clean env setup we did here. Now the port is definitely a number it's not possibly undefined anymore because this is what clean env takes care of. We can also now remove this exclamation mark and the IDE will stop complaining because this is now guaranteed to be a string. And now what happens if we actually forget one of these values? Let's try deleting the port again as we did before and restart our server. And now it crashes right away with a nice error message here, missing environment variables, port undefined. And this is exactly what we want, because now we make sure that our server doesn't run with a wrong configuration, instead it crashes right away, so it doesn't even start. This is better than having it used by someone already in production and then it just misbehaves. Okay, so this is why this is a nice package. Let's restart our server with the port in here, and everything should run. Mongoose connected, server running on port 5000. By the way, this warning here is just a change that's coming up in the next major Mongoose version. You don't have to care about this. It doesn't play any role for our project we are building here. Let's actually try if we can still access our endpoint here. At localhost 5000, we can still see hello world if the server is running. However, our code organization is not really nice here. We should separate the parts that contains all the endpoints and the part that sets up Mongoose and actually starts the server. One reason for that is just good old separation of concerns. But the other reason is that this allows us to test our server code, everything that's contained in this Express app basically, without connecting to the real production database. We won't be writing tests in this tutorial because this is boring as hell. But when you write tests in production, you usually insert some dummy data into the database and then you will just wipe the whole database. And of course, you shouldn't do this in production unless you want to get fired. This is why it's necessary to separate this code. So what we do is at the same place where our server.ts is, we want to create another file. So inside the source folder here, we create an app.ts file. 
And then we want to move some code from our server.ts file over into this new app.ts file. So we want to move the first line here, slash config over there. So we load the environment variables also if we start this app without starting the server. Next, we want to move these two lines over there, the express import and the express call here, which creates our server app. Let's actually put this into a new line because this is not an import, it's a function call. And then we want to move this endpoint over there. So we cut this out and paste it here as well, because this is a server endpoint, this belongs to our server code. And then in order to use this app in our server, to call it and run it, we have to export it here. And again, this is a default export, which basically means that we just export one single thing from this file, which is our express app where we add all the endpoints on. We want to export this here. And now we want to import this in our server.ts file. So we do this at the very top of our imports, import app. Again, we could give this any name we want because it's a default export, but app makes sense. And it's inside the source folder as the app file. And whenever we import a file, we don't have to uh, import the file extension as you might have already noticed. And yeah, the rest basically stays the same. Let's format this properly. We still call app.listen. Now we call it on this imported app to spin up our server. Let's save the server.ts file. We don't have to export anything here. And let's see if it still works. So we can still access our endpoint if the server is running. Nice. Okay, our MongoDB is connected and now we actually want to put some stuff in there, right? And when we use Mongoose, we have to define a model for the data that we want to put in our database. So what we do is inside our source folder here, we create a folder called model or models actually because it will be multiple ones. And in here we create a node.ts file. And as you can tell, this will contain our node model. Let me close this terminal, don't need it right now. Of course, this whole process of setting up models and schemas and everything is explained in this humongous documentation. If you have some weeks to spare and want to learn this in more detail, but I will show you everything you need to know right now. So we need to define a schema. And the schema defines what kind of data our node should contain. So we write const node schema equals new schema, which is this mongoose, um, I guess, constructor or function here. So it should import this part here at the top. And between these parentheses, we add a pair of curly braces, because this is where we put the configuration for the schema. Okay, what data should our nodes contain? Each of them should have a title and a text and also this timestamp that indicates when the node was created or last updated. So we put these fields in here, title column, then another pair of curly braces. And you just have to get used to it when using JavaScript, there are curly braces everywhere. It's just curly braces inside curly braces inside curly braces, but this is how JS works. Here we have to define the type. So this is basically a configuration for this title field in our node schema. The type will be string and you have to write this in uppercase, not lowercase. And we have to write it in uppercase for all data types in these MongoDB schemas, even though in normal code we write them in lowercase. This is because those are actually the constructors of these types. I don't know why exactly, but it doesn't matter. After type string, we write comma, required, I can't write required, colon true. As the name implies, this is another configuration that defines that each node has to have a title. Otherwise, MongoDB will not accept it. Comma, and the next property, text, which is another string. But this time it doesn't have to be required because we want to make the text optional. And in JavaScript objects, you can add trailing commas, even if we don't add another field, which is usually a good habit because it has some benefits when we uh, compare changes in version control. Doesn't matter, you can add it, you can leave it out, but I like to add it. But the timestamps are still missing, right? So now we could add another field, created add, make it of type uh, timestamp, 
but Mongoose can actually add these fields for us and also maintain them automatically. So we don't add them inside these curly braces here, inside the schema configuration. Instead, we go outside of this closing curly brace, but still inside the parentheses. Add another pair of curly braces and write timestamps, and we already get the suggestion, colon true. This will automatically add the timestamps fields for created and updated to the schema, rather than us having to manage them ourselves. But again, you have to uh, put that in the correct place outside of these first curly braces here. Now for normal JavaScript, this is everything that's necessary to set up the schema. But in TypeScript, we have to add another step because we later want to have a type for this node in our code available so that we get type safety and auto completion for all the fields in here title and text and everything. So below we write type, which is basically a way to add another type alias in TypeScript. So to create another type, so to speak. And the name of this type should be node, but again, you can name this anything you want. It makes sense because those are nodes. And then we write equal sign and first schema type, which is this name here, this type we get from Mongoose again. So it should add another import. Then we make angle brackets to add a type argument to this infer schema type type. And then here we write type of as one word, our lowercase, that's important, node schema. In other words, this creates this node type by looking at our node schema here and then yeah, creating it from it. This is something Mongoose does automatically for us. And now we just have to export this whole schema so we can use it in our remaining code. So again, export default. Then we have to call model, which is another mongoose function, so it adds another import. We add another type argument, so it creates a model of type node, parentheses. Then a string, which is the name of this collection. And again, we write node in uppercase. This will later create a collection in our MongoDB database, but it actually turns this into a plural. So by calling this node, it will later create a collection with the name nodes. You will see this in a moment. Just follow along. Comma, the second argument is the node schema. Save this. So to recap, this code here creates a schema for our nodes, which each contain a title and a text and the timestamps. And then we create a type for TypeScript and export this model so we can use it in our code. And now let's go into our apt.ts file, which is our server code, and import this new node model we just created. So import node model. Again, we can give it any name since it's a default export. From period slash models slash node. And now let's create an endpoint that returns the nodes that we put into our database, just so we can see how we can interact with the database. And let's reuse our existing endpoint here because we don't need this hello world in the future. So instead of rest.send hello world, we want to get the nodes out of our database and then return them. So we write const nodes equals, then await node model dot find, we call this without any arguments, and call dot exec behind it. Okay, so that's a lot of code. What is going on here? So first of all, node model dot find dot exec executes this find operation and then exec returns a promise. We already worked with promises earlier here, but here we use this then and catch combination. As I already explained, await is syntactic sugar around promises. So instead of having to use these then and catch callbacks, which adds this ugly nesting, we can just write it in one line below each other like normal synchronous code. And again, I didn't use this here because we can't use this at the top level in Express by default, but we can use it inside these endpoint functions here. But for this, we also have to add the async keyword in front of this error function. So the code knows that this is an asynchronous function. And now this error here disappeared. So in other words, this will execute this find operation, which is an asynchronous operation, meaning that it takes a moment because we actually have to go into our database, look it up and then return it. And this can take a few milliseconds or maybe even a second. This is why this whole process is asynchronous. We don't want to uh, have the rest of the server to wait just because we do this database operation. This is where we use promises 
and async away to make it a bit simpler. Again, you don't need to understand this in detail, you can just follow along. And it's important that you don't forget this await, otherwise we will not get the value of our nodes, we will get this promise, which can cause weird errors sometimes if you're not aware of this. So yeah, make sure to add this await here, otherwise it will not work. But we don't only want to get them from the database, we also want to return them to the user. So below, we write something similar than before. We take our response object, but instead of send, we call dot status and pass 200 here, which sets the response status to 200, which is the HTTP status for OK. So everything went fine, basically. And when we work with our front end later, we use different HTTP calls to indicate if there was an error or not. And we don't send the response just in form of a text, we send it in form of a JSON, which is basically a way to transfer JavaScript objects between the backend and the client. You have probably already worked with JSON before. And in here we simply pass our nodes. This will turn our nodes into a, a JSON that we send to the front end. And now we can actually try it out. We can access our local host again. We get a successful response and we see this empty pair of scrap records, which means that this is an empty array, which makes sense because we haven't put any nodes into our database yet. So let's go into MongoDB Atlas again. And now something magical happened. When we click on Browse Collections, there suddenly is a collection. Oh, wow. Which is called Notes. Why is it called Notes? Again, because we called our node schema Node. And MongoDB or Mongoose automatically creates this collection from it. And it also automatically pluralizes the name. So Node turns into Notes because a collection contains multiple documents. Now the database here is called test because this is what we defined in our connection string. Let's actually remove this and give this a proper name. So we drop this, go back into our code, into our connection string, and we go here behind mongodb.net, but before the question mark retry writes, and here we can set the name for our database. Let's call it cool underscore notes underscore app. Save this. And I think when we change the environment variables, we actually have to restart the whole thing manually. I'm not sure right now, but just to make sure, stop the server and run npm start again. Let's access our endpoint again, which should trigger the creation of the collection. And then take another look in here, refresh this. And there it is. Now our database here is called Cool Notes App, and we still have our notes collection, which is empty. Now we don't have an endpoint yet where we can create nodes, but we can create them here manually. So let's do that in the backend here of Atlas. It automatically adds this idea because each node needs an idea. And now we want to add a title. Let's call it my first node and a text. So we click this plus here, add another field, call it text. And we write subscribe to coding in flow. And then we go ahead and click the subscribe button under this video. After we have done this, we click insert to add our first node here. And now when we access our localhost endpoint again, we return our array with our one node in it. Nice. And this is what we will later display in our front end. Amazing. But before we go ahead and add more endpoints, we should have a clue of how error handling works in Express. So let's just pretend something goes wrong here, which of course can always be the case. Maybe the database is down. Maybe we wrote some bad code, whatever. So to simulate this, we're going to throw an error in here like this. It's the same in Java and Kotlin and so on with an arbitrary message. We save this and then we try to access our endpoint again, which now shows us an error message. The website is not available in beautiful German. The website is nicht erreichbar. And even worse, this crashed our whole server when we look into the console. Here's our error and the app crashed. And now our whole server is down. We can't access any other endpoints anymore. We get fired, our life is over, our wife leaves us, all because we didn't handle errors properly. So let's learn how to do this. 
So we want to wrap this whole content here of this endpoint into a try catch block, which looks like this. Try curly braces, catch error curly braces. And I used VS Code's auto completion. All the normal code goes into the try block. And in catch, we put whatever should happen if something up here goes wrong. So if this throws an error like in our case, what do we want to do? First of all, of course, we want to lock this error. So we write console.lock and pass the error here. If this error contains an error message, we want to show it to the user or whoever accesses this endpoint. If there is no message in there, we want to show a generic error message. So what we do is we create a variable. And this time it's a let because we want to change its value later. Colored error message. And we write an unknown error occurred. And whenever I write this, I feel like a real programmer because this is such a programmer sounding message. Don't get confused by this error here. This will disappear in a moment. It's just Lint complaining that this is a let which we are not changing right now. But next we check if error instance of error. So we check if this error is actually the error type. And this is necessary because this has the type unknown, which means this can be anything. Because we can throw anything in our normal code. We can throw an error, but we could also throw null and so on. This is why we have to check that this is actually the type error. If this is an error, then we want to set the error message to error.message. Because every instance of type error has this message property. And then we want to return this. So rest.status. This time the status is 500, which means internal server error. And we want to return a JSON just like we do for the happy path. But this time we have to add curly braces to define a JSON. We didn't have to do this up here because nodes is an array and the JSON method knows how to turn this into a JSON array automatically. But now we write this JSON manually, so we also have to add the curly braces. We add an error field, which will contain the error message. So the user can later see this. So now let's try this out again. So our error is still in here. We still have this Bazinga error that we are throwing. But now when we open this endpoint, we see this error message here because this is what we return. But the difference is that now our server doesn't crash because we have this try catch block. So we can still access our other endpoints. Our boss is happier. Our wife won't leave us. And our life is just so much better. But of course, we don't want to repeat this for every endpoint because this is quite a lot of code. So what we can do is we can set up an error handler. And the error handler will automatically kick in when we have an error. So it works the following way. We go below here and it should be below our normal endpoint. Here we write app.use parentheses and we add another pair of parentheses because we want to pass an error function here. So uh, this error and curly braces. But this function will take some arguments. And an express error handler has to uh, take a very specific set of arguments. And it has to be these same arguments. Otherwise, express will not recognize it as an error handler. The first argument is the error itself. And we have to set this to unknown, just like the type up here. Now, why do we have to define types here? But we didn't have to define types up here for our rec and res arguments. This is because since we pass this as an argument to this get function, TypeScript is smart enough to infer these types. So it knows from the signature, okay, this is a request type, this is a response type. Down here, we don't have this type inference because what we pass here could be anything. So we have to declare these types ourselves. This is necessary in TypeScript, but not in normal JavaScript. The second argument is the request, just like up here. But again, this time we have to define the type which is request. And it's important that you import this one here from the express package. This is the request we want to be using. And this automatically adds this request import up here. Express is the default export. This is why this is separate. And those are additional exported types. This is why they are in these curly braces. If it didn't import it automatically, type it out by hand. The third argument is response, again from the express package. And the third argument is called next, and it's of type next function from the express package. Again, the error handler has to take exactly these four arguments with these four types. 
And then what we do is we cut out this part here and paste it down here. Now Lint will complain that we are not using next and that we could remove it. This is kind of a false positive because if we remove it, Express will not recognize this as an error handler anymore. So we have to ignore this warning here and just keep it. Now one thing we could do is we could click quick fix and disable this ESLint rule for this line, which adds this comment here. And I think it's a good idea so you don't get confused later. This way we know that this was on purpose. Okay, so now how do we forward this catch block here to our error handler? It works the following way. We add the third argument up here, which is next. And it's the same type as down here. It's this next function type. In every route, we either have to uh, send a response the way we did up here, or we have to call next, which forwards this request to the next middleware. Middleware is basically a piece of code that knows how to handle a request on our Express server. It's a concept from the Express library. You can read more about this in the documentation, but both app.get and app.use create such a middleware. The difference is that app.get and also post and these other HTTP verbs create middlewares that create these endpoints that we can call, like slash and later slash nodes or slash user. App.use are other types of middlewares that we just use in our code to either prepare our response in a certain way or handle this like our error handler here. And the error handler is a very specific kind of middleware that basically kicks in when we have an error. We will see more examples of these middlewares later, so if this confuses you, don't worry, just follow along. And again, to call the next middleware, we call this next function. This is why we have this next argument up here. But we don't want to call any middleware, we want to call our error handler middleware. This is why we pass the error as an argument to this next function. So let's save this and see if it still works. So we access our localhost endpoint again, we still have our error that's handled. But now our error handler here handles this. Because the error handler handles the errors that have to be handled. Just sounded cool in my opinion. And now we can reuse this. Because in every endpoint in the catch block we just call next error and that's it. And these middlewares are checked in the order that we define them here. This is where we have to uh, put the error handler at the bottom. Otherwise this is the first one that would kick in. But we only want to get to this one if we actually have an error. Now one more thing I want to mention here. If this was synchronous code, meaning that we don't have this async and this await in here, because we don't do a database operations or other long running tasks, then we actually don't need try catch because Express is smart enough to forward this error to the error handler automatically. However, this does not work right now for asynchronous code. This is why we have to add this try catch block and call next ourselves. However, they are going to change this in the next major version of Express. Right now we have Express 4.18.2 installed. When this is 5 point something or higher, then you can remove this try catch block because it shouldn't be necessary anymore. This is an update they are planning. So let's remove this throw error, otherwise this endpoint will never work. I'm gonna comment it out, so I leave it in here as a warning and as a reminder for you. And just to drive home this whole concept of middlewares, let's actually add another one. Right now when we try to access an endpoint that doesn't exist, for example localhost 5000 slash blah, we get this error message here. But it might be a good idea to uh, create our own error message that just has a better text than this one here. And we can do this with another middleware that catches all requests that go to an endpoint where we don't have an actual route set up for it. So again we add the middleware with app.use and again we want to have this below our normal routes because this is just a fallback. But before our error handler, because we actually want to forward an error in here to our error handler. So it goes in between these two. And in here we pass another handler function. So another pair of parentheses, rec res next, like up here, but without the endpoint because we want to use this everywhere that we don't have an endpoint set up for. Right error curly braces. Now this time we don't have to add types again, because they are inferred automatically. And to be honest, I don't know right now why it works for these normal routes, but not for the error routes, but it doesn't matter. We don't have to add these types here. If we would have to add them, the compiler would complain. So to recap, we get to this middleware if none of our routes up here fits. So if we try to access an endpoint that we haven't set up. 
So what do we want to do in this case? Well, we basically just want to throw an error with a root not found message or endpoint not found. So we call next and by passing an error, we forward this to our error handler, right? The same as we did up here. So we create an error like this and we insert a message endpoint not found. And now when we try to access an endpoint that doesn't exist again, it forwards this to our error handler and we see our endpoint not found error message. Now at the moment, this will have a 500 response, which is not quite correct. This should have a 404 response, which means not found rather than internal server error, but we will improve this later. For now, this is sufficient. All right, and in the next chapter, we will set up another endpoint for creating nodes. So we don't have to do this over the Atlas console anymore. And we will organize our code better into uh, routes and controller files. Okay, now let's organize our code a little bit better, because if we keep putting these endpoints into this FTS file, then it will be huge after a while, right? And we need more endpoints with more complex logic than this. So we cut out this endpoint here. And what we do is we create another folder inside source, which we call routes. And inside routes, we create a nodes.ts file for our nodes routes. In here, we paste the code we just cut out. Now, before we take care of the import statements and everything, we want to extract it even further because still this file could be difficult to read in the future because we have our endpoints and then all this huge logic in this handler function. So what we do is we cut out this whole part after the comma here and put this into yet another file. So inside source, we create another folder, which we call controllers. And this is a popular way of separating this. In here, we create another file called notes.ts. Um, you could give them different names. You could call this notes routes and this one notes controllers. Doesn't matter, it's up to you. But since this already has different folders, I'm actually fine with having them have the same name. And here we paste the piece we just cut out. So this handler function. And we want to export this function from this file so that we can use it in our routes file. So we write export const, and this is what I explained earlier. It's a different way of exporting something from a JavaScript module, but instead of our export default, where we export just one thing, this way we export multiple things. So we don't add default, we just add export and then the variable or function or whatever we want to export. We have to give this a name. Let's call it get nodes because this is what this endpoint does. Equals and this function here. And this time again, TypeScript can't infer these types here because it doesn't know what kind of function this is. So now we could either add request and response and everything to each of these arguments separately, but there's actually a more concise way of doing this. We can give a type to this variable itself, the variable that contains our function. And then TypeScript can infer the types of these three arguments. So behind get nodes, but before the equal sign, we put a colon to define the type of this variable which is type request handler here from the express package. We import this, which adds this import statement here at the top. And now TypeScript can infer the types of these arguments as request, response, and next function. And we also have to import this node model here. So let's add another import statement, the same as we did before, import node model from and the destination of this model file here. By this time, we write two dots because one dot would go into the controllers folder. Two dots goes into the parent folder of that, which is source. So now we are inside source. We want to go inside the model, models folder and import our node model. Now the error here disappeared. And we can also get rid of this because we don't need it anymore. Now we want to use this get nodes function in our nodes routes. So here we import this function from our nodes controller the following way. Import, then we make an asterisk, so this little star icon, which means that we want to import all functions that we put into this file. There will be more later. S nodes controller from and the destination, which is 
the control lost folder. And then here we call notes controller get notes. But we don't add a parentheses because we pass the function declaration itself. We don't pass the function call. And to clarify something, we could also import it like we did before with these curly braces, get notes like this, and then we could remove this notes controller dot. This would also work. You can do it like this if you want. The problem I have with this is that this line here grows huge because there can be many functions in the controller. So with this way of importing it, we add them to this notes controller namespace and keep this import statement short. But app here still shows us a, an error because the compiler doesn't know what app means. Because we are not inside this folder here anymore where we have this express app. So the same as in app, we want to import express in here from the express package. Shouldn't matter if you put it below or above nodes controller, but this is the organization I like. And then we have to instantiate the app, but this time we don't want to call express because we don't want to create a whole nother server. Instead, we want to use the one that we already have. So instead of instantiating express, we create a router with express.router. You can read more about this in the documentation, but this is basically a way to set endpoints on a router and then we later set this router on our express app here to add these endpoints. It's pretty straightforward. And then we want to replace app.get for router.get. And again, get means that this is an HTTP get request. Then we make this router the default export, so we can use it in a different file, and it's the only thing we need to export from this module. So we write export default router, semicolon, save this, and then where do we want to use this? We want to use this in our app.ts file. We want to import our new router up here, and by the way, we can delete this node model, because we now handle this in our controllers. Import nodes routes, again, you can give this any name you want, from the routes folder, our nodes routes file. And then here between const app and our endpoint not found handler, the same place where we had this endpoint before, we simply call add.use to add another middleware. We define an endpoint, and this endpoint will be added in front of this endpoint here. Right now we have localhost 5000 and this gives us our nodes back. But in production we want to have them at an endpoint that's a bit more specific, right? So the endpoint will be slash API slash nodes. So later let's say our website is called coolnotesapp.com. Then we will get the nodes from coolnotesapp.com slash API slash nodes. And we want to forward this endpoint to our nodes routes. So this is basically like a puzzle that's put together. We have this middleware that catches any request that goes to this endpoint, which then checks the nodes routes endpoints we have set up here and look which one fits in here. We will later have more endpoints in here as well. For example, router.get for a specific node, which then adds additional endpoints on this API nodes endpoint. If this is confusing, don't worry, you will understand it when we later actually use this. Let's just save every file that's still opened and then access this new endpoint. So now the endpoint directly at localhost 5000 isn't found anymore because this is now not where we get our nodes from. We now get it from slash API slash nodes and there's our node the same as before. But it's better organized now. And now we also want to add an endpoint where we can create nodes without having to do this manually in our MongoDB Atlas backend. Now, first of all, we need to tell Express what kinds of data we want to accept as messages to the server. And we do this in our app.ts file. Before this route here, at this exact point, we add another middleware, app.use, and pass express.json and call this as a function exactly like this. And this basically sets up Express so that it accepts JSON bodies. So we can now not only retrieve JSON from our get endpoint, we can also send JSON to our server when we then add a post endpoint. So let's save this and add another endpoint in our nodes controllers file. So below get nodes, we add another export const 
which we this time call create node. And the same as before, it's a request handler. Equal sign, it's an asynchronous function because it does database operations, curly braces, and we can already add and try catch block here because we always need this when we do something that could throw an error. And in catch, we want to do the same as up here, pass it to our error handler middleware. Before we set up the body of this endpoint, let's add it to our routes. So below router.get, we write router.post this time, because this will be a post request. We are sending data to the server, in this case, our node. It will be at the same endpoint, and this is possible because those are different HTTP methods, so they will not interfere with each other, even if they have the same endpoint. If we wanted to get different kinds of data, then of course we can't use the same endpoint. Otherwise, the server wouldn't know what endpoint this is supposed to be. And here we want to use our new nodes controller create node function. Save this and go back in here to finish setting this up. We will send the title and text in the body of this request. So first we have to get these values out of the body. We can do this outside of the try block or inside, it doesn't really matter, but this shouldn't throw anything. So I think it's more correct to put it outside. Create a const title and we get this value that we send to the server from the request body. So we take this request object, call.body, and then the name of the variable that we will send to the server. And we will call it title, just like the field in the node itself. And the same for the text. We will send it as the text field in the request body. Then inside the try block, because this is now the part that can throw an error, we want to use mongoose to create our node. And we also want to save this new node in a variable so that we can send it back to the client. And we do this so that we can later put this new node into the UI and update the UI on the client. And it's also useful to see the data we created when we get our response back. So here we call await. And again, the await is very important. Node model dot create parentheses curly braces. And I already add the semicolon down here. And in here we create our node and we actually have auto completion for this. Why? Because this refers to our node schema we set up here. So it already knows what kind of data this expects. It expects a title, which is our title up here, comma, and the text value. And again, the timestamps will be set automatically. Now create returns a promise by default, which means that we don't have to append this dot exec at the end, which we had to do up here. I don't know why they made this design decision that we have to add it up here, but not down here. But yeah, it's not necessary. And then if this should fail for any reason, we get into our catch block. If it doesn't fail, we continue with the dry block. So we want to send a response back to the client. We set the code to 201 which is the HTTP code for a new resource created. We could also send 200, doesn't really matter, but it's better to distinguish them properly. And we want to send a new node back as a JSON. Save. Okay, and now this endpoint should be configured properly because we already referenced it in our nodes routes file. And this on the other hand is connected in our apps file. So this should work now. The problem is we don't have a client yet to send data to our server. And with a web browser, we can only do GET requests. We can't send something to the server. This is why we will use a tool called Postman, which is really popular for yeah, working on server stuff in development, because it allows you to do all kinds of HTTP requests without the need of a real client. Now don't get scared because it says pricing. We can actually use it for free. So download it for your operating system. Run this file and then you have to create an account before you can use it, which is fine. I'm going to sign up with my uh, recording account here again. Again, you can use it for free and it's a very popular tool among developers. So you don't have to be afraid of this. All right, then log in to Postman, follow this uh, sign up process here and then we see us on the other side. Then we want to create a new HTTP request and they have the shorthand here. Maybe in the future it looks different, but 
somewhere there's an option to create a new HTTP request and it should look like this. And here we select post because we want to send a post request. We type in our localhost address, localhost 5000 slash API slash nodes because this is the endpoint we set up and we want to send a JSON body to the server. So we click on body, on raw, and then we select not text, but JSON. And then in curly braces, we have to define the JSON here, which should contain a title and a text, right? So we write it like this in quotation marks, title colon, my first endpoint node, and a text, this is fun. And then we want to click send. And if we set up everything properly, this post request should be handled on our server. And it looks good because this is the response we got back. As you can see, status 201 created. This is what we defined in our endpoint. And we get our new node back, which contains an idea and all the data. So let's look into MongoDB again. Refresh this. And excitement. There's our new node. This time we created it through our own endpoint. Isn't that amazing? And if you made it until here in this tutorial, please go below and leave a like. It's really important to me. Of course, we can also run our get nodes endpoint as a get request here, which gives us an array of our nodes, just like we got when we did this in the web browser. Let's also try creating a node where the title is missing because we defined in our MongoDB schema that the title is required, right? So this should give us an error if the title is missing. Let's remove this, send it again, and we get an error. Node validation failed, title path title is required. Now this is not a very readable error message because this comes directly from MongoDB, but we will improve this later. For this it's nice to see that our schema is actually enforced. However, we can uh, create a node without a text. This should work because this is not required in our schema. And this succeeded. So let's take a look into the database again. And there's our third node without a text this time. Let's add one more endpoint for now to get a single node because it's interesting to see how we can access a single node. So we go into our nodes controller again. And just for organization, let's put it here below get nodes. Export const get node singular this time of type request handler, an async error function with regress next, semicolon, try catch. This is just the kind of stuff you repeat over and over again. Then before we set this up, we go into the routes file, add another endpoint here, router.get. This time we write slash, and after that we write a colon, node ID, comma, nodes controller, get node. Now this node ID is basically a variable, which means that whatever we put behind the slash will be read by express and put into the request object. So we can read it in our get node endpoint and then look up this specific node for this idea. So let's save this file and go into the get node function here again. And we get this value similar to how we got the values out of the body. Let's put it above the try block. Const node ID equals, we take our request object, but this time we don't want to access the body, we want to access the params. And the params are these variables that we put here into the URL directly. Those are all strings, basically. And we want to take the node ID. So it has to have the same name as we defined here, with the exact same spelling. And then we use mongoose inside the try block to get this specific node. So we create a const node equals await node model dot find by idea, which is a special mongoose function where we can pass the idea of this model and it will find the specific document. So here we simply pass the node idea. This time we have to call dot exec again to turn this into a real promise. And then we want to do the same as up here, return this node. 
with a status code of 200 in the JSON body. But this time it's the singular node and not nodes. Save. And now let's try this out. We can either do this in the web browser or in Postman. But Postman just formats this a bit better, so I prefer this. First of all, we need an ID of a node. So let's get all nodes. And let's get this one here, my first endpoint node. We copy this ID, add nodes slash, and then simply the ID, because this is the structure of the endpoint we just set up. And as you can see, this returns this exact node. If we change a letter in here to a non-existing ID, this fails for one because this node doesn't exist, but also because this is not a valid object ID. We will add some checks for this later. The important part is that this gives us the exact node for this ID. Later, of course, a user should only be able to access their own nodes, but we will take care of authentication and this stuff later. And by the way, these errors we get here, we also can see them in the console because we are logging them. Which is especially important in production because if something goes wrong for a user, you want to be able to go back into the log and see what went wrong. So we see the error here as well. Now there is one more package I want to install here, which is just a nice tool to have. This one is called Morgan and it's just a locking tool. So we can see all the requests to the different endpoints that were made on our server, which is just nice information to know. So let's stop our server once again and install Morgan the usual way. And there is not much setup involved in this. It's just a simple middleware that we install in our apt-s file. And above express.json right here, we add another middleware with app.use. But we have to import it first. So up here we import morgan from the morgan package like this. And this shows us an error here because it needs some type files. This is sometimes the case when you use TypeScript with certain packages. Hover over this error, and if you see something like this, try npm i save dev if it exists or add new declaration type blah blah blah, then you have to copy this part here. This is just the installation command for another dependency, which we install right now. npm i save dev add types slash morgan, then this error should disappear. We can start our server again and finish setting this up. We simply want to call morgan as a function and pass dev as a string. This just defines the type of information and the amount of information we print to the console. You can read more about this in the documentation. But this is pretty cool because it prints a concise log of all the endpoints that we access. So let's try this out. Let's make a get request again and as you can see we now have this log message down here get request on this endpoint what status code we sent back and so on and this is just nice information to have especially in production this is the endpoint with all the nodes yeah this is just something i wanted to add here and now we already have a real little server with different endpoints where we can get information from we can create new information really amazing. Of course, we still want to add more endpoints, but it's already a success. But in the next section, before we start adding more endpoints, we will improve our error handling a little bit, because as I already noted, at some places, we don't always return the optimal status code, like here, for our endpoint not found error. Sometimes the error message is not really good and really readable, like the one we get from Mongoose by default. So next, we will take a look at how we can improve this because it's important. And after that, we will add new endpoints to update existing nodes and delete nodes. Okay, so as I already said, before we add more endpoints to our server, we want to improve our error handling here, because that's not quite optimal yet. For one, our endpoint not found middleware here, which kicks in whenever we uh, try to access an endpoint that we didn't set up, like slash API slash blah, for example, at the moment returns a 500 status code, because that's what we hard coded in our error handler here, so we basically use it for every error. But different errors require different status codes. 
500 is the status code for an internal server error, which basically means that something in our code went wrong and maybe we don't even really know what. But an endpoint not found error should return a 404 code because that's the HTTP status code for resource not found. So it's just more appropriate and it's better for our clients to work with. Secondly, when we try to create a node, without a title, which MongoDB doesn't like because we said required to true for the title and MongoDB and Mongoose enforce this. But if we try to do this, it also gives us an error, but with the default MongoDB error message, which might be difficult to understand for users. So we want to provide our own error message instead. And for this kind of HTTP errors, there is a convenient package we can use. So we open our terminal. And ignore these error messages down here. This is only on my side because I uh, tried something a moment ago and did a mistake. But if you don't know how to open the already existing terminal, you can click on viewer and here on terminal or use the shortcut that's right next to it. This will open the terminal that you already created before. If there is none, you can also create a new terminal over this menu point up here that we used earlier. Anyway, just open the terminal. And then important, we want to go into our backend folder again, not into the root folder where we are right now. This is where you see these error messages here. I'm actually recording this a second time because I messed this up before. So this is very important. So we type cd slash backend to go into our backend folder. Okay, actually without the slash, just cd backend. And then you need to make sure that the path looks correct. So we are in our coding and flow MERN course folder or however you called it earlier and then inside the backend folder here because this is where we want to install this new package so we type npmi short for install http minus errors and as usual you have to type the package name correctly otherwise npm will not recognize it we install this and then we want to install a second one which are the type declarations again that we need for TypeScript to work with this package. So again, npmi minus uppercase d for dev dependency add types slash HTTP errors. Type it out correctly and then press enter. And this should have added two new entries here in our package.json. HTTP errors in the normal dependencies and the types here in the dev dependencies. We could also create our own HTTP errors instead of using this package, but again, this makes it more convenient. So let's close the terminal with the same shortcut and then improve our code here. We want to start with this part here. Instead of returning a normal error with this error constructor, we want to create a new HTTP error which we do with this function here from this package we installed. If this doesn't import automatically or if auto completion isn't there, then type in the import up here manually. And this function also takes an error message that we already entered, but it also takes a second argument, which comes before the error message, which is the HTTP status code that we want to return with this error. And as I already said, we want to have a 404 status code for this one because 404 means resource not found, which is appropriate for an endpoint that doesn't exist. Comma and the second argument is the error message just as before. But the problem right now is that we hard code the status code down here on our error handler. So we have to uh, change this code here as well. Below let error message, we also create a new variable, again a let, for the status code. We initialize this with 500 because this will be our fallback if we don't specify a more specific status code. Then we delete this line here. Instead of checking if error is an instance of the normal error class, we want to check if it's an instance of this new HTTP error because we basically want to use this throughout our whole server code. So we remove this and write if and in between the parentheses of the if block, we write is HTTP error, which is another function of the HTTP errors package, but this one didn't import automatically, so we do it manually. So after create HTTP error, we write a comma, and again create HTTP error is the default import. The other one is a non-default import, so we have to um, add it between curly braces like this, and then paste the name of this function. Again, you don't have to understand the syntax here in detail, just make sure to type it out the same way, if autocomplete didn't work. 
Okay, so is HTTP error down here is a function which takes an argument which is the error itself. This will check if this error is an instance of this HTTP error from the HTTP errors package. If this is the case, we want to take our status code variable and set it to error.status, which we now have available because status is a field in the HTTP error class. And the same as before, we also want to set the error message. So we take our error message variable and set it to error.message, which the HTTP error class contains just like normal errors. All right, and then the only change left is replacing our status code that we hard coded down here for the status code variable, which is either whatever status is in the HTTP error or a fallback of 500 for internal server error. All right, and now let's try this out. Let's save the code with Control S, open the terminal again, and run npm start to start our server. And then I'm gonna open an endpoint that doesn't exist again. And as we can already see, because we installed Morgan previously, we now have this 404 response here. And we will see the same when we look into the Chrome DevTools when we try to access an endpoint that doesn't exist. Status 404, which is just a better status code to return. And this plays an even more important role when we have different kind of errors later. Now let's also improve the error messages for our node routes. So we close our terminal, go into the nodes controller, and let's start with create node here. As I already explained, at the moment when we don't pass a title, we get Mongoose's default error thrown, which has an error message that might not be readable enough for the average user. And also it doesn't have an HTTP status code associated with it, so it will fall back to our 500 code. For this reason, instead of relying on Mongoose to check the title and throw an error, we want to check the title ourselves in here and any other field that might be required. This gives us more control over the error message and the status code. And then the required field of Mongoose itself is basically just a fallback in case we mess something up. But the first line of defense is the code in our own endpoint handler. Okay, but the problem right now is that the types of our title and text here is any, because TypeScript doesn't know the type of these variables in the body here. It also doesn't have to be a string, it could also be a number, for example. But we can tell TypeScript what type of variables we expect in the body. We do this by declaring an interface, which we call create node body, and then we make a pair of curly braces like this. Interfaces are very similar to types, like we declared with this type keyword here in Mongoose. The difference between interface and types are very specific, and I don't want to explain all of them here. But generally, you want to use interfaces whenever possible, because they are more flexible. And there are certain situations where you can't use interfaces, then you use types instead. For example, here in Mongoose, we have to use a type, because this is what infer schema type expects from us. We can't use interface here. But to declare the types of the single fields in our create node body here, we use an interface. And in here we just declare what variables we expect when we make this create node request and what types they should have. And we already know what we expect. We expect a title of type string and a text of type string. Now we already know that the text is optional. We don't have to send one. So we add a question mark here which basically means that yeah, we can send this text if we want or not, so this might be undefined. But we actually set the title to optional as well. Why? Because whenever someone makes a request to this endpoint, we can't know if they actually send this data. Even though the title is required, it might be missing from the request, and then we want to decline it, right? But we still have these any types here, because we have to actually use this interface in our request handler here which we do by adding a type argument after request handler, which we do like this with a pair of angle brackets. And then we have to declare four different types because this is all or nothing. Either we declare no type or all. And by all, I mean for the body, for the URL arguments. The fourth one are the URL params. So there's a difference between a URL argument, like our node idea and URL params, which we have after this question mark. And the fourth one, I don't remember right now. So, and the body is the third argument. For the other ones, we want to leave them untouched, basically, which we do by passing unknown. 
so unknown is used implicitly for all of them if we don't pass a type argument here. We want to leave the type of the URL params and so on as unknown because we uh, don't use these arguments here, but we want to set the type for the body. So unknown, comma, unknown, comma, create node body, and then again, comma, unknown. And when you hover over request handler, you can see the order of these arguments we are passing here. The params, the response body, request body, and the query. Anyway. And you might be wondering, why do we pass unknown here and not any? Because any is unsafe. Any basically allows us to call anything on these variables. Unknown is the opposite. It's restrictive. So I think if we try to use the query params now, which has type unknown, then we could not call anything on it. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. Because if we needed the query params, we would pass a type for them and not unknown. But we only need a body right now. But the magic is now visible when we hover over title and text because now they have types. They are both string or undefined. And again, undefined is a possibility for both of them because we don't have a guarantee that whoever uses this endpoint actually sent both values over. The difference is that if the text is undefined, we don't care because it's not required, but we care if the title is undefined. So we go into our try block here because now we are playing around with errors and whenever we do stuff with errors, we have to catch them so that our server doesn't crash and we lose our job and everything, remember? Here we check if, and in between the parentheses, we write exclamation mark title, which means title is false here, which is the case if title is undefined. Then we want to throw a create HTTP error, the same one we called in our endpoint not found handler here, because this creates an HTTP error, which we then throw, which then gets caught, by our try catch block and forward it to our error handler. All right, and what status code we wanna use? We wanna use 400 this time. And in case you're wondering where I'm pulling these from, you can basically just type HTTP status codes into Google and you will find different lists with explanations for these different codes. So every situation, every kind of error has an appropriate status code. And as you can see here, for example, 400 means bad request, which is often used if there is an argument, for example, missing which is the case here. We could use any status code here. Using the correct one is just a matter of making our API better usable for clients. So it's a good idea to get this right and not use any arbitrary code. And we also want to return an error message here. Node must have a title. We don't need a return statement here to leave our code because throw leaves the try block anyway and goes right to the catch block. All right. So let's try out our new error message here with postman. Let's make a post request to our notes endpoint. We still have the title in the body, but we want to put the text in the body and have the title missing, which now should give us a better error message. And that's not it because I didn't save the code yet. So let's save it and try this again. Note must have a title. Nice. With the status code 400. So now we handle this error for this endpoint properly and not nilly willy like we did before. Okay, but our get node endpoint here also has still room for improvement when it comes to error handling. For one, we don't really know if the node ID we passed here is even a valid node ID or if we are trying to uh, use find by ID with some random value that doesn't make sense. But even if the node ID is valid but doesn't exist, the error we get back is just null. But this should return a 404 response and a proper error message. So let's improve this. So let's start with checking if we actually get a node back here or if it doesn't exist. So we simply do an if check, if exclamation mark node. So if the node is null or undefined, then we want to throw a create HTTP error with a 404 code that says node not found which is much more readable than this null we had before. Let's try it out. Let's save it and try to access the same endpoint as before, which now shows the appropriate error message with a 404 code. Okay, so this is already much better. But what happens if we pass a value for the node ID that doesn't make sense because it doesn't adhere to the shape that these nodes IDs have to have? 
because they need a certain length and certain kind of characters are allowed. So if we just remove some of these characters here and try to access it like this, we get our good old and unknown error occurred and a 500 response. This happens because MongoDB or Mongoose doesn't know how to uh, handle this oddly shaped node idea. It doesn't have the expected format here for find by ID. But we can check it ourselves and then uh, return an appropriate error message and status code if the shape is not what we expected. So above the line where we call find by ID, we check if exclamation mark, then we take mongoose is valid object ID. We could also import is valid object ID directly, and then we don't need this mongoose dot in front of it. But this way, I think it's more readable because we know, okay, this is a function from the mongoose package. Here we pass the node ID, which is the URL argument, if you remember. It's this part here. And this time we actually don't have to check if this value is present or not, because if we don't enter anything here behind the slash, then we don't get to this endpoint in the first place. Then we get to the normal get endpoint. So we don't have to check if this value is null or not, because if we end up in this handler, then we know that there is a node ID. And it also has the type string by default. So TypeScript knows that there is a value when we get to this endpoint. But if this is not a valid object ID, which is what this function here checks for, returns true if mongoose can cast a given value to an object ID or false otherwise. So if it's misshaped like we saw before, then we want to throw another create HTTP error. A 400 response here is appropriate and the error message will be an invalid node ID. Okay, let's save this and try it out once again. So we go to the same wrong endpoint here, refresh this, and this time we have a good error message, invalid node idea, and a 400 response. So all of this is not really necessary, but it's good practice because otherwise we end up with a server with error messages that we don't understand and we never really know what's going wrong. And it's also good to not let any values through that we can't really work with because even though nothing really bad happens here, besides an error that's not really readable, it could cause problems in different parts of the code because we are working with values that don't have the type or the shape that we expect. Okay, that's it for the error handling setup for now. In the next section, we will add endpoints to update and delete existing nodes. Very exciting. Okay, now let's add endpoints for updating and deleting nodes to our server. So we go into our nodes controller file. And where we put it doesn't really matter, but let's organize them in an order that makes sense. So I put it at the bottom below create node. We create an export const update node of type request handler, just as before. And it's an async function that takes a request, response, and next function as arguments, just like the other ones. And in here, we will also need a try catch block. And this one will be interesting because it's basically a combination of our create node endpoint because we need to pass a title and a text, but also our get node endpoint because we need the node idea that we want to update. So uh, let's next go into the routes file and add this new endpoint here before we forget it. Let's put it below router.post. This time it's a patch request. In HTTP, patch request is used whenever you want to update a resource. We uh, set an endpoint for it, which will be slash, and then the same as up here, colon node ID, because we need to specify which node we want to update. And we do this over this URL argument. Comma, and then we pass nodes controller dot update node. We save this, but of course we haven't implemented this function here. So let's go back to our routes file. We want to declare the body here, the same as we did for create node, so that we have types for title and text and we can check them properly. So above this function, we create an interface, which we call update node body. And in here we define the variables that we expect in the body. 
which the same as before is an optional title and an optional text because we can't be sure that we actually get past these values by whoever calls this endpoint. So I basically always make these body variables optional with this question mark. They can always be undefined. Okay, and I said up here in get node, we don't have to define an interface for the node idea because TypeScript knows that this is definitely a string because it's contained in the URL that we are writing out. Now we have to declare an interface for it. Why? Because we want to pass the update node body as the type to request handler, but we can't pass unknown for the URL params as we did up here because now we want to use them. Now we want to use the node idea that we pass via the URL. So we can't set this type to unknown this time. We have to set it to something specifically because again, this is either all or nothing. Either we declare no type here in this request handler or we have to define all that we want to use. So we call this update node params because those are the URL params. And we expect the node idea to be passed over the URL params of type string. It has to have the same name as the argument here that we put in the URL. And again, we don't have to make it possibly undefined. We don't have to add this question mark here because if we would not pass this value here, we wouldn't get to this endpoint in the first place. We wouldn't end up here because this requires a slash and a value for the node ID. All right, and then we put these two new types on our request handler. So again, a pair of angle brackets. The first one is update node params, comma unknown, because the second one is the response body, which we don't want to add a type to because we don't need it. The third one is the update node body, and the fourth one is unknown yet again, because the fourth one is the URL query params that we are not using here either. All right, and now we can get these three values out of our request objects. We create a variable node idea, which is the part in the URL, which we get over rec.params.node idea. Auto completion works because we defined it in this update node params type. Const, let's call it new title, just to make the variable name a bit more descriptive because we are updating, we are not creating a new node. Rec.body this time, not params, but body because we send the title in the body dot title. And by the way, in case you're wondering what kind of data you should pass over the body and what you pass over the URL, it depends a bit and also it depends on convention. We could also send the title and the text theoretically over the URL, but this would be very unwieldy because it gets very long and we have to URL encode it and stuff like that. So it's more appropriate to send the title and the text via the body and use the node idea as the identifier in the URL to a pinpoint to our exact node that we want to update. Okay, and another variable for the text, which is contained in request.body.text. So the first one is a string and the other ones are string or undefined. And then we want to do some checks here to have appropriate error handling, similar checks as we already did up here. So we can actually copy some stuff. We want to check if the node ID that we pass in the URL is actually a valid node ID, just like we did for get nodes. So let's copy this part and paste it here in the try block. Then we also want to check if we actually passed a title, which we already did in create node. So let's copy this line, paste it below, but we have to change this to a new title because this is the variable name. We can keep the error message the same. You can also change it like you can't update the node without the title or whatever, but this here is fine. Then we want to get the node from the database. So we write const node equals await node model dot find by idea and we pass the node idea. And let's not forget the exact call to turn this into a real promise. The same as we uh, did up here already in the get node endpoint. And the same as up here, we also want to check if this node exists and show a different error message if it doesn't. So as you can see, there's a lot of error handling involved here, but this just makes sure that we always return an appropriate error message and code for all the different situations. 
If we end up down here, then everything was fine. We can go ahead and update the node. So we can take the node object that we already have here and just set the title to a new title and set node.text to a new text. And then below we save the changes, but we store the changes in a variable again so that we can return it to the color of this endpoint, which allows us later to update the node on the screen in our React app because we get the updated node back. We don't have to fetch it again. So we create a const updated node equals await node.save, like this. This, as the name implies, saves the changes that we made to the node up here. If there is any error that happens, then it will throw, we will catch it and return it to our error handler. There's also another way to update a node. We could also do it with node model dot find by ID and update. Then you can pass the node idea and it changes as a second argument. This is also an option, but this will look up the node again. But we already have a handle to the node because we fetched it to check if it exists, right? So there's no reason to fetch the node again and we can just use the save method here. All right, and now we want to return the updated node to the color. So we call rest.status, pass it to 100 code, dot JSON, and as the JSON body, we return the updated node. And let's also do our next error call down here to call the error handler in case there is an error. But here I did a typo. I passed update node, which is the name of this function. It's important that we pass updated node, which is the actual node that we get back after saving the changes. Okay, let's also save the changes to this file and then try it out. Let's open Postman, change this to a patch request, and then let's take any ID of our nodes here. Let's use my first endpoint node. We need the object ID because we want to update this. We pass this here as the URL argument, and we need to pass a body. So now, if the title is missing, it should still show the error message that we need a title for the node. Node must have a title. So this works as expected. What other errors did we define here? Invalid node ID, let's test this as well. Let's put a title in here. Let's change this to updated title, but use an invalid ID. Send invalid node ID. Let's use one that is valid, but not found. So I replace the last letter for idea, node not found. But if we use the correct node idea, then the update should go through and we should see the update reflected in our database. So one more time, the update went through, we get our updated node back with the updated title. And now when we look into MongoDB again and refresh this, we should see the changes, updated title. Isn't that amazing? But of course, in the future, we want to do this over our React app, over our real website. But right now, we do it via Postman, and this is already pretty cool. Okay, then next, let's add the delete endpoint, which will be a bit shorter. So let's put it below our update node, endpoint function, export const, and by now this is second nature for us, delete node of type request handler, it's an async error function with our good old three arguments here. We will also identify the node we want to delete by its ID in the URL. So we create a const node ID equals request.params.node ID. And this time, since we don't need a body for the delete call, we don't have to pass any type arguments here and we can use the default string type for URL params. Try catch. In the catch block, we call our error handler over the next function. And then in the try block, we still have to check if it's a valid idea that we are passing here. So let's copy this part here again. 
Then we want to check if the node actually exists. You can do this step. You could also just return a success response in both cases, either if it was deleted successfully or if it didn't exist in the first place. There are different opinions about this, but I think it makes sense to uh, throw an error message if this node doesn't actually exist, because we expected that it was there, but it wasn't. So as the first step, we look up this node and save it in a variable. So await node model. And again, these awaits are important. If you forget them, then the return type will not be correct. Node model find by idea. We pass the node ID param and call.exec. Then below we check if exclamation mark node. So if this node is null or undefined, then we want to throw a create HTTP error. And since the node wasn't found, we set the status code to 404 and the message will be node not found. If the node was found, then we go ahead and call await node.remove, which deletes it. Again, there is an alternative for that, which would be a node model dot find by ID and delete or remove, I'm not uh, sure right now, <laughs> which is the appropriate one. You have to look into the documentation. I think it's delete. But since we already have a reference to the node, it would be an unnecessary step to fetch it from the database again. Okay, so node.remove, and then we return a status code. This time we don't need a body. If we know on the front end that the deletion was successful, we can just remove it. We don't need the body of the old node for anything. So instead of rest.status, this time we call send status with the code 204, which if I remember correctly means uh, deletion successful or something like that. It's important that you use send status instead of status this time, like we used in these other endpoints. Why? Because status itself doesn't send a response. JSON is the call that's responsible for actually sending the response. But since we don't send a JSON body down here, we have to call send status to uh, set the status but also send it at the same time. So in other words, if you don't add .json, then you send status. Save. Okay, let's not forget to add this endpoint in our routes file here. So router.delete this time. Delete is another HTTP verb. And the URL will be slash and again the node ID. And we want to forward this call to nodes controller.delete node. Save this and then try it out with Postman. So this node ID up here should still be valid. We change the verb to a delete and let's go through our different errors. So let's try an invalid node ID, invalid node ID. Let's use a non-existing one, node not found. But as soon as we pass the correct node ID, this node should get deleted and removed from our database. So send, we don't get a response back because we only send a status code, but the status code tells us that this was successful, which means that on the front end, when we get this back, we know, okay, our node was deleted and we can remove it from the UI. And when we look into the database and refresh it, this node here with the updated title should be gone. So refresh this and very sad moment, our node is gone. Farewell, old friend. Okay, in the future, of course, we want to protect this via authentication. We don't want to allow anyone to delete any nodes nilly-willy. Any user should only be allowed to delete their own nodes, but this is something we will add in a, a later section of this tutorial. For now, we will leave our server aside a bit because it starts getting boring, right? Adding more and more endpoints, that's lame. In the next section, we will actually start building our React app. We will get back to the server here later because we aren't finished yet, but now it's time to write some React code because that's fun. All right, to create our React app, let's go into the folder where we also put the backend code. Let's put it in here as well. You can also put it somewhere else. I do this so I can push them to the same GitHub repository so you can find everything in one place. Now, when you set up a newer vanilla React project, then you should do this over the command line with the special create React app command, which you can find in the docs or if you just type in create React app in Google. But we basically just need this command here. You can also type it out by hand instead of copying it. Let's do that. 
let's go into this folder, open the command line here, and again on Windows you do this by holding Shift down, right clicking, open PowerShell here, and then we type npx, not m but x, create minus react minus app, then we have to give it a name, I'm just gonna call it front end for organization, and then to initialize this with TypeScript, we also add dash dash template space TypeScript. So the full command looks like this. npx create react app, the name front end template TypeScript. Enter, and now we let the magic happen. Need to install the following packages, create react app, blah, blah, blah. We type in Y to confirm this. Okay, looks like it went successful. Now it says 10 high severity vulnerabilities. So it's probably the case that it doesn't install the latest dependencies. We can do this later, we can update them. For now, this is fine. We close this and as you can see, it created this newer front end folder in our project, which contains a lot of files that we know already from our back end. We can also see it here in our project directly. So we have a package.json file with dependencies, we have a tsconfig file, which is already set up properly, we have a git ignore file with the most important stuff, and we have the source folder here, which contains the source code of the React project. Create React app also sets up some other stuff, for example, the whole tool chain that allows us to uh, yeah, compile our code basically into production code, which also minifies it so it runs more efficient and it can't be reverse engineered as easily. This is all set up by this create react app command. Now, first of all, let's go back into the package.json file of our react app and let's try updating these dependencies here. Maybe we can get rid of this warning about the 10 highest severity vulnerabilities. First of all, I want to point something out. As you can see in React, all dependencies are installed under the dependencies block. Even the types and so on and the dependencies we only need for development are here and not in the dev dependencies block. You can put them in the dev dependencies block, but I read their reasoning behind putting all of this here. This is because when we later build the project, everything that we don't use will be stripped away anyway. This is not the case for our backend, but it's the case for React apps. This is why you can just put everything into the dependencies block and it will not make a difference. So we don't have to do a install save dev, we can just install everything as a normal production dependency. And by the way, ESLint is also configured by default, so we don't have to install this either. But let's try updating our dependencies here. But we are still in the backend folder. We want to get to the front end folder. So we go uh, backwards one step with cd and then two dots, if I remember correctly, right? And then we want to go into the front end folder. And I'm actually not sure where the vulnerabilities are coming from. So let's run npm audit, which checks the dependencies. So where is this coming from? I don't really know because I think the dependencies are actually up to date already. I just checked them a moment ago. So let's run npm audit fix to try to fix them automatically. No, it still didn't work. But here it seems to be caused by React scripts. So maybe there's something wrong in the latest dependency. We could run npm audit fix force, which will basically set it to an older version. But since this is a tutorial and you might watch this in the future where this is not the case anymore, let's just keep it as it is. Let's ignore this for now. If you watch this in the future, there might be not these vulnerabilities anymore. Otherwise you can run npm audit fix force, which will set it to the appropriate version. So these vulnerabilities disappear. But for this tutorial, we will ignore this. But let's actually run this app because we can run it with the default setup. We type npm start and the React app runs on port 3000 by default, as you can see here. So now you can either type in this localhost address, but it actually should open it automatically. And this is our brand new React app. This is how it looks by default. The cool thing about developing React apps is that we see changes that we make to the code instantly. So let's close the console here. Let's actually close all the tabs because most of them are from our backend code. Let's also uh, collapse the backend folder. And then let's go into app.tsx. 
Before I explain what all of this means, let's just make a little change in here. Let's change this text to subscribe to a coding in flow. And as soon as we save this, it changes over here. So this is a lot of fun in development because it's really fast. You can see the changes instantly in the browser. Okay, whenever we work with React, we have these TSX files. If this was not a TypeScript, but a normal JavaScript project, this would be called JSX. And JSX or TSX is kind of a mix between HTML and JavaScript. So we get this weird mix here where we have yeah, HTML tags, but we can also write JavaScript in these files. And React is a so-called declarative UI framework. To understand what this means, let's look at the old approach, the imperative approach. So usually on websites, we have an HTML file that contains yeah, basically the structure of our website, where our buttons are, where text is, and so on. In this example here, we just have a button. But of course, a real HTML file has a body and different components and so on. And then we have separate JavaScript files. So we don't have this mix between HTML and JavaScript that we just saw a moment ago. We usually have this separated. And in our JavaScript files, we can interact with our HTML files and we can make changes to the text of buttons or other elements, for example. So in a JavaScript, we have stuff like variables because JavaScript is a real programming language. And when we want to change something, we look it up. Like in this example, we look up the counter button with this get element by idea function. We can set an onclick listener on it. And here we can define what we do when we click this button. And imperative means that we basically micromanage what happens. We say, okay, we want to increment the counter variable. And then we want to go ahead, take our button, change the text inside it with this inner HTML call here. By changing this, we change the text contained in this button. And then we define what we want to set this to. We want to set this to a count, colon, and a new count. This is how programming worked in the past, basically. The downside of this is that it's easy to forget stuff like changing the text properly. Of course, this is a simple example, but if you have a real app where many different things change in many different places at different situations, then this is easy to uh, get wrong and add bugs in the future because we always have to micromanage what we change at which point in time, right? Declarative UI frameworks change this concept a bit and React is one of them. Jetpack Compose is another example of a declarative UI framework on Android. I think Swift UI is one as well and Flutter too. With declarative UI, we define one time what kind of data a certain element on the screen should contain and then it's basically updated automatically. So this is basically the same button example as before, but this time it's React code. So imagine that this is a JSX file or TSX, so we can put all of this in the same file, the JavaScript and the HTML code. And in a declarative UI, we define one time what kind of text this button should contain. So as you can see, we have this button tag and here we have count colon and we pass this count variable. Now the difference to imperative UI is that when we now increment this counter and we change this count variable, this text here will update automatically. We don't have to go ahead and say change the text or the HTML of this button to this new value. Nowhere here in this code does this happen because it happens automatically. That's called declarative because we declare how the layout looks, the UI. And then React takes care of keeping it in sync with the data it depends on. So whenever the count changes, React knows that the text of this button has to change as well. And it basically retries this whole button on the screen. And this is okay because React takes care of making this efficient under the hood. And the main benefit of this is really that it's easier to keep our UI in sync. So if we have many different places and different variables, different state, then we just have to declare how the different components look and what data they should contain. And React takes care of keeping everything up to date as long as we declared it properly. And because we have this mix between HTML and JavaScript, we can also do stuff like putting for loops directly into our HTML and saying, okay, depending on the size of a variable, we want to add more or less items to our layout, for example. So we can do some really cool stuff. It also allows us to create reusable components that we can use in different places in our app because we don't have this arbitrary separation between HTML and JavaScript, which actually was never a good idea because it's a separation of technologies and not a separation of concerns as it should be. But JSX or TSX fixes this by allowing us to writing this mix between HTML and JS. 
and we will actually rebuild this example in a moment. So let's go back to our React project. First of all, let's install Bootstrap, or rather React Bootstrap, which is this UI library that we want to use. It just makes it easier to create UIs that actually look good. It's completely free, and I think it's easier to use than Tailwind CSS, for example. So here are the installation instructions. We basically want to copy this line, npm install React Bootstrap and Bootstrap, so those are two dependencies. So open the terminal here, cancel the execution with Ctrl-Z, make sure that we are still in the front-end folder, and paste this command. While this is installing, we take a look at the instructions again. Mm, we have to import this part here. This imports the CSS so that our elements actually look good. There are also different ways to install this or customize this, but the rest here doesn't really matter for us. We just want to copy this line and you can get it from this URL or take a look into the code in the description below of my project on GitHub There you can also copy it from. And where do we put this? We put this into the index.tsx file here, which is another TSX file just like our app TSX. Now the order of these CSS imports is important. So we put it all the way at the top here and import this bootstrap min CSS. Now index.tsx basically initializes our React app. For this, it uses another file in the public folder here, which is called index.html. As you can see, this is basically the structure of a normal website. This is a normal HTML file. And this is where our React app appears later, basically. So this is our page that we load when we load our React app. Down here, we have this root tag and index.tsx looks up this root tag and it renders our React app at this place. And the React app is the app.tsx file that we made changes to a moment ago. We don't really change much in this file besides little things like importing the CSS because we want to do this very early in our code. We could also do this in the app.tsx file, but we actually want to do it before we initialize the app itself. And here we also see something that we saw earlier already. This text here, you need to enable JavaScript to run this app. If you remember in the beginning when I disabled JavaScript in the browser, we saw the same text. This is handled by this no script tag here. And if JavaScript does work, then we see our normal root where our app is rendered in. This index.html file also contains metadata about our website. So as you can see, we have this title tag here, we have a description somewhere and we also have stuff like the preview images for social media. Now you can read more about this by just googling or reading the documentation, but let's make some little changes in here. Let's change the title to a cool notes app and let's change the description as well which is this meta tag here. Website created using create react app. This is what we see for example later in Google search when our website shows up there. Let's change this to a tutorial project by coding in flow because of course you always have to give appropriate credit and save this. Now when we run npm start again and look at the page again after it has started we can see the changes to our metadata. Now the title says cool notes app. We can't see the description but again we would see it in Google search for example. The little fuff icon here in the top left, this little icon you can see, is also something you can change in this index.html file. There's a fuff icon tag somewhere, this one here. There are generators for these kind of icons that you can find in Google, but we will leave the rest here untouched. Also interesting to note is the public folder here. This is where you put files like images that you want to use on your website. We won't add any images, but these React pictures here that we saw on the page are inside here. You can delete them if you want. You can also leave them there, it doesn't matter. And if you want to learn more about these different folders and file types that I don't explain here, then of course everything is explained in detail in the documentation. And now as promised, let's rebuild our button example, our button clicker that we saw a moment ago on the slides. For this, let's go into the app TSX file because this is where the code of our actual app lives, basically. 
Of course, later we have different pages and different components and we create separate files for them, but they are all put here in one way or another. We will talk more about the syntax of these React components later, but for now let's ignore this. And the first thing we need for our counter is a variable, of course, that maintains the current count. Now the first idea would be to just create a let counter and initialize this with zero. But in React we need a special type of variable for the state of a component. Because we need to notify React that it has to retry the UI to display the new value. So we don't use a normal variable, we create a state like this. const, then we make a pair of square brackets, and in here we write click count, which is just the name we give this variable, comma, and the second variable in here is set click count. So we always have a variable and then we have basically a function with the same name but just set prepended to it. Outside of the square brackets we write use state, which should add this import statement up here. If it didn't, add it manually and we initialize this with zero. And because TypeScript has type inference as usual, it knows that click count is a number because we initialize it with a number. So this weird syntax means that useState basically returns us a little array with two values and we destructure it like this. We take the first value, call it click count, and the second value which we call zClickCount. One is the value itself and one is used to update the state. And we do all of this here at the top of this app function before the return statement, because the return statement returns the actual UI element. Okay, and then we want to put our button somewhere. Let's remove this learn react link, we don't need it anymore. Instead create an opening anchor bracket button, which creates a HTML element. And we want to import button here from the react bootstrap package, which adds this import statement. We close this and in between these tags we can now define the text contained inside this button. So for example if we just write click zero times and save this, we see the change in our UI. This is the bootstrap button. Just for comparison, if we didn't use bootstrap but a normal HTML button, it would look like 1993, but we use these special styled bootstrap buttons. But of course we don't want to hard code the zero here. We want to show our click count. So instead of zero, we write a pair of curly braces because this is how we put a variable in between these two pieces of text. And in here we pass the click count. When we save this, it still says zero, but this time it's coming from the state up here. And now, as I explained, the magic of declarative UI is that when we update this click count over this set click count function, the text in here will change automatically. We don't have to micromanage this like in the imperative approach. And we want to change this value when we click the button. So in the button opening tag, we can add an on click function like this. Make sure that you get the spelling right, camel case with an uppercase C. And in here we want to pass a function. We pass an anonymous function like this, pair of parentheses, a right arrow like we did in our server code. And since this is only one line, we don't have to add another pair of curly braces. Instead, we can just call the function that we want to call directly. We want to call that click count. And we want to set this to a click count plus one to add one to the value that we already have. Let's save this and try it out. Now when we click our button, the state gets set to a click count plus one, so zero plus one is one. And since we updated the state, React knows that it also has to update the content in the button. And this time it's really difficult to mess this up in the future. We set how this button should look, what data it should contain, and React takes care of updating it properly. Okay, we now understand declarative UI and you can put React developer on your resume. But of course, if you want to learn more about React, then you should stick with this tutorial. Because the next step is to actually fetch the nodes from our backend and display them in the UI somehow. Okay, so before we can fetch the nodes to the front end, we need a model for the nodes on the front end as well. So we create a new folder in our source folder here, in our front end folder, so in our React code. And we call this 
lowercase models, not uppercase. And then we create a file in here. We right click, new file, and we call it node.ts. Attention, this is not a TSX file. This is not this weird HTML JavaScript combination. It's just a normal TypeScript file. Because all we put in here is one interface that we want to export so that we can use it in other places. We call it node. And this will contain the shape, the structure of our node type that we receive and use on the front end. Okay, so every node we will get from our server will contain an idea with an underscore because this is how MongoDB automatically saves IDs. Underscore idea and it will be of type string. Now technically the idea in MongoDB is a different type. It's this object ID type that we used before. But what we will receive from the endpoint will just be a string. And that's all we need to work with. Every node will have a title of type string a text of type string, but the text, remember, is optional. So we add a question mark here, because there might be a text in the node or not. And then the timestamps, created at, and the spelling has to be correct, because this is the name with which MongoDB stores these timestamps. And this will also be of type string, because what we receive is basically a string representation of the timestamp. And the reason why everything is a string is because we receive JSON from the backend and JSON doesn't have where we elaborate data types. There is no date type in JSON, for example. But string will suffice because we can pass everything from the string that we need. Okay, and then updated at, which is also of type string. Let's save this because this is all we need in here. All right, and then let's go back into our apptsx file. Because instead of a boring counter, we want to retrieve our nodes here and display them in the UI. So let's remove this line here with the click count. And replace it for another state, so another const, with these scrap brackets and these two variable names in here. We call it nodes, and the equivalent as the zetter function is znodes. There's always this pair between the variable and the zetter when you use state in React equals use state and this will contain the nodes that we display on the ui in form of an array we want to initialize it with an empty array because at the beginning when the site is opened there isn't any data in there yet we have to fetch it from the back end first but this way typescript doesn't have enough information to infer the type properly so when we hover over nodes it's of type never array so we have to tell typescript what type the state has to be later and we do this as usual with a pair of angle brackets. And the type will be our new node type we created in the models folder, but it will be an array, an array of nodes. And now nodes has the correct type here. Okay, but now the question is where do we load these nodes? We can't just put it directly in here inside the body. Why? Because if you remember, I explained that React basically redraws this whole component whenever something in it changes. And it does this by executing this function again. So now when we do something in the function body, which is called a side effect, so something that doesn't belong to the rendering itself, but something that happens in our normal app flow, and we do it directly here inside this body, then React will execute it on every render, every time this function is called, which of course isn't what we want. It's way too often. Instead, we want to load our nodes one single time when the app starts. In this onclick handler down here, we didn't have this problem because this only gets executed when we click the button. We are not calling this function in the body of our app component. We call it only when we click something. So this is an appropriate place for these side effects. But we don't want to have to click something before we load our nodes. We want this to happen automatically. And for this, we use something called use effect. As usual, if it didn't import properly, add it up here next to use state. It's a React import. And this is a function that takes another function as input. So we make a pair of parentheses and put another pair of parentheses inside it and the right arrow, so an arrow function and a pair of curly braces, like this. With use effect, we can execute side effects outside of the yeah, rendering of the component itself. In here, we have control over when it executes and how often. As you can see, the documentation says accepts a function that contains imperative, possibly effectful code. In here, we want to load our nodes. So we basically want to do const response equals await because it's an asynchronous operation. We have to load something from the backend. This can take a moment. 
And to fetch data in React or in JavaScript in general, we have this fetch function available that takes the URL and some configuration. And here we pass a string and the URL where we want to fetch the data from. That's HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 5000 because that's the address of our server in development slash API because this is how we configure the endpoint, right? Slash nodes. And then after the string, we write a comma because here goes some configuration for this request, for this fetch call. And in between curly braces, we write method colon and then get as a string in all other case. This configures that we make a get request with this fetch and not a post or a patch. But await complains because we only can execute await inside an async function. But when we try to make the function in use effect an async function, we get this lint warning. Effect callbacks are synchronous to prevent race conditions. But they also tell us the solution, put the async function inside. And then they are basically doing this. So we remove this async here again. And we simply have to wrap this inside another function, which we can then make async. So we create an async function, which we call load nodes. Doesn't take any arguments. And then we take our line here, cut it out and put it inside. And then we can simply call this function below to execute it. This way we don't have to make the use effect itself async and this way React is happy. Also this fetch call can throw an error if something goes wrong. So we have to wrap this into a try catch block. So we create this try catch block, cut out this line once again, put it in here. And in the catch block, we will simply lock this error and show a message to the user. We will later do some more elaborate error handling, but for now that's sufficient. So we write console.error pass the error, which we printed to the error console. And then we can also call alert and pass the error here as well. Alert opens a little pop-up window in the browser. It's not very beautiful and it's not a great user experience, but for development, this is sufficient. Okay, then we go below the fetch line again, because now we want to get our data out of this response. We are still inside the dry block, so everything went well. We create a const nodes. And then we have to add another await because passing the data out of the response is another asynchronous operation. Then we take response and call .json, which passes the JSON body out of this response. And when we take a look into our nodes controller, we remember that we return our nodes as a JSON to the front end. So this is what we get out of here when we pass this JSON. And then we call znodes, which is our state function here, and pass the new nodes. This way we update our state, and wherever we use these nodes in the UI, this part now gets updated by React. And we can display this new state. One more thing that's important, we have to pass a dependency array to use effect. We do this down here, after the function, which is the first argument that we passed, we write a comma and an array with two square brackets. In here you can pass variables that whenever they change, they will execute this use effect again. If we pass an empty array like this, then use effect will only execute one time at the beginning. This is exactly what we want. However, if we would pass no array at all, this would again execute on every single render. And this is pretty much never what we want. Because this is the same effect as if we put it directly inside the body without the use effect. So if you want to execute something one time, you pass an empty array like this. Okay, and we haven't designed a layout for our nodes yet. We will do this later. For now, let's just display the data that we get back in the form of a string. So what we do is we remove this whole header here because we will create our own layout later. And we want to display the value of our state variable. So we make a pair of curly braces and in between we write JSON in uppercase dot stringify, which as the name implies can turn a JSON into a string. So just that we see that we actually get some data back and here we pass our nodes. Then we save this and we try to run this. First of all, since I closed everything, I have to start the servers again, both the front end and the back end. So I cd into the back end code, run npm start here to start a server. And then I'm gonna create a new terminal. So if we have a separate one for the front end, and again, you can do it via this command here, a new terminal. 
here I see D into the front end and run npm start here as well. And then React will open this on localhost 3000. And let's see what happens. So this is the alert dialog that we wrote here, which means that there is an error that happened. So let's look into the developer console, which is a good habit to get used to anyway as a web developer. Let's refresh this to see the error. Here it is in beautiful red and it says cause, but we see the actual error message in the console. Failed to fetch, access to a fetch at yeah, our server endpoint from our front end address has been blocked by cause. Cause stands for cross origin resource sharing and it's basically a security mechanism that doesn't allow our front end to fetch the data from our server because they are on different addresses. Localhost 3000 and 5000 count as different addresses. Now there are two ways to get around this. Either we have to configure on our server that we are allowed to fetch data from this address, but this problem actually doesn't exist when both the front end and the back end run on the same address. And later in production, we will actually deploy everything to the same URL, just that our server code will be behind these slash API endpoints. But later in production, we will not have this course problem. We only have it now in development because we have these different localhost addresses. But there is something we can configure in React that will make it look as if the request is going to our own address. We will do this in a moment with something called proxy. First, I want to clarify a few other things. First of all, why did Postman not have this problem? Why was Postman allowed to fetch these resources? This is because the security mechanism is actually enforced not by our server, but by the browsers. So Chrome, for example, implements the security feature. And every browser can decide if they want to adhere to this or not. And Postman just ignores it, basically, because it's a development tool. Postman knows that we don't need the security mechanism when we use it because it's not a real browser. We're not actually serving the web like a normal user. The other thing I want to clarify is, as you can see, everything gets executed twice. We see our error messages twice. And when we refresh this, we should also see the alert message twice. Don't get confused by this, React just renders everything twice in development. There's a reasoning behind that, that is written somewhere, it makes debugging easier, apparently, but yeah, it executes everything twice, so don't get confused by this. This will not happen in production, it's just a development feature. But yeah, now let's go back into our project and implement this proxy I was talking about. For this we go into the package.json of our front end which was generated automatically earlier. And somewhere in here we put another key. I'm gonna put it above the dependencies, which is called proxy, colon. And then we basically just pass the URL of our server in form of a string. So HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 5000. We save this. Then we go back into the aptsx file and just remove this part here because now the proxy knows that these relative URLs will be added to this URL. And this way it also doesn't have problems with calls because it recognizes this as its own URL basically. This is just how this proxy works. Then we have to save everything and we have to restart our front end, otherwise this proxy doesn't go into effect. So we open the terminal of the front end, press Ctrl Z, confirm it, and run npm start again. And Lint complains about some unused stuff, but it's just because we haven't deleted it. You can do this if you want, but it automatically opens the page again and you can see our nodes array. From the scrap bracket, you can see that this is a JSON array and it contains our first node and our other one. And even though our website wouldn't win a design prize yet, it's already a cool feeling that we uh, receive our nodes from our own server on our React front end, right? And this is the raw data, and we can then use this raw data to put it into good looking components and display them in the UI. This is what we will do in the rest of this course. One more thing I want to clarify, this proxy approach works because we have our own server and our own front end. If you want to build a public API where different clients can access it, then you might have to set up course properly to allow these different origins. And you can do this very easily with this course package here. You can install this on the back end with npm install course, and then the setup is explained here. It's a very popular package, over 5 million weekly downloads, but we don't need it. 
because we are not building a public API, but just in case you want to build something like this. And by the way, if you got to this point and haven't liked the video yet, then I really don't know what's wrong with you. Leave some support, I put out this huge course for free, and you can help by just leaving a like on the video, because it helps this video grow better and reach more people. Thank you very much. Okay, to make our nodes better looking than this uh, string representation here, we have to create a component for our nodes, a component that contains the layout of each node. So we go into uh, the sidebar here, into our front end folder, and inside source, we want to create a new folder which we call components. And this contains all kinds of single components as opposed to uh, stuff like models or later our pages, which also go into a different folder. We right click on our new components folder, create a new file and call it node.tsx this time. So this is this HTML JavaScript file and not just a normal TypeScript file. And React components come in two forms, either a class or a function. I've actually never built a component as a class because this is the old approach. This is what I used in the past before I started learning React. Now these components are all created in form of functions. And the app itself, which is our front page basically, is also a function. So such a function creates a piece of UI basically. And we want to do the same thing for our node component. Now we will type out this function by hand once and then we will install an extension for VS Code that gives us a shortcut for that. So we can either write it like this function or we can declare it as an arrow function and the extension we will later use also creates arrow function so let's keep this style. So we create a const uppercase node equals and then we create an arrow function like this. A pair of parentheses, a right arrow and a pair of curly braces and then below we want to export this function. So we write export default node and now in here we can declare the UI for a node and then we can use this in different places in our app. But in order to display the data of each node we have to pass the node to this component, right? Otherwise where do we get the data from? So to declare what types of data this node should receive, we have to create another interface. Again, this is only necessary in TypeScript. In JavaScript, you don't need types, so you can just pass everything nilly-willy, but we don't want to do that. We want to be a bit more descriptive, but safe. And you can call this interface anything you want. I think a good naming convention is the name of the component itself, and then props appended to it. Props is what we call the arguments that we pass to a component. I think it's short for properties. And we want to pass a node to it. What kind of node? Our node model. So we write node and import this model's node type here. Now it's a bit confusing that our node model and our component here have the same name. And this can also cause problems. But I don't really want to name them differently. But we can use an alias for the name. So what we can do is we can go up here behind import node and write as node, oops, node model. This way we keep the name of our node interface here as it is, but we use it under a different name inside this component. So in here we change this to node model as well. Gonna add a trailing comma, it's not necessary, but I like that. And then we add this as an argument to our node function here. And we use this destructuring syntax where we write a pair of curly braces, the name of the variable, the name of the parameter, which is the same as up here, node, and outside of the curly braces we write colon, node, props. And if we add any more arguments up here to the interface, then we also add them to this list. So comma and then the next one. And now we can use this node data inside this node component. And what we want to do is we want to draw some cards on the screen from the React Bootstrap package. Because they look pretty good, you can read the documentation with all the features that are available, all the styling options. But for this tutorial, you can just follow what I write here. So in this function body here, we want to return something because what we return is the UI that gets drawn on the screen. 
We put it between parentheses because this allows us to write something below it, beyond many lines. And this just makes these parentheses necessary so that the return statement knows what belongs to the return. Here we write opening anchor bracket, uppercase cut, and we import it from React Bootstrap. Close this, which automatically adds the closing tag. In here we put a cart.body tag, close it as well. And then another one in here, cart.title. And for the title, we want to use the title of the node. So we make a pair of curly braces. And in here we write node, which is the node model that we pass to the component, dot title. Let's leave it like that for now, see how it looks, and then add the rest of the node to it. Arguments that you pass to a component, like our node here, work the same as state. Whenever a state changes, React knows that it has to update the UI that depends on the state. Whenever an argument that we pass to a function changes, React knows that it has to update this component as well. Which means that if we make a change to this node object that we pass to this node, then React knows that it has to redraw this component and show the latest data. Let's go over to the app.tsx file again. First of all, let's change the name of our node model here as well, so we don't have this clash between the model type and the component name. We change this to node model as well. And then we change the name here in use state. And then instead of just stringifying the nodes, we want to turn our nodes into a, this node card we just created. So we keep the div at a pair of curly braces. Then we take our nodes, which is our data, the node model array, and cal.map. And map is not something specific to uh, React, but if you're not familiar with it, map allows us to uh, take some data, like the array of our nodes here, and turn it into something different. This is exactly what we want to do. We want to take our raw node models and turn them into node component objects. And we do this with map. And since we are in this TSX or JSX file, we can write normal JavaScript in here. We can add loops, we can add map calls, and so on. This makes this whole thing very flexible, because now we can map our data directly to these HTML components. So map is a function, so we add a pair of parentheses, and then we have to pass an arrow function. This arrow function takes an argument, which is each node object in our array. So we write node and write arrow. So this way we get past each single node of our array, and now we can decide what we want to transform it into. We want to write this in a new line, so we add a pair of parentheses, just like we did over in our other component in the return statement. And now here we want to create our node component. So we write opening angle bracket node, which comes now from our components folder. This is the node TSX component we just created. We close this with a slash and a closing angle bracket. And this still shows an error because this expects an argument, which is the argument that we defined up here. It expects a node. Where do we get this node from? We get it from the map call here. So we pass it in between. Now one more thing, whenever we have a list of stuff like this, our list of nodes, we have to add a key to the object as well. This key property is there automatically. We didn't have to add it to our node. It's just added by React by default. Now sometimes Lint complains about this, but this time it doesn't. I'm not really sure why, but we should add this key. Otherwise there will be a warning in the console later. Equal sign, curly braces, and for the value of the key, we have to pass a unique identifier for each node. This is just necessary for React to know when it has to redraw this node. And what is a unique identifier? Now the idea is always unique to each node. So let's use that one. So let's save this and see how it looks. So I open our localhost again, and we have our two nodes. It's still not beautiful, but something happened on the screen. This is supposed to be a card. This is the card title, and this is our two nodes. So now let's improve the styling. So let's go back into the node TSX file and finish the styling here. First of all, we don't only want to use the title value in here, we want to use more values. And instead of writing node.title, node.text, and so on, we can use the same destructuring syntax we used up here to uh, yeah, unpack these single fields, basically. That's just a simple JavaScript feature. What we do is we write const, a pair of curly braces, 
after the closing curly brace you write equals node. So we are unpacking this node property here. And let's see if we have auto completion. Yeah, we have because I already added this equals node. And then we want to list each field that we want to use here in our component. We don't need the idea, but the other ones. So we write title, comma, text, comma, created at, comma, updated at, comma. And now we can just write title here instead of node.title, which I just like more because we already know that we are inside the node component. So this word is enough in my opinion. So below card.title, we add the card.text tag. Again, you can see these different tags and the combinations of them in the bootstrap documentation. Here we want to write the text. Let's save this and we see the changes immediately. Only this node here has a text. But of course, we also want to style these nodes with CSS. We want to change the shape, the colors. We want to add shadows later and so on. So we have to write some CSS. Now we could put the styling into the app.css file that we already have. There's already some default code in here that we got when we ran the create react app command. But I don't want to write global CSS because this later makes it difficult to organize your CSS properly because there can be clashes between different classes with the same names. Instead, we want to use CSS modules. So what we do is first of all, we delete this app CSS file. So we select it, press the delete key and delete the sucker. We also have to remove the import statement here from the app tsx file. So it compiles again. And then we want to remove this class name app here because we just deleted this whole CSS file. So let's remove that as well. And we still have this index CSS file, which is imported in the index TSS file here. But we don't want to delete this. We want to make this our global CSS file. Because even when we use CSS modules, we want to have one single global CSS file for some stuff that we just want to set up once globally and not for each component, like the font throughout our app, for example. So what we do is we change the name of index.css by clicking on it and pressing F2 on the keyboard or right click rename, whatever you want. Let's call this global CSS to make it clear that this is a global CSS file. Go into the index file, change the name here as well. And this will be the only place where we are allowed to write global CSS code. And let's actually add something new in here. Let's set a background color for our whole app. So in the body tag, we add background colon and then a pound symbol or for your zoomers out there, a hashtag FA, 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 which is this very subtle light gray that you can now see here. But now for our node component, we create a CSS module so that the CSS of our node component can't clash with any other CSS. And let's create a separate folder for our CSS files. So on source in our front end folder, we create a new folder called styles. First of all, let's put our global CSS in here. We might have to update the import in our index file to a slash styles slash global CSS. Okay, it works again. And then we create a new file in here, which we call node.module.css. And as the name implies, this is how we create a CSS module with the name .module.css. In here, we want to create two classes, which we do with a dot. This is CSS syntax, node card in camel case, and another one called card text. This is the two pieces that we want to style for now. Before we set this up, let's save this and add it to our node component. So in our node.tsx file, we add another import statement. Let's put it all the way at the top. Import styles, which will be the name of the variable of our CSS modules. You can also give this a different name from and then the path of our node module CSS file. So dot dot slash styles slash node dot module dot CSS. And now we can use the CSS module in here and it won't clash with any other components. It will be ignored by other components unless we import it there as well. 
we want to use one of the classes here for the whole card. So we add something to this card opening tag, class name, but instead of a string, we add curly braces and pass styles.notecard, which is the class name that we just added here to the node module CSS. And we want to use the other class here on the text. So we add class name here as well, styles.cardText with the same spelling as in our CSS file. We save this and then we go back into the node module CSS file. Now we can style our node in here. Let's start simple. Let's set a background color on each node. And you can use whatever you want. I'm going to use this corn silk, which is this yellowish color. And I also want to style the text. And to show you what I want to do exactly, let's open the database again. And I'm going to add a text here to the node that doesn't have one yet. So text colon. And then I want to write a text over multiple lines. So this is line one. This is line two. Let's keep one line free. This is line four. Save this and see how it looks in our front end when we refresh this. Okay, as you can see, it's all in one line, even though I put it in separate lines in our database. But we can fix this with this white space attribute and we set this to preline, save this, and now it's formatted like we added it in our database. Now our cards don't have room between them yet, which of course we can do with the margin attribute. It will look like this later, but we actually want to add this margin in a different place later, so I'm going to remove it again. And if you want to know where I learned these CSS attributes from, I just learned them through Googling. I never formally studied CSS. I didn't go through a list of all attributes. I just look up in Google whatever I want to do, like this white space preline, and then you can find it somewhere. The other thing I want to point out is, you might be wondering why this is called class name and not just class, because in normal HTML, the attribute is just called class. This is because we are in this TSX file here and class is a reserved name in JavaScript code. This is why uh, they changed it to class name instead. Otherwise this wouldn't work. All right, so we already learned some CSS styling. Our nodes at least look a little bit more like nodes now. We are not done yet. We will finish up the CSS in the remaining tutorial. Okay, to put our nodes into a nice grid, we will use another component from React Bootstrap. They provide these grid helpers here, which are rows and columns and containers that make it easy to create a yeah, responsive design and automatically adapt with the screen size. So again, you can read the documentation, but you can also just follow along. We go into our app TSX file once again, because this is where we map the nodes and here we want to shape them into a grid now. First of all, we want to change the div to a container, which is a bootstrap component. Let's not forget to change the closing tag as well. This just adds some padding and centers the nodes on the screen. Then in here, we want to set up our grid, which we do the following way. We add a row, which again is coming from the React Bootstrap library, and it's adding all these import statements up here. And we do some configuration in here. We have to define at which screen size how many rows we want to show in our grid. And you can change this however you want, but I tried it out and I found this the best configuration. At very small screens, we want to show one column. At medium sized screens, and we have these different properties for these different screen sizes. MD, we want to show two columns. And on large screens, we want to show three. We close this and we cut out the closing tag and put it below our map call here. Now when we save this, I think we should already see a difference. Yeah, you can see how it grows and shrinks. We don't have three nodes yet, so let's add a third one. Let's do that with Postman real quick. So we do a post request to our nodes endpoint. We need the title. Let's call it node 3. Let's also add some body text. This is line one. Let's just add one line here, send this, and let's create a fourth node as well. And this says, this is line one. 
I actually don't know how I can add multiple lines here. I'm not sure if I can just do it like this, probably not. So I will add more lines later in our database. Create a fourth node, go into our database backend here, refresh this. I just wanna make the fourth node a bit bigger. So I go into the text here. This is line two, this is line three and save this. Take a look at our front end here again and now we have more nodes. And because of our row setup here, the layout changes depending on the size of the screen. It's not perfect yet, but we are getting there. To add some margin here between our elements in the grid, we add a class name to the row tag, which this time will just be a string. We use this g-4 class which is a class from the bootstrap library that adds some room between the single elements in a grid. We could also create our own class in our own CSS component, but we might as well use these predefined ones here. Let's again change the size and see how this looks. Okay, there's still no room horizontally between the nodes. We add this by wrapping the single nodes that we map in here into column elements. So we go inside this map curl here inside the parentheses. And we wrap the node into a column. Again, this is a React Bootstrap import. Cut out the closing tag and put it below our node here. Now we also have to move the key from here to the outer element. So we cut this out and put it in the column. Now there should be some horizontal spacing between our nodes here as well. As you can see, the sizes are different, so this doesn't look good yet. We will fix this. In a moment, we want to get all of these nodes at the same height. The question is, where do we put the CSS? Of course, we could put it into the node module CSS file here. So it will be applied to every node. However, I want to keep the styling of these nodes a bit more flexible and give the outside component control over how each node looks. The same is the case for stuff like the box shadow that appears when we hover over a node. I don't want to bake this right into the node component because then every place in our app has to display it the exact same way. Instead, I want to declare the styling on the level of this page here and then just pass it to the node. Also, it's a good way to learn how to pass class names to a component. So what we do is we create another CSS module in our styles folder which we call notespage.module.css. We will use this on the page that displays our nodes. At the moment, that's the app.tsx file, but later this will be a separate component. In here, we put a node class and a node colon hover class. This is how you define the styling of a class in CSS when you hover over it with the mouse. Now, before we fill this with actual styling, let's use this in our app.tsx file. So we go in here, we import the styling, import styles from, and the path is here, dot slash styles slash notes page dot module dot CSS. And then we want to style our node from in here. This way, as I explained, this page defines the styling of the node and not the node itself, or at least part of it. But first we need a way to pass a CSS class to our node component. So we go inside the node component and we add another property to the node props, which we give the same name as the normal class name attribute here. But we make this optional. So we can pass a class name to this component or we can omit it. And it will be of type string. And then we want to add this class to our cart here, to the outermost component, so we can style it from the outside. We already have a class in here, so how can we add another one? We can change this to a, a string. And we do this with a pair of backticks like this, because backticks allow us to put variables inside the string. So we wrap this styles.notecart into backticks and then into a curly braces and we add a dollar sign here. Cha-ching. This way we put a variable in here. And this allows us to add another one inside the string. So again, dollar sign, cha ching, curly braces, and then we pass class name. 
which is this property here. But we must not forget to also add it up here to actually add it as an argument to the component. This now allows us to pass another class name from the outside if we want. To allow the color of this node to style this node. Then we go back to our app.tsx file after saving this. And now we can add this new class name property here, which is optional. So we can add it or we cannot, however we want. And here we now want to pass the class that we defined in this notes page module.css. Let's take a look at it again. We want to use this node class here. So app.tsx, uh, let me move this over here so that it's easier to reach. Here we want to pass styles.node, save this, and then we can style this node from the nodes page module. So what we want to do is, first of all, we want to set all the nodes to a fixed height of 200 pixels. So it looks already better in our grid. We want to give them a min width as well, which means that when the screen gets very small, they can't just shrink indefinitely, which at a certain point looks ridiculous, like this. We want to set the min width to 150 pixels, and now they can't shrink below this size. I also want to add a box shadow, which I'm going to copy paste. You can pause the video for a moment and type it, it out by hand. So add box shadow colon and then pause the video and type out this stuff here. Or copy it from the GitHub repository below. This adds a shadow to the hover state. It's very subtle, but it looks cool. But we also want to add an animation so it's not so abrupt. We add this to the node tag with the transition attribute, and then we write box shadow, the duration, which is 200 milliseconds, so point to S, and then we use this ease in out animation here. And now it animates to this box shadow when we hover over a node. One more thing, we also want to change the mouse pointer to this, yeah, this little hand icon that indicates that we can click something because later when we click a node, we want to open it. So we add another attribute, cursor pointer. And now we have this pointer cursor when we hover over a node. Nice. But we aren't done with the CSS yet. Let's see what happens when the text of the node gets longer than these 200 pixels. So once again into our DB, just gonna add some more text here. This is line 5, this is line 6, line 7, let's add another empty line, line 9. That's a lot of lines. Refresh this. Yeah, and it goes beyond the node, which of course doesn't look great. We will fix this on the CSS level of our single nodes. So we go into the node TSX file once again, and we want to add another class to the card body because this is where we have to fix this. So class name will be styles.cardbody. We save this and go into the CSS module of our node, this one here, and add another class for the card body. I'm gonna put it here just for ordering. We set overflow to hidden. This removes the text that goes beyond the body. But this now doesn't really tell us that there is more text in here, right? So I wanna add some nice effect which we do the following way. Mask image, colon, linear gradient, and in here we can yeah, specify a gradient. 180 DEG for degree. The color will be a hashtag 000, so it will be black, but with a 60% gradient to it, comma, and then we write transparent which creates this gradient effect here when we save it. As you can see, now this kind of indicates that there is more text below it. I just like this effect. This way we can give each node the same height, but still not just cut off the text in this ugly way. Next, I want to add the timestamp here at the bottom of each node. So let's go into the node TSX file once again. And here I want to add a card footer. Below card text, we add another tag, card.footer. 
And in here we want to see the created at timestamp for now. Okay, this doesn't look great yet because this is actually the wrong place. We have to put it below the body here. Okay, the first one doesn't have a timestamp yet because we created it at the very beginning directly in our database. Also, the timestamps are not formatted yet, so it's not really readable. And we also want to show the updated timestamp if the node has been updated. So we still have to make some changes. The first change is adding another class to the footer, which again is a class from the bootstrap library, which is called like this, text muted. It just makes the text a bit more gray. Again, we could do this ourselves in our CSS module, but there's no reason to not use Bootstrap's predefined classes for that. Next, I want to format the timestamp properly, but I don't want to do this directly in this component because that's not really good separation of concerns and we might want to use this in a different place again later. So let's create another folder for that. In our front end folder, in source, we create a utils folder for all kinds of utility functions. Let's add another file in here, which we call formatdate.ts, a normal TypeScript file. And in here we export one single function with the same name, formatdate. It will take one argument, which is the date in form of a string. So let's call it date string of type string. And it will return a string. We don't have to declare the return type in TypeScript, but I like to do this because it gives us a bit more safety because now this will not compile until we return a string from this function. And here we want to return our date, but in a nice format. And again, I found out how to do this through Google and Stack Overflow. Return new date. We initialize this date with the date string that we pass, and then we can format it with dot tour locale string, this one here. And to this we can pass some configuration. The first piece is a string, like this, en minus us, the us in uppercase, which if I remember correctly formats this with a us styling. There are also other languages, Chinese for example, but in most situations you want to use the us styling. Comma, and I put this in a new line, Take a look at the exact syntax I'm using here, because that's important. The first argument is a string, the second argument is a JavaScript object with two curly braces. And here we can do further configuration of how we want to style this date string. And here you just have to follow along. We define year as a string and we set it to a numeric. We set month to short. And those are just the different options we have to uh, display the date. For example, a year with just the last two digits or all four, the long name of a month or the short one, this is just the combination I found looks good. Day numeric, hour numeric, minute numeric, and we don't need seconds here. So this is fine. Now we can use this function in our node component. But we want to display either the created timestamp or the updated timestamp, depending on which one is newer. So let's put this logic here inside the body of this component above the return statement. We create a let, created, updated, text of type string. This should not be a comma, but a semicolon. Below we check if updated add is greater than created add, which means that the node has been updated. Because when we create a new node, updated add and created add will have the same value. When we update a node, updated add will be greater. So if updated add is greater, we want to show the updated timestamp. So we set created updated text to updated colon and then the formatted date string. So we call our format date function and pass the updated add timestamp. If updated add is not greater, so in the else block, we want to set created updated text to created colon and the formatted created add timestamp. 
Now remember that whatever we put inside this component body without a use effect will be executed on every render. This is okay because format date is a cheap operation. We can afford to execute this on every render. But if this was more expensive, you should use something either a use effect or something else called use memo, which you can read up in the documentation, which is basically a holder for these expensive operations. But cheap, simple operations that are very fast can be done directly in the body of a component. Just be aware that this gets executed on every single render. Okay, and then down here, we don't want to display created at, we want to display our formatted, created, updated text. And when we save this, it now looks much better. Again, the first one has an invalid date, but later we will not add any new nodes with invalid dates. So we don't really have to take care of this case because it's just um, in our development setup here. But let's try updating a node to see if the timestamp changes properly. I want to update node 3, which has this ID here. Let's do it over Postman, so it's actually recognized as an update. We do a patch request to the node's endpoint to the node with this ID. We keep the title as node 3 and say this is an updated node body. Send this update. It went through. Refresh this and now we see our updated timestamp because now the updated timestamp is greater than the created timestamp. Really nice. Our nodes already look pretty cool. The layout is responsive. The next step is to add a way to add nodes through our front end rather than having to do this via Postman all the time. Okay, so let's do that next. Okay, so we want to add a way to add new nodes through our front end. And we already have all the endpoints on our server in place for that, for creating, reading, updating, and deleting nodes. And now we just need some kind of form in our React app where we can enter a new node title and text and send them to our server. First of all, let's organize our fetch code a bit better. So in our app.tsx file, we have our fetch call at the moment where we get our existing nodes from the server. And I like to put this low-level code into a separate file for better organization so that we don't have these endpoint strings and this method get in our React components, but rather a clean function that we can call. So what we do is we go into our source folder in the front end folder right here. Right-click and create a new folder, which I'm going to call network. And in here we create a new file which we call nodes underscore api.ts. Not tsx, it's not a React component, it's just a normal TypeScript file. And you can give this any name you want, but I think this one makes sense. And in here I want to move the fetch call from our get request here. But there's also another problem this code has right now. By default, server responses like 400 and 500, which mean that something went wrong, are not handled as errors by the fetch call. So they don't end up in this catch block here, but they should because these status code mean that something went wrong. And in this case, we want to show an error in the UI because we don't have any real data to work with. So we have to do this ourselves. If we get these status codes from the server, we have to throw an error ourselves. But to see the problem, let's just throw an error from our get nodes endpoint here. So in our backend code, let's just throw a create HTTP error with 401, for example, it doesn't really matter. I will remove this in a moment. This is just for presentation. And now when we uh, try to access our front end through localhost, we don't see an alert that we uh, normally do in our catch block here. Instead, we just see an error in the console. Nodes map is not a function, which happens because we don't actually get an array of nodes back since we throw this error in our server here. I don't know what we get back, um, null or undefined, I guess, and our React app can't work with that. But the correct way to handle this is to actually throw an error when we get an error response like 401. But again, we have to do this ourselves. First of all, let's get rid of this error code here. Then we go into our nodes API file again. And what we want to do is we want to create a wrapper around fetch. A wrapper that uses fetch but throws an error if the status code is 400 or 500. So we create an async function. 
We don't have to export it because we will only use it within this Nodes API file. And I'm gonna call it fetch data, which is similar to fetch, but it's our own function. You could also call it fetch with error, I guess, but I like this name. This will take the same arguments as the fetch function itself. So when we look into fetch here, we can see that it takes an input request info and an optional init request init. So let's add the same arguments here. Input colon of type request info and an optional init of type request init. This way we can call this function like the normal fetch function. So the next line is const response equals await fetch. So we execute the fetch call itself where we just pass the input and the init that we pass to the fetch data function. And then we do a check if response.ok, which is this property on the return type of the normal fetch call. And response.ok will return true if the response is between 200 and 300. If it's between 400 and 500, this will return false. So only if the response HTTP code is ok, we want to return the response. Else we want to throw an error so that we end up in our catch block. Now our errors also have a JSON body, right? When we look into the backend apt.ts file, we set up our error handler in a way that the error gets sent back through the JSON body. So let's read this here so that we can log it and also maybe display it in the UI depending on the error. So we create a const error body which we get with await response.json the normal way like we also get the real body out of the response. const error message equals error body dot error. Why error? Because this is the key we set on this JSON body here. So those have to be the same. And then we want to throw an error. And for the message, we will just pass the error message here. Now later we will get back to this function and distinguish between different kind of error codes and throw different errors which we can then handle differently in our UI depending on the type of error, but for now this is sufficient. Now let's put our fetch notes call in here. So below we write export async function because we want to use this one from the outside and let's call it fetch notes. It doesn't take any arguments but it will return a promise of type node array. Now adding this return type here is optional, but I like to add it because this makes sure that we actually return the correct value from here and not mess anything up when we change the code later. And all async functions have to return a promise because async is basically just syntactic sugar around promises. So whenever you create a function that is async and return something, the return type is automatically wrapped into a promise. And then we want to take the code from over here, these two lines, cut them out and paste them in here, just with a little change. We don't want to store the JSON body in a variable, we want to return it. We want to call fetch data instead of the normal fetch, so that 400 and 500 responses are treated as errors and we have to import a node type here. So let's just use auto completion and it should add this import statement. Let's save this, go back into our aptsx file and call our newer shiny function here instead. So first of all, I want to import our nodes API file and I import it manually because I want to import it in a special way. I don't want to import each function separately. I want to add them to a namespace. So we do this star asterisk symbol, write s notes api from and the folder is dot slash network and the notes api file and now here we can write const notes equals await notes api dot fetch notes and now we have this clean function that we can call here and we hide the low level fetch code here inside this separate file I just think this looks better and it keeps these components clean. But let's see if our error now works properly. 
So I go into our endpoint again and I add this error here once again, which of course I will remove in a moment. Let's open our page here again, refresh it, and now we get our alert message here, which we do in the catch block. Because now 401 and also 500 responses throw errors and end up at the correct place. Now let's also add a function to create a new node, which we put into our nodes API file as well. Let's create an export async function, create node. And this of course has to take input the node title and the text. Now we could put this as separate string arguments in here, but I actually want to create an interface for that because we use the same types later in our form and this way we don't have to repeat title and text again all the time. And when we make changes, we have one single place to change it. So we put an export interface in here, export because we want to use this from a different file later. Let's call it node input. And every node needs a, a title in form of a string and the optional body text, which is a string as well. And then we can use this type here as the input parameter, like this. This will also return something, a promise, because it's an async function, and it will return the node we created when this was successful. So a promise of type node. So we create a const response equals await fetch data, not fetch, but fetch data. The endpoint where we create new nodes, which is the same for getting nodes. So slash API slash nodes, comma. And I put the configuration into a separate file because this will be a bit longer. So we add a pair of curly braces. The method this time, of course, is post. And we have to add some headers to our request to indicate what kind of data we are sending. So we write headers colon, add a pair of curly braces, and then we add a string as the key. And the spelling has to be correct, otherwise it will not recognize this header. Content type like this with the same casing colon and the content type will be application slash JSON. This just tells the backend what kind of format our body is in. Of course, we are sending a JSON. Gonna add a trailing comma here, we don't have to, but again, I like trailing commas. And then we wanna pass the body itself. And since we can only send string back and forth between our server and our front end, we wanna stringify the node that we pass here. So we write JSON in our uppercase, dot stringify and pass our node. Then I'm gonna put a semicolon here because we are not savages. Okay, and if this went successful, in which case it didn't throw, then we can just return response.json, which should contain the newly created node, which we can then put into our UI. Okay, and now we want to add some kind of form to input new nodes and send them to our backend. And for this, we will use bootstrap models, which are these dialogues here that we can open. And we will create such a model with some form input in it. I think it's just a cool way to insert new nodes. So let's go into our front end folder and create a new file in our components folder. Right in here. Let's call it add node dialog. And this one is a TSX file again. And I said the second time we create a React component, we want to use an extension for that. So we click here on this extensions tab. And I think we should find it when we search for react or react snippets actually. Should be this one here. This gives us these different shortcuts we can use to create stuff like components and use state and stuff like that. So let's install this. But of course you don't have to, if you don't want, you can also just keep typing them out manually like a peasant. Okay, and now we can just type SFC which creates this functional React component. Gonna paste the name here. And then we have the return statement and the export and everything. Let's start by creating a minimal version of this dialog just to see how we can show it in the UI. So between return, we add the modal tag from the React Bootstrap package, close this. And here 
in the opening text still, before the closing angle bracket, we pass show. This has the same effect as passing show equals true like this. Whenever you want to pass true, you can also just pass the name of the property. Then in between these tags, we add the model.header, where we add the close button to the tag to add this little X in the top right corner where we can close this model later. And in between here, we add the model.title. And this tag is just responsible for formatting the title properly with the correct text size and everything. And the title will be uh, add node. Let's keep it like that for now and display this model from our app.tsx file. And the way this works is that we uh, need a state that tells us if the model should be shown or not. And the little animation for opening and closing, this all happens automatically. We just need to tell React if it should be shown or not. So below our nodes state here, we create another state the same way. We call the variable show at node dialog and the setter function will be a set show at node dialog in camel case. And we initialize this with use state false. And again, TypeScript can infer the type because we pass false, which is a Boolean. So it knows that this variable here is a Boolean. And then we can just add this dialog like every other piece of UI into our return statement here, where we draw the UI on the screen. We do this within the container block because it needs some text on the outside, can be a container, can be a div, doesn't matter. Then we add a pair of curly braces. And now we can do a little yeah, React syntax that might look a bit weird at first, but this is how you can draw UI components conditionally on the screen. We take the name of our state, show at node dialog, and add two ambersons, which means that whatever we put after that will only be drawn on the screen if show at node dialog is true. If it falls, it will not be drawn. And here we add our add node dialog, which right now it doesn't take any arguments, but let's try it out. First of all, I still have the 401 error here. Of course, we have to remove this. Then, since we don't have a button to show our dialog yet, let's initialize this with true, just to see our dialog here on the screen. And there it is. Right now, we can't close it because we don't have a way to set show at no dialog to false yet. But you can already see that this is displayed on the screen here. Let's set this back to false. We will show this later when we click our add new node button. And I want to mention something, instead of writing it like this with this variable down here, we could have also passed this variable as a property and used it as the value for this show property here. So then we could remove this part here with the two ambersons and pass show as node dialog as a property. The reason I do it like this is because when we do it the other way, then any input in this dialog will be maintained after we close the dialog. So let's say we type in a title and a text and we close the dialog and open it again, the title and the text will still be there because the state is contained in this dialog component. Depending on your situation, this might be what you need, but in our case, I want to uh, clear the whole form whenever we close the dialog. Because if you would try to enter a node and close the dialog, I assume that you would change your mind and you don't want to store the input. That's why I write the syntax like this. Since this will completely remove this component from the screen, the state inside this component is also lost, just as a little explanation why we write it this way and don't use this show property here. Instead, we hard code show to true and handle showing or not showing from the outside like this. Now let's actually go ahead and add the button that can open this dialog. So we don't have to hard code the state here to true. So what we do is inside this container here above our node grid, we add a button which will say add new node. The button gets an onClick attribute where we pass an error function like this. And this will call set show add node dialog and set this to true. This way we display our dialog. Then we save this, we go into our dialog and we add an interface because we want to pass some data here interface at node dialog props. We want to add a way to uh, close the dialog. Now, when we click outside of the dialog or we click the close button, all of this will be detected inside here. We just have to pass it to the calling component to tell, okay, change the state back to uh, 
that show dialogue false. And we do this via a callback. This might be confusing at first, but this is just how you do it in declarative UI. If you've been coding with Jetpack Compose on Android, for example, then it works similarly with these callbacks. On this miss is a function that doesn't take any arguments and it doesn't return anything. So write it like this. Add it here as the actual argument on dismiss. We destructure this as we have done before and use our add node dialog props type here. And then on this model tag, we have this on height callback, which will be a cult whenever we do an action that closes the dialog. This includes clicking outside of the dialog, but also clicking this close button, for example. And here we just want to forward to our on dismiss callback. And since this doesn't take any argument, we can just pass the function as a reference directly by its name and we don't have to pass an error function. We could also write it like this. This would have the same effect. But since this doesn't take any arguments, this is basically a shorthand for the same thing. We save this and now of course we have to pass this new property to our dialog here. So we pass on dismiss, which this time again is an error function because we want to call set show at node dialog and set this back to false. So let's try this out. We open our page again and the styling is not great at the moment. We will fix this later, but our button is there and we can use it to open our dialog. So this sets the show dialog state to true. And when we click the close button or we click outside, it sets the state back to false. And this is how you show model dialogs in declarative UI. Now let's finish our add node dialog. And for forms, we also have bootstrap components that we can use. They just look a bit better than the usual HTML forms you have. They look like this. Of course, you can change the styling if you want, but yeah, you can do a lot with them. Okay, so let's add these form components to our add node dialog. We go below the model header and I like to put a space in here. The space has nothing to do with how the model looks later. It's just in our code. And we add the model body for the main part. And in here we want to put a form and we use the form from the React Bootstrap package. And then we create our form like this. And I've put it into split screen again so we can see how this form comes into a reality. So we need a form.group. And again, I know all of this from the Bootstrap documentation. There they explain how you have to structure this. The form group will take a class from the bootstrap library, which is called mb-3. This just adds some margin at the bottom of each input field. In here, inside the form group, we add a form label, which we call title. Okay, so that's the first piece of form on the screen. Below the form label, we add a form.control, which is the actual input itself. This takes a self-closing tag because everything that we pass to this component is a property. When we save this, we already see the input field, but we have to uh, define some configuration here. This is the same for React forms, but also normal HTML forms. We have to give it a type, which we set to text. This just helps the browser know what kind of input this input field expects. For password, for example, we will later set the type to password, which automatically hides the characters. We can add a placeholder, Set this to title, which adds this additional little text inside the field that is only there until we insert some text. That's it for this input field for now. We will later add some more stuff, but not right now. Instead, we add another form group below the first one. This will take the body of the node, the text itself. Again, it takes a class name mb3. It gets a label which will say text and we add another form control. This time we don't set the type to text. Instead we do this, we write s equals text area, but as a string like this, which creates this larger input field where we can change the size of it. This is just another type of HTML input. We can also define the rows number which sets the default size of this input field. So by default, this has a size of five lines, basically. Again, we set a placeholder, 
to text. And that's it for this component for now. The last thing we need is a button to submit this form, right? And I want to have this button in the footer of the model. It's just a better look in my opinion. So below the model body, we create a model footer. And in here we put a button that will say save or submit or whatever you want. And this button takes some properties as well. We want to set the type of the button to submit. And this is not an arbitrary string, this has a special effect. If we put this button inside the form here, inside these form tags, then submit tells the browser that this button is supposed to send this data. So it has an effect when we click it automatically without us having to add an on-click listener. This is the property that tells HTML components that this button is responsible for sending the form. But since we put this button into this footer here, it's disconnected from the form. As you can see, it's outside of it. This way the browser doesn't know anymore that these two are connected. But we can fix this with another property, with the form property. We can add an ID here. Let's say add node form. And then we can set the exact same ID on the form itself. This way the browser knows that these two are connected. So we set an ID here and it has to be spelled exactly like down here, at node form. Now this button is connected to this form. Right now this won't do anything because we still have to define what happens when we submit a form, but now these two are connected. I think when we click it by default, the page will refresh. Yeah, this is how uh, this behaves by default, but we will change this in a moment. Now handling forms manually, especially in React, can be a bit tricky because you have to synchronize it with the state, you have to handle different error states and so on, and also you don't want to retry the UI too often when you insert some new text. This is why you usually want to use a package for that which handles the form stuff. And the most popular one for React is React Hook Form. There's also another one called Formic which hasn't gotten any new updates in almost two years, I think. So this is the one you want to use. It's really good. Again, you can read the documentation if you want, but I will show you how this works. So as usual, we open the command line and we go into our front end command line here. Stop the execution for a moment and install react hook form. Then let's start our server again, close the terminal. And then let's finish our add node dialog by using react hook form. First of all, we add another property that we pass to this form. We also need a callback when a node was saved successfully because then we want to add it to the UI. We want to add it to our list here. So we add another callback called on node saved, which is also a function, but this time the function takes an argument. So we write node colon, which is the name of the argument and the type of the argument is node in uppercase, but it won't return anything. And then we add the second callback here as the argument to our component. Then to use react hook form in here, we go above the return statement and there is a special hook we can use. This hook returns different kind of data and functions that we then use in our form. So we have to destructure these single variables by creating a const, adding a pair of curly braces, and then we list them in here. Before we do that, let's go behind it and write use form, which is the name of the hook. So it adds another import statement. And we have to give this a type, which is the input type of our form here. And this is why I created this node input interface in our nodes API file earlier and exported it there because now we can reuse it here. And this is a function, so we have to call it. And now we should have auto completion in here, I think. So the yeah, the first one is called register. You will see what we use this for in a moment. The second we need is handle submit. And then we need the form state, which we want to further destructure, which we do like this colon, another pair of curly braces. This just is the beauty of JavaScript syntax. And in here we have an errors field, comma, and this is submitting callback, this one. Okay, that's a lot of stuff to add, but just type it out like I did here. Then below we create a function that actually handles submitting a node and calling our API endpoint. 
So it's an async function because we do our async request and we call it on submit, which is a naming convention for whenever you do something in response to submitting a form. You can also call this whatever you want. It will take input in form of our node input type. Then we add a try catch block here because we do our backend request, which can always go wrong. We lock the error in case there is one and we use another alert. Now in a real app, you can use a more beautiful UI element than an alert dialog because it's a bit disruptive and we will actually do this later in a different place. But for this here, this is sufficient. Okay, when we create a node, we will get the created node back as a response. So we create a const, call it node response, await nodes API, which of course we have to import here. Import star as nodes API from dot dot network. This is just trial and error where, where the location of the package itself is. We already have one up here, but with this syntax, we can't combine the two. We can't cut this out and put it in front of these curly braces. Okay, so await nodes API dot create node, where we forward the input, which is the title and the text. Okay, so, and if this succeeded, we want to call our on node saved callback and pass the node response to the color of this component which right now is the aptsx file. This will represent the successfully created node there and we can add it to the UI. The next step is to go into our form tag here again and add a second property to it, which will be on submit. As the name implies, this is called when this form is submitted, which happens when we press our submit button because it's connected to the form, right? And in here, we want to use this handle submit function that we get from the use form hook. Sounds a bit complicated at first, but those are just steps you have to learn because it works the same way every single time. So in here we want to call handle submit and pass an argument to it, which is our own on submit function. So this is a bit weird syntax, but this connects the form to the react hook form package. So on submit is the callback when this form is submitted and we pass handle submit, which hands the input to a react hook form first which then uh, does some stuff behind the scenes and calls our on submit function, which executes this part here. So pay attention to the syntax here. Even though we have parentheses and call this, this is not an error function. So we do not write it like this. We write it like this. Why? Because this gets called at initialization, not when we click submit. I guess it creates some return value that it then uses in here. I don't know how this exactly works under the hood, but this is the syntax you have to use. Okay, and the way we connect each form input to a React hook form looks also a bit weird. But again, this is how it's supposed to be done. We add a pair of curly braces here inside this form control component. Then we do three dots, which means that whatever comes after it gets destructured into its single components. So we add one thing here, which is this register call. But this basically gets separated into uh, many different properties that all get added to uh, this component, to the form control. This is what the syntax here means. It takes register and it separates them into its single pieces, basically. Register is a function that takes arguments. The first argument is the name of this input field, which has to be one of the properties that are contained in our node input here, that we used in use form. So node input contains a title and a text and auto completion already tells us that we have to use one of them down here because this is what connects this input field to this value. And React hook form later knows that when we submit this, this is the title value that it will send to our on submit function here. Again, it's a bit complicated at first, but this is how HTML forms work in React. The second argument to register after the string is some configuration we can pass in form of a JavaScript object, so we add a pair of curly braces. In here you can, for example, set up form validation. For example, you can use this required key and pass a string here. For example, required. The string is what will later be shown in the UI if we try to submit this without input by adding this required property. In our form control for the text, we won't use required because this one is optional. So here again, we add register like this 
and just pass the name, which this time is the text. Okay, but for our required field, we also want to have some feedback, right? We want to have this little red text below the input field that prints this required text. So inside the form group, we add another component, which is called form.control.feedback. And this gets a property as input, which we say to invalid. There are two types of feedback, valid one, which is the green text when something went successful and invalid, which is this red text. And in here we want to get the error message. Where do we get it from? We get it from this errors property of use form. So to use a variable in here, we add another pair of curly braces and we pass errors dot and we get auto completion for our two input fields, title and this error is undefined if there is no error. So if we didn't try to submit empty input, so we have to add the save call operator here, which is this question mark and then a dot behind it, which means that we will use this message value here only if title is not undefined or null and otherwise this will return undefined. And we use this message property here, which contains the error message itself, which is this piece here. Okay. But we only want to show this input if there's an actual error for the title, right? We handle this with another property on the form control. This one is called is invalid, and we have to set this to a boolean. We want to show the error down here only if there is an error for the title, right? Remember, this is possibly undefined. Only if it's there, we want to show this piece down here. So what we do is we write two exclamation marks, which takes a value like our title here, which is of type field error or undefined, and turns it into a boolean, true or false. So when we write errors.title, if the title error is undefined, this will resolve to false. If the error title contains a value, this will resolve to true. This is why we use this for this invalid property here. So invalid will be true if there is an error for the title, and if not, it will resolve to false, and it will hide this piece down here. React hook form can also do more sophisticated validation than just this. It can also recognize certain patterns like email addresses. We will not use that here. You can read the documentation if you want to get more into it. But I just also want to note that front end validation does not replace back end validation because whatever we enforce on the front end can always be circumvented. For example, by sending a request with Postman to the back end instead of using our neat forms here. This is why it's important to have the validation on the back end as well like we have in our nodes controller in all these different places where we check if the required fields are actually present. So this is just for better user experience, but whenever something is important and has to be taken care of, then you have to do it in the backend. Also, this is pretty verbose here. We will later extract this stuff into reusable form components so we don't have to repeat this over and over again, but for now this is fine. Okay, and there's one more property up here that we haven't used yet, and that's this is submitting boolean. I want to use this in the button down here. I want to disable the button as long as the form is submitting so that we can't click it twice, right? We don't want to submit the form twice accidentally. So we can add a disabled attribute to this button and set it to this is submitting boolean. So as long as the form is submitting, this button will be disabled. Okay, let's save everything. But now let's try it out. And we still have an error here because we haven't passed the on node saved callback here yet. Let's do that now. But let's keep it empty for now. I just want to try it out quickly and then we uh, take care of this. So we pass an empty function here. Save this. And now we should be able to send a new node to our backend. So node from React frontend. This is amazing. Let's try it out. When we send this, the dialog will stay opened because we haven't taken care of closing it yet, but the save button should be grayed out and disabled for a short moment. It will be very fast because we are on localhost and we don't have to send the data through the internet, but it might be visible for a short moment. And yeah, it was visible for a very short moment. So let's take a look into our database and let's see if the new node is there. And there it is, node from React frontend. Really nice. So this is our first node we created through our own website. 
instead of postman. Now let's finish up the dialog. Let's hide the dialog after we have sent a node and let's also add a node to the UI here because right now we have to uh, refresh the page before we see it. And I actually just realized that I wouldn't have had to look into the MongoDB database because we can see it right here. But now we want to make it so that the node appears immediately and we don't have to refresh the page first. So the first thing we do here inside the callback is we set show add notes dialog back to false so the dialog disappears and we also want to add this node to the ui this is why we have this function block instead of just one line we want to add more stuff here we already know how we update our state right we have to use the set notes call here and update it with the newer nodes array but we don't get the whole array sent back from our backend we just get our new node so what we do is we call set nodes we pass an array here with scrap brackets and then we write dot 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 nodes. What this does is it creates a new array and it adds the nodes that are already in our node state into this array. So all the single nodes that we already have on the screen are added to this new array and then we want to add our new node to it. The new node is the argument that we get passed from this on node saved callback. Remember, we declared it up here and here when we call on node saved, we pass our node response. So we can add the name for the variable here. We can give it any name we want. And this is the node model that we pass when we call this function. So after the comma down here, we pass our new node. So to recap, this creates a new array. It adds all the existing nodes to it, and it also adds the new node to it, which will then be displayed in the UI. So let's make this bigger, and let's try adding another node. This is a new React node, blah, blah. When we save this, the dialog should close and we should see our new node on the screen. But first of all, let's try the input validation. So when we try to save this, we see our required text. When we type in something, the required text disappears. This is really cool. Let's actually try sending a node without the text. This should work. And we save it and it is added to the UI. Nice. Or oh, just one more thing I want to show you, what I mentioned earlier. When I type something in here and I close the dialog and open it again, the next time the input is gone. This is by design. This is how I wanted it. This is why I handle the dialog like this, as I explained earlier. If you want to keep the input, you can use the show property, like I explained earlier. And now I want to add some margin to the bottom of this button and center it on the screen. So we add a class name to the button. And again, we have this class that we can use from Bootstrap, which is called MB4, which adds a little bit of margin here at the bottom. But we still want to center this on the screen. So now we could add a class to this button and put the CSS code in the notes page module CSS file. But for certain kind of CSS attributes that I use over and over again, I like to create utility classes that I put into a separate CSS file. So let's do that now. Let's open the sidebar and add another file to the styles folder, which we call utils.module.css. This contains yeah, reusable utility classes. And I'm gonna call this one block center. I've actually not seen this name anywhere else used, but it makes sense to me because here I wanna use two attributes, display block and margin left auto and margin right auto. These attributes together will display whatever we use this class on Yeah, in a way that it is centered on the screen because margin auto does this. It sets the margin so that there's an equal amount of either side. So let's save this, copy the class name and use it in our app.tsx file. So let's duplicate this line and we can do this with shift alt and pressing the down key or just type it out again. We call this style utils and we import this utils module.css. And then we can use it on our button. Now we do the same trick as before since we already used this bootstrap class. We replace this for a pair of curly braces, a string with backticks, use mb4 in here, and add our other class as a variable. So style utils block center which now centers this button on the screen. 
and you can reuse this block center class in other places if you want. So the layout is still not finished completely. We still need some room here at the top, but we will do this later when we add our navbar. And also we don't have any loading or error or empty states yet. So right now when we load nodes from the backend, it's very fast because we are on localhost. But when we do it over the actual internet, it might take half a second or so. That's why we have to add some kind of progress spinner while the nodes are loading. We also want to add an error state if the nodes can't be loaded. We don't just want to show the alert dialog, we want to show something in the UI. And it also makes sense to have a special kind of text or message that shows when there are no nodes in our database so that the screen isn't just empty. It should say you haven't added any nodes yet or something like that. We will implement this in the rest of the video, but the next step is to add a way to update existing nodes and delete them. So that's what we will do next. Okay, let's add a way to delete nodes next. For this, we need another function in our nodes API file. So let's put it here at the bottom, export async function. We call it delete node, and it will take an argument, which is the ID of the node we want to delete. And in here, we call await fetch data. The delete endpoint is slash api slash nodes slash and then we want to append the node idea at the end of it right because when we look into our nodes routes this is how we set up this delete endpoint so we can simply add a plus here and append the node idea which is a string anyway we don't have to url encode it in a special way we can just append it doesn't contain any special characters and then we add the configuration as usual, where we set the method, which this time is delete. This function won't return anything. We also don't get anything back from the endpoint, but we have to await this fetch call. Otherwise, errors won't be propagated to the outside. So the await is important. To delete a node, I want to add a little yeah, trash bin icon here to each node. And for that, we can install this React icons package. Yeah, which contains all these different icons here from different other packages that you can use. So let's add this in our front end terminal. We install React icons. This dash dash save, by the way, is not necessary. You had to add this in the past, but not anymore. So you can ignore this. Okay, we start this again. Then we want to go into our node component, the nodes that we draw on the screen. So this one here, the node TSX file. And I want to add this icon here to the title of the node. So it's right next to the title. So what we can do is we can go below the title value here, but within the car title tag and just add our icon. But we will have to import it manually. The IDE doesn't recognize it. So up here we write import, we destructure this and write md delete with the same spelling, the same casing. From the react icons package we just installed slash md. md is short for material design, by the way. So this is the material design delete icon by Google. And then we can use it down here. Open the angle bracket md delete. Let's close it, see how it looks. Might have to refresh this. Okay, we are not quite there yet. First of all, we add a class to the delete icon for which we use bootstrap classes again. The first one is text muted. We used this before. This just turns the color into this grayish color, which I think looks just a bit better. And then after a space, we also add ms auto, which adds a margin start with the value auto to the icons, which should move these icons to the right but only if the container of the title actually supports this. So we have to add a class to the car title here as well. Class name. And we will use our utility styles again, which we have to import first. So style utils, utilsmodule.css, and we want to add a new one there. So let's go into the utilsmodule.css and add another class, which we call flex center, which contains the following attributes. Display flex, 
which is Flexbox. Again, you can learn more about this through Googling. Align Item Center, Justify Content Center, and a gap of four pixels. Type out all of this. Let's copy the class name and add it to our node title here. So style utils.flexcenter, which applies this. And this yeah, senders the text and this icon properly. And because we added the flexbox, now this MS Auto here works, which adds the spacing to the front of the icon and moves it all the way to the right. Looks much better, doesn't it? But we actually want to do something when we click this icon. We want to delete our node, right? So we can add an onclick attribute to the MD delete component. And here we pass a function like this. And we want to do two things. We want to trigger a callback so that whoever uses this node component knows that a node was deleted with a certain idea, right? So what we do is we go up here to the interface, the node props, and we add another callback here. Let's call it on delete node clicked. And here we will forward the whole node that we clicked so that the caller can later decide what to do with this information. In our case, we will get the ID out of this node and send the delete request to our backend with this ID. And this function won't return anything. Let's not forget to add it down here to the parameters. And then we can call it in our on click callback here. On delete node clicked, where we pass the node. What's the node? That's the node that we pass to the component itself. So we pass this back to the color of this node. But then I also want to add a second line here. Later, when we click a node, we also want to open it so that we can update it. By default, our click on the delete icon will go through. So it will trigger both the on delete node clicked, but also our other callback later to open the node. For this reason, we want to add another line that swallows this click, so to speak. So on click actually can take an argument, which is often just called ear. It's this mouse event from the click. We can define it in here or we can ignore it like we have done before. This time we want to use it and we want to call something on this e variable stop propagation, which this allows this click to go through. So we use it up right here and our other on click handler below this icon won't be called later. Again, I found this out through Googling. I don't pull this information out of my behind. I have to figure this out myself. So you just Google something like don't let click through react or something along those lines and you will find these answers. Okay, let's save this and go back to the apptsx file because now we have to pass this new callback to our node component here. So let's put these arguments here into separate lines and let's add this new callback below. On delete node clicked and we could either handle it right here but since we do an API call and everything let's put it into a separate function which we will call delete node. We haven't created this function yet, but we will now do so above the return statement. So we create an async function with the same name. And it takes the node that we want to delete as input. We put a try catch block in here. As usual, if something goes wrong, we print the error to the console and we open an alert dialog. And in the try block, we want to call await nodes API, our delete node function that we created earlier, which expects the ID of the node we want to delete. So we pass node dot underscore ID. If this doesn't throw an error, we stay in this try block. So now we want to remove the node that we just deleted from the UI. And this works similarly to how we added a new node here with the set nodes call, just that we now want to filter our nodes and remove the one that we just deleted. So again, we call Z nodes. This time we pass nodes.filter. As the name implies, this allows us to take the nodes array and filter certain nodes out of it. Filter takes a function that takes an argument. We have to give this argument a name. Let's call it existing node and then we make such a right arrow. 
This filter function will go through each node of this array and pass it to this callback one by one, and then we can decide what we want to do with it. And we have to return a boolean from this function. True if we want to keep this node element in this array, and false if we want to remove it. So what we do is we write existing node, take the ID, and we compare it to the node ID we just deleted. If we know that it's the same ID, then we want to remove it. So we write not equal to, like this with an exclamation mark and two equal signs, node, which is the node that we just deleted, dot ID. So to recap, this deletes the node through our delete endpoint. And then if it was successful, it filters our existing node and removes the one with this ID we just deleted so that we update our UI and reflect the newest changes. So when we save this, our preview here compiles again and it should work now, right? Let's try it out. Let's delete a node. Let's take not the last one, but this one here. Click delete and it's gone and the UI is updated. And it should also now be deleted from our database. So let's look into the Atlas backend, refresh this, and there should be five nodes left, right? Node four, and then this is a new React node. And looks correct to me. So deleting works. The next step is to update nodes. But before we do that, I also want to add a little icon to the add new node button here, a little plus icon. Now that we already have the React icons package installed, that will be really quick. Let's go into our button tag here and add this icon to the content of the button. But we will have to import this first. So let's go up here, import. This one is called FA plus from the font awesome package from React icons slash FA. And then we can use it here. FA plus with a self-closing tag. And there it is. Now it's not aligned properly yet, so we have to add another class to our button here. And we can use our flex sender utility class that we already created. So let's add another class like this, style utils flex center, which aligns everything properly because it turns it into a flex box. It applies the align item center attributes and everything. And the little space here in between the icon and the text is caused by this gap of four pixels here. This is why I added this earlier. Okay, looks pretty cool if you ask me. Okay, now let's add a way to uh, update existing nodes, for which we need another entry in our nodes API file here. Let's put it between create node and delete node. Export async function, update node, which will take two arguments. It will take the node ID of the node that we want to update and the node input. Let's call it node or input, doesn't really matter, but it's of type node input, so it contains a title and a text that we want to update our node with. This function will return a promise of type node. If everything goes successful, it will return the updated node, which we then display in our UI. Okay, so we create a const response equals await fetch data the usual way. The update endpoint is slash API slash nodes slash and the node ID similar to how we did it for the delete endpoint comma and configuration which we put into a new line the method will be patch this time we need the same http header up here because we send json data and the body is the same as well we send the stringified version of our node input and the line here below is the same as for create node as well. We want to return the JSON body of the successful response, which should contain the updated node. To update an existing node, I actually want to reuse the add node dialog that we already created earlier. 
we want to change the name from add node dialog to add edit node dialog because adding new nodes and updating existing ones looks very similar so it makes sense to reuse the existing model we already have. And by the way, this is why I kept the name of this on node saved callback generic. I didn't call this on node edit because I already knew that I want to reuse this for editing nodes as well. So I called it save. So what we do is first of all we rename the props here. I do this with the F2 shortcut or right click rename from add node dialog to add edit node dialog props. Let's also rename the component itself. But this doesn't automatically change the file name, so we have to do this separately to add edit node dialog.tsx. Update imports, always automatically update imports, makes sense. And we might have to uh, use this save all files command here to save the files where this import has changed. Okay, then we want to pass an optional argument to this add edit node dialog. We want to pass the node to edit to it, which is an optional argument of type node, which is our node model. The way this works is that we can pass this node to edit to it or not. If we pass one, then we know that we are not adding a new node, we are updating an existing one. If we don't pass this node to edit, then we know that we are creating a new node. So let's not forget to edit down here. Then we want to make some changes throughout this dialog here. First of all, we want to pass a configuration to use form, which we do by adding a pair of curly braces between the parentheses of this use form call. Let's put this into a new line, because one thing we can do in here, we can define default values like this. So what we do is we set the default value of title to a node to edit save call title. So this will use the title of the node we are updating if we pass this argument. If not, this will resolve to undefined. And we can handle this case with these two vertical pipes, which is a logical or. This exists in most programming languages. If the node to edit we pass is undefined, then we want to use an empty string as the default value. Because then we just have our usual add node situation where we don't want to have any default values already in the input fields. Comma, and we do the same for the text node to edit, text, or an empty string. Then in on submit, we have to distinguish between the situation where we want to create a new node or update an existing one. So what we do is we create a let variable for this node response here. So we write let node response, which will be of type node, but we don't initialize this yet. Because now below we want to check if node to edit, which means that it's not undefined, we forwarded it. Then we want to set node response to await nodes API and make our update node call where we pass the node to edits idea and the node input, right? The title and the text. If we don't have this node to edit idea, we are in our usual create node situation. Then we want to call create node and store the return value in this variable. And then we just do our on node saved callback in either case, when we created a new node and when we updated an existing one. Just a few more changes we have to do here in our add edit node dialog. We want to change the title and make it dependent if it's an update or an add situation. So what we do is we add a pair of curly braces. We check if node to edit ID has a value which we can do with this ternary operator. So node to edit, question mark. If this value exists, then the title will be edit node. Colon, if this value does not exist, we use the title add node. And let's also just for completion, update the idea of this form. We could keep it at add node, but I'm perfectionist. So let's change this to add edit node form. And not forget, update here, in the button component as well. Save this. But we don't have a way to open this edit dialog yet, right? So next we need to catch this click on our nodes here, on the node component, and then open this dialog in response to it. So let's go into the nodes component once again, which I have to find first, this one here. And we want to add another callback here. On node clicked. 
let's keep the name generic let's not call it uh, update node or something like that because this way the caller can decide what they do in response to a node being clicked maybe they don't always want to open the update dialog maybe they just want to show the text so we keep this decision to the caller okay this is a function that looks exactly like the delete function here it takes the node that we clicked and forwards it to the caller we could also put this edit dialog directly into this component. This would work theoretically, but we want to pass this callback to the outside instead, because this way we keep our code more flexible and how we use these nodes. This is called hoisting, by the way. Hoisting means you're yeah, taking state or callbacks and moving them one level higher to the component that uses this component. Where you put state and where you handle clicks always depends on what exactly you want to do and how flexible you want your code to be. Okay, and we want to trigger this callback when we click our node, right? So what we do is we go into this card tag here and add an onclick attribute to it, which takes an arrow function that just calls on node clicked. I haven't added it here to our parameters yet. So let's do this at this position. We want to call this down here and we want to forward the node that we clicked. The same as we did here in the delete callback. Now let's wire everything together in our app.tsx file. This now expects the on node click callback, but first of all we need a state where we store this node ID that we clicked. So let's add another state here at the top. Let's put it below show add node dialog because this decides if we show the edit version of our dialog. So we create another state, const, let's call it node to edit, and the setter function set node to edit, and we always have to change this to camel case, which is a use state, and we have to set the type of this explicitly because we initialize this with null. So the type of this is node model or null. Because we use null when we don't have a node that we want to update right now. This is what we also start with. Then we go back down to our node component, which is already complaining here, and add this missing on node clicked callback. And here we should be able to just pass the name of the setter function of our new state. So set node to edit. Because this is a function that gets passed a node model and set node to edit is a function that takes a node model. So if I'm not mistaken right now, the syntax should work. Otherwise, we could write it like this. Node, write error, and pass it here. But since these functions have the same signature, this should work as well. But first, we have to set up the second dialog. So here we did show add node dialog to Amberson Science. Below, we want to do the same, but this time with node to edit. If this value is not null, we also want to show our add edit node dialog just with a slightly different configuration. First of all, we want to pass the node to edit this time, which is this one here. And since we have this check up here with the ampersand sign, we know that oops, it's not null down here because otherwise we would not get inside this block. And TypeScript is smart enough to smartcast this. It's smart enough to know that this can't be null down here, so we can pass this value. Then we want to define the on dismiss callback like we did up here. Just that we don't want to set show add node dialog to false. Instead, we want to set node to edit back to null, which will also hide this dialog because of this check up here. And the last thing we need is our on node saved callback, which the same as up here forwards us the node that we saved. Just that this time it's not a new node, it's the updated node. It's the same variable basically, but we can give it a different name. We can call it updated node and then define what we want to do with it. First of all, we want to set node to edit back to null here as well to close the dialog after we saved the changes. And then we want to update the UI. And what we want to do is we want to take the node that we updated, but put the new data in there without having to refresh the page first. We want to do this with the value we get returned from the API. So again, we call z nodes 
which is our state set of function. And then we call nodes.map. Earlier we used nodes.filter to remove a node from the nodes array. With nodes.map we can take each single node and transform it in some way. Now we want to leave most of the nodes untouched. We only want to transform the one that has the ID of the node we updated to put our new data in there. So nodes.map, which again takes an argument, which we call existing node, as we did earlier when we deleted a node. Then we want to check if the ID of the existing node is the same as the ID of the updated node, then we know that this is the one we just updated and we want to display not the old one, but the new one in the UI. I have to make this a bit bigger again. So what we can do is, if existing node ID is the same as updated node ID, question mark, in this case, we want to return the updated node colon. Otherwise, we want to return the existing node. So this might look a bit complicated at first, but it completely makes sense. We call our set node state, map our existing nodes by checking for the ID for each of them. And if the ID is the one we just updated, then we want to display the updated node and put it into this array. Otherwise, we want to put the same old node as we had before into this array. Okay, let's try it out. Let's make this a bit smaller again. And let's try updating a node. So when we click this node, it should set the node to edit state to the node we just clicked, which opens this dialog with the edit node state and the default values already inserted. Let's change the title and the text, updated node 3. We updated this node through our React app. When we click save, the save button should be disabled again for a very short moment while the update is running. The changes should be saved in our database through our server. And because of our map call, we should see the updated state in the UI. So save. And after a very short moment, everything works properly. Here's our updated node. And when we refresh the screen, we still see the same because this data is stored in our database properly. Somewhere here is our updated node 3 with the latest updated timestamp. Really cool. Also, I don't know why the aptsx file has two spaces instead of four by default but it looks a bit cramped in my opinion. So we can change this down here. Indent using tabs, you don't have to do this, but I want to use the default tab size of four. And when I format this again, looks better in my opinion. Okay, this works really nicely. The next thing we want to do is we want to put this loading and error state into our UI to take care of situations where something goes wrong. And we also want to organize our code a bit better so that we don't put everything into our aptsx file. Okay, so right now, since we are on localhost, loading nodes is really fast. So there's almost no delay and we see our nodes on the screen instantly. When we actually deploy this to a server, this will take a moment. So it makes sense to add a progress bar while the nodes are loading. And it also makes sense to uh, add some text in case loading went wrong. So we show something like, uh, couldn't load your data. Right now we are just showing the alert dialog and of course that's also an option, but it's a bit annoying to the user. So how you display these errors in the UI is up to you. If you show a dialog or an error message embedded on the screen, you can decide this yourself. I just want to show you different options. So what we do is we go into our aptsx file and add another state for when the nodes are loading. Let's put it down here below the nodes state. We create another state that we call nodes loading and set nodes loading for the setter. And we initialize this state with true this time because as soon as we open the page, the nodes try to load, right? So we can set this to true right array. Then we add another state below, which we call show nodes loading error and then the setter for which I'm going to copy this and change this here to camel case, which we initialize with a state of false. We don't want to show this right array only when something went wrong. Now, as you can see, I give this error a very specific name. I prefer long variable names to be more descriptive. I don't just want to call this show error because this could be any error. We want to use this error specifically for when loading the nodes failed. So I give it this long name. And we handle all the states down here when we try to load nodes. 
So what we do is as soon as we load nodes, we set the error or showing the error to false because we might want to add a retry button or something like that. And when we retry loading the nodes, we want to hide the error if there was one, right? And we want to set loads loading, no, nodes loading to true. Because as soon as we call this function here, we start loading our nodes and only after this run, we are finished. We want to replace the alert dialog here in case something goes wrong and set show nodes loading error to true, which will contain a generic error message. By the way, you could also display the error you get from the backend by extracting it from this error variable. I just want to show a generic error message instead. It always depends on how much information you want to give to the user. And then we also have to set nodes loading back to false. Now we want to do this in both cases when uh, everything went well and when there was an error. So we put this into the finally block. Try catch finally, set nodes loading back to false. Okay, so now we have the state and now we use the state to display different UI elements on our page. For this, we will have to put some conditionals down here into our UI. That decides if we show our usual nodes grid here or if we show something else. Now to keep this a bit organized, let's put this into a variable. That's something we can actually do. We can cut this out, go above our return statement here, create a variable, let's call it nodes grid, and we can set it to the piece we just cut out. And then we can use this down here in the place where we had the code before. But now I wanna check in between curly braces. If nodes loading is true, then, so we use these two Emerson signs as we have done before, we want to show a loading spinner, which is another component from the bootstrap library. We add some configuration here. We set the animation to border and the variant to primary, which just sets the color. And we close this with a slash and a closing angle bracket. This will be shown while the nodes are loading. You could see this for a very short moment, but we are not quite there yet. The second line, we add another conditional. If show nodes loading error is true, then we want to show some little text in the UI for which we can use this paragraph HTML tag, which basically adds some text with a little bit of margin below. Something ran wrong. No, there's no apostrophe here. Something went wrong. Please refresh the page. Okay, this will show in case there is an error. We will see this in a moment. And finally below, we want to show the nodes themselves if there was no error, if the nodes are not loading and if they are not empty. So another pair of curly braces. Here we write exclamation mark nodes loading. If the nodes are not loading anymore, and exclamation mark if show nodes loading error is false as well. And again to Emerson signs, then we show the component itself. And I actually want to add another conditional down here because I want to show a little text if the nodes array is empty. So what we do is we add this pair of empty angle brackets, which is a so-called fragment in React. A fragment basically allows us to put more than one components or HTML tags in places where we could only put one. And we need it right here because we want to add another pair of curly braces for a conditional. And if we remove this fragment, this will complain because the syntax is not valid. You can't put curly braces into another pair of curly braces. You have to use this fragment in between. And here we want to check if nodes.length is greater than zero. So if the nodes are not empty, then I put the next part into a separate line. Question mark, which is this ternary operator. Then we want to render the nodes grid. And below, colon, if nodes.length is not greater than zero, which means that our nodes array is empty, then we want to show another paragraph. You don't have any nodes yet, and I'm really bad at spelling. So to recap, while nodes loading is true, we show a spinner. 
If there's an error, we show the error message. If both the loading state and the error are false, then we either show the nodes grid if there are nodes in the array or our empty state here. Now let's make some changes in our nodes controller in the backend just to see these different states. You don't have to do this, you can just watch the video here. Go into the backend and the place where we fetch our nodes. First of all, let's see the loading state again. We still have to center this progress bar on the screen. We will do this in a moment, but let's try throwing an error here. Create HTTP error, doesn't really matter which one we throw. Refresh this, something went wrong, refresh the page. And let's also try returning an empty array as if we didn't have any nodes in our data set. Refresh this again. You don't have any nodes yet. Okay, let's not forget to revert this. And now I want to center everything on the screen horizontally in our aptsx file. Now we could use our block center class that we used here on our button, but then we have to add this to each element separately. So let's actually handle this in one place instead by adding a class to the whole container of our notes page. So let's add a class name here styles.notespage. We haven't created this class yet, we will do this in a moment. And also one on our grid here. We will need this in a moment. So let's remember this g-4. Change this again to g-4, but also add a second one. styles.notegrid. Oh, and the closing backtick here of the string has to go here. Okay, let's go into the notes module CSS file once again and set up these new classes here. Let's put it here at the top. The first one is the notes page. We want to set display to flex and flex direction to column. Because with flex, we can use align items again and center everything, yeah, which puts everything below each other, which should now also be the case for our spinner. Yeah, and our error messages and everything. It's all centered now. The reason why I also added the second class for the nodes grid is because if there are now only one or two nodes in our array, it doesn't fill the whole width. We can't see this right now because we have so many nodes, but this looks weird when we have fewer nodes. And we can fix this by setting the width of the nodes grid to 100%. So this will always take up the full width it has available. You can check this out by just deleting all nodes but one or two and try it without this width 100% and with it we will see a difference. Okay, now we already have a nice front end and loading states and error states and everything. We are not quite done yet, but the next step is to add user authentication to the app. This will be very exciting because in the future users have to sign up here in our app and then every user will just see the nodes that belong to them and also only delete and update their own nodes rather than yeah, everyone being able to change every node in our database. Okay, when a user signs up on our website, of course we want to save them in our database. This means we need another mongoose schema. So let's create one, but first of all I'm gonna close all these tabs here. Because I'm losing all overview. Then we go into our backend folder into the models folder and we want to create another one in here, which we call user.ts. This will look similar to what we already did here in our node schema. So we write const user schema equals new schema, parentheses, curly braces, let's put a semicolon here and configure this. Every user needs a username at least in our app. Of course, you could also just use an email address if you want. Of type string, remember we write this type here in uppercase. And we set require to true because the username is not optional. And we can actually duplicate this line. On Windows, we can do this by holding shift and alt and then uh, pressing the down arrow key like this because the other two fields are similar. The second property is an email, also type string required draw, and a password. But we want to add another setting to the email and password configuration here after required draw. 
we want to set select colon false for both of them. So I copy this and add this to the password as well. This means that when we retrieve a user from the database, by default, the email and the password will not be returned to us. We have to request them explicitly. This makes sense because if you retrieve a user, for example, on a public profile, then you don't want to return the email address and password, even though the password will be hashed, but you don't want this stuff to be visible to the outside, right? And even if you don't show the user data in the front end, it might be in the JSON response you get from the server. So with select false, we make sure that this is not returned by default. If we just request a user from the database, it will only contain the username unless we request the email and password specifically. You will see how this works later. So let's finish setting up our schema. We create our type user for TypeScript equals infer schema type. We have already done this before. As the type parameter, we pass type of in our lowercase user schema. And then we add our export default model, add the user as the type parameter here, parentheses, pass user as a string, the name of the collection later, comma, and the user schema. This is nothing new for us. We've already done this in our node schema. And then we save this. And next we need endpoints where we interact with our user data, where we can create users by signing up, where we can log in, fetch user data and so on. So let's create another controller for this stuff. So in our controllers folder here, we right click and create a users.ts file. Let's start with the sign up endpoint. So we create an export const, which we call sign up, which is of course of type request handler. But when we sign up the user, we have to send some data. We have to send the username, email, and password that we just required in our user schema. So let's create an interface for the sign up body. Interface sign up body. We need a username. Again, all of these values here are optional because we don't know if the user of our endpoint actually sends this data. So we have to be safe email of type string and a password of type string. And then we add this type argument down here. Unknown comma unknown comma sign up body comma unknown. Isn't TypeScript a beautiful language? And this is of course an async function that takes a request object, a response object and the next function and then we add the body as usual. At the start of this callback, we want to get our data out of the sign up body. So we create a const username equals request dot body dot username. The same for the email. And for the password, but I'm going to call this password raw instead of just password. Because for security reasons, you should never store passwords in plain text in your database. You need to hash them. We will see how this works in a moment. And to make sure that we don't accidentally save this raw password in our database, I give it this name here. So this makes it very explicit and makes it less likely that we accidentally use it like the hashed password. Okay, and the rest of this callback here happens in the try catch block. Let's call our error handler down here through the next function and then take care of the try block. As usual, we want to do some input validation here so that we get proper error messages and not just rely on the cryptic error messages of the database. So first we want to check if any of these variables here are missing. So we type exclamation mark username, two vertical bars for a logical or. So if there is no username or if there is no email, or if there is no password raw in the request, then we want to throw a create HTTP error with a status code of 400, which means bad request, which is appropriate here. And the error message will say parameters missing. And we also want to keep the usernames and emails unique so that no two users with the same name or email address can sign up. And there's actually another schema attribute for that, which I forgot to add earlier. So let's do that now. For username and email, 
we go after the required true and by the way you can hold alt down and click somewhere to create a second cursor like this and now we can add another attribute to both lines at the same time let's set unique to true which as the name implies makes sure that we can only ever insert a single user with the same username or email address into the database let's save this and go back to our controller as usual we don't want to rely on the error message of the database we want to insert our own check here as well so we have more control over the status code and the error message that we show to the user so let's try to retrieve the user with this username out of the database and then if there is someone we know that the username already exists so we create a const existing username and call await we have to import the user model here import user model from dot dot slash models slash user then we continue down here user model dot find one which as the name implies returns us one single document if the filter fits in between parentheses we add a pair of curly braces write username colon this is the field in the user schema we are searching for and then we want to search for the username we passed here so again we write username as the value and don't forget the exec here if there is a username found we know that this username already exists so below we do a check if existing username then we want to throw another create http error with status code 409 don't remember what this meant right now i think something like a clash i looked this up before preparing the tutorial so 409 should be appropriate and an error message username already taken please choose a different one or log in instead of course you can write any error message here that you want then we want to do the same for the email address and again we could skip this because our user schema already enforces the uniqueness of the email address and username but this way we have better error messages and better status codes so below let's do the same again for the email we create a const existing email await user model dot find one email colon email exec then we check if existing email we want to throw another error again 409 a user with this email address already exists please log in instead nice so if we get to the point here below then this user doesn't exist yet and we can go ahead and save it in the database now as i already said we don't want to save the raw password in the database because even though your database is locked by a password usually there can always be something bad happening and your database leaks and then you don't want to leak the raw passwords of all your users so instead there is a process called hashing which basically turns this password into an unreadable string of characters you can google the exact mechanism behind it but it makes it so that even if the database leaks no one really can do anything with the passwords of course there's a package we can use for that which is called bcrypt it's a very popular one so let's cd into our backend folder and run npm install bcrypt which is spelled like this and we also need a type package for it so we type npm i dash d for dev dependencies at types slash bcrypt like this and install it as well okay and then we can go ahead close this and save our user here so we create a const for the hashed password i'm gonna call it password hashed equals then we use bcrypt to hash our raw password and this is an asynchronous operation so we write array bcrypt.hash which is a function but we have to import bcrypt first so up here import bcrypt from the bcrypt package 
The first argument is the raw password. And the second argument is the Zulting rounds. Zulting is another security mechanism to make it harder to reverse engineer these hash passwords because there is actually a way to figure out a real password from a hashed one if it's a commonly used one through something called rainbow tables. And Zulting is another security mechanism that makes this yeah, impossible basically. So if you write it like this, then your passwords will be safe. And then we can save this data as a new user in the database. So let's create a const new user because after signing up successfully, we want to return the user to the front end immediately. Equals await user model dot create parentheses curly braces. We store the username that we are sent to the endpoint. We store the email as it is. And we store our password hashed, not a raw one. And then we send a status back with the code 201 and the JSON body will contain this new user we just created. Next, we have to set up the route to this controller, right? So we create another file in our routes folder, which we also call users.ts. So we need a router here. So first we import express from the express package. We also want to import our user controller. Import star as user controller from dot dot slash controllers slash users. And then we create a router const router equals express dot router. And then below we create our first endpoint for our user's controller, which will be a post request because we send data to our sign up endpoint. The URL is slash sign up and we want to forward this to user controller dot sign up. Don't forget to add a default export below. Export this router, save this. And then we have to register this new route in our app.ts file. So let's go over there. The same as we did for our nodes routes, we need our user routes. So import user routes from routes slash users. And then we add it down here, either above or below. It doesn't really matter. Put it above app.use slash API slash users comma and our user routes. Okay, and now we should be able to reach our sign up endpoint. Since we don't have a sign up form yet, let's try it out in Postman first. So we want to do a request to our server slash API slash users slash sign up. And we have to pass a body here because if we try to send it like this, it says parameters missing, which is our own error message we set up. So we need a username. I'm going to give it my name. Needs an email address. Let's set this to uh, florian at test.com. And we need a password. I use my favorite password, which is 12345. Let's send this and see what happens. Okay, so it looks like we got the user back. This is our hashed password here, by the way. Let's also take a look into the database. So we have our new users collection. Again, this takes the name of the schema, which is user and pluralizes it. And our data is in here. This is our hashed and salted password. Now let's try signing up with the same email or username again, which shows us our error message here. Let's also see if the unique key actually works by removing our own error for a moment. So let's remove these checks for existing email and existing username just for a moment. I'm going to comment this out, save this, try this again. This should still not work. An unknown error occurred and in our logs, we should see our MongoDB error here. Duplicate key error collection. This is what we want to see. 
So this is basically a fallback security mechanism that happens because we set these unique keys here in our user schema. So it's just good to have these two lines of defenses because of course we can always mess up our own server code here. So it's good if the database itself also enforces this constraint. And of course, if we use a different username but the same email address, we should still see an error here. A user with this email address already exists, please log in instead. Nice, and we will later show this error message in our front end, in our React app. But of course, inserting the user in the database is not enough. We also have to keep the user logged in somehow, right? And we want to do this right after a user signs up, because why should they insert their login credentials again if they just enter their own password? For user authentication, we will use sessions through this express session package here. There are basically two popular ways of keeping a user logged in, either sessions or JWT tokens. JWT tokens are used in a lot of tutorials, but they are actually quite hard to use because JWT tokens are self-contained, which means that once a user has it, they can always log in with it. There is no way to invalidate an existing JWT token. But invalidating a session after a user signed in is important, for example, when they want to change their password, then they should be locked out in all the other places, right? Because maybe their password has been compromised. This is a problem that these self-contained tokens bring. And the usual way to handle this is to keep these tokens very short-lived, usually one hour, and then they have to be refreshed before they can be used again. This way, when you change the password, then uh, the user can only log in for the rest of that hour until the token expires. But then you also have to implement a refresher mechanism, which can be quite complicated. Or another way to handle this is to keep the tokens long-lived, but implement some information in your database, some kind of blacklist, where you enter tokens that have been expired, but then you're basically just rebuilding sessions in a suboptimal way. What you must not do is giving a user a token that lives for like a week or a month and then you have no way to invalidate it. That's a security issue. But if you have your own server that can store data, then I actually prefer just using sessions because they are much easier to use. A session works so that a user has some kind of key stored in a cookie and there is a corresponding entry in your own database on your server for each session. And then when you need to invalidate the sessions for a particular user, then it's just a matter of deleting this database entry. And that's it. These session cookies are not self-contained as opposed to a JWT tokens. So yeah, this is in my opinion much easier to implement. You will see how easy this is in a moment. Let's install this package now. So we need this install command here. Go into our terminal. Cancel the execution for the backend for a moment and install Express Session here. We also need the types for Express Session again. So npmi dash d add types slash Express Session. Install this as well. And we need one more thing. Our session information has to be stored somewhere. And there are different adapters that you can use for that. They are listed somewhere down here. There are different ones. We are going to use the MongoDB one. So we store the session in our existing Atlas MongoDB. Should be this one here, connect Mongo. In a real app, I actually recommend that you use something like Redis because our MongoDB database is a remote database. It's not on our server directly and it's on Atlas' server, right? This means that it takes a moment to uh, store this information in the database. If you want something that's really fast, you can just install a Redis database on your own server and then this is just a bit faster. But setting up Redis for development is a bit complicated. So for the ease of this tutorial, we will just use the MongoDB one because we already have this database set up. And you can also use Connect Mongo in your production app. You don't have to use the Redis one. It's just a little bit faster. So this is also an npm package and we want to install this here as well. npm install Connect Mongo. Let's do that. And then let's start the server again because we have installed all dependencies we need for now. And then when a user has signed up successfully, before we return the response, we want to establish the session. And this is really easy with this package. We just take our request object on which we now have the session key. And here we can store some data. And what do we want to store? We want to store the ID of the user that just signed up because this way we can identify a user. So we store this user ID property here and we set it to the ID of the new user we just created. 
right? So underscore idea. In normal JavaScript, this would be enough, but as usual, TypeScript complains because it doesn't know about this user ID field here on the session object because we decide ourselves how this is called. So we have to do a little bit of extra configuration. What we need to do is we need to create another folder here in our backend folder. Not inside source, but right at the root folder because this is not our normal source code. Which we call add types and in here we can put stuff like our own type definitions that we sometimes need. And again, I figured this out through Google and documentation. You always find these solutions in Google somewhere. In here we put a new file, which we call session.d.ts. And these DTS files are these type definition files, which help TypeScript recognize variables and stuff like that. And whenever we install these add types slash packages, then we are installing DTS files basically, just that they are residing inside the node modules folder. Okay, and here we will need mongoose because we want to store the object idea, which is a mongoose type. So we import mongoose from mongoose. And then below we write declare module, the same name that this package has, where we want to add this type to. So this is express session, curly braces. And now we can basically add our user ID variable to the existing express session type by writing interface in here. We call it session data and you have to use this exact name because this is how the type on express session is called. Then we add another pair of curly braces and now we can add our user ID field by declaring its type. So mongoose.types.objectID. So that's it for this file. We have to make a little change to our tsconfig file as well so that this is actually used here because otherwise this will not work properly. So we go into the tsconfig file and we search for the key called type roots, which is down here. We uncomment this. Here we tell TypeScript where the type definitions are. By default, this should point to a node modules types, but now that we set this explicitly, we have to enter this ourselves. So in here we put a string node underscore modules slash add types comma and then we end the second one which is our own types folder now so we just type add types which points to this one here we just created and this now tells typescript that it can find type definitions in both places the node modules folder which are the ones that we installed and our own one and one more thing we have to add all the way at the bottom because this happens outside of this closing curly brace here so there should be two closing curly braces down here. We go before the last one at a comma and add this TS node key, which is necessary for TS node to recognize these types. Remember TS node is what we use to automatically restart our server in development whenever we save the changes. In here we add this files key and set this to true. And again, I found this through a stack overflow. Because the session key didn't work, then I looked this up and then you find all these necessary steps there. Okay, we save this. Let's not forget to save the changes to our users controller. And then we have to go into the app.ts file once again, because we still have to configure our express session package here. But this is just a little bit of code and then we can use our sessions throughout our whole server. Express session is another middleware that we have to register here. But the place is important. We want to register them before our routes, but after we read the JSON body. So right here, we write app.use. And here we want to call session. Okay, auto import doesn't work, so we have to import it manually. Import session from express session, which is a function that we can call and add a pair of curly braces to do a configuration in here. The first thing we have to set is a secret. This secret is used to assign the cookie that the user receives. So this is basically their key to identify their own user session. So each session has an entry in the database, but also a cookie with a secret key stored on the side of the user in their browser. This should be a random string. Now, as usual, we don't want to hard code sensitive data right into our code. We want to put it into the env file. 
So we open our backend end file and add another entry in here, which we call session secret. The name is up to you. And then we just set this to a, a random string. You can type in whatever you want. Just don't use any reserved characters. This should suffice, but this has to be a, an equal sign, not a colon. I always mix this up. Okay, and we also need to add this to our sanitized env file, right? Remember, we have this validate env file here, where we want to register this new key as well, so that we make sure that we actually have this available at runtime. This is a string. Let's go back into the app.ts file and import our validate env here. So import env from dot slash util slash validate env. And then down here for the secret, we pass env dot session secret. Then we set resave to false and we set save uninitialized to false as well. This is some configuration that is necessary that I don't want to explain here. You can hover over this or look into the documentation and it tells you what this means. It's just not important here. Then we need to configure the cookie that will be stored on the user's browser. So cookie colon curly braces and we set the max age how long this cookie lives. This is up to you. Again, you can make this long lived because we can invalidate sessions from our side, even if the cookie hasn't expired yet. I'm going to set this to one hour here. You can also make this longer. And I later also want to try out what happens when this cookie expires. But that's something we want to do later. But the cool thing we can do is we can set rolling to true. This means as long as the user is using our website, this cookie will be refreshed automatically. So if the user enters the website within this one hour, they will stay signed in. And of course, if you set this to a week, for example, then they will stay signed in if they use this website within a week, which I think is really cool because if a user doesn't use your website, I think it's a good idea to lock them out eventually. And lastly, we need to set a store. Store is where the session data will be stored. If you don't pass anything here, the session data will be stored in memory. So it will work until you restart your server, then your sessions will be gone. This can be enough for development, but definitely not for production. But also for development, it's good to actually store the session data somewhere. And for this, we want to use our Mongo store that we installed. So we have to import this here, import Mongo store, auto completion takes care of the rest. And then we want to use it down here. Mongo store.create parentheses, curly braces, and in here we can pass a Mongo URL, which is just the same URL that we also use for the rest of our database connection, which we stored in the environment variables in this Mongo connection string. Let's save this. And now we could create a new user and see how this cookie is stored. We can actually see this in Postman, but I don't want to create a yet another user, so let's implement the lock and route first and use that one that. So we go into the user's controller and below sign up, we export another function here. Export const login of type request handler. It needs a body, so we create an interface. This is second nature for us by now. Login body. We send a username and a password. It's hard to type and talk at the same time. We don't need to send an email this time because we are not creating a new user account. We are just signing into an existing one. Down here, unknown, comma, unknown, comma, login body, comma, unknown. And if I'm too fast for you, then you just have to step up your game. Come on, man, type faster. Async, regress, next. And we create our error function. Okay, I'm slowing down a bit. We want to extract the input from the body. So our const username equals rec.body.username. And the same for the password. And then we add our good old friend, the try catch block. And call our next function down here, which we have to do every single time.
in the try block we want to do some input validation. If the username is missing or if the password is missing, we throw a create HTTP error, status code 400, error message parameters missing. Now before we can check if the passwords match, we first have to figure out if there's actually a user with these credentials, with this username in our database. So we create a const user, do an await user model find one for the username we entered. And since the user is signing in, we want to send them back all their data, including their own email address. And remember, we set select to false by default, so they will not be included here when we call find one. But we can include them explicitly by adding dot select parentheses, and then we pass a string here. And in the string, we write a plus and then the name of the field we want to include. So plus password, then a space, plus email. And then outside we append our exec. This adds the password and email to this find one request, which is necessary because by default we exclude them. Okay, so if the user doesn't exist, we wanna throw another error. So if exclamation mark user, we wanna throw a create HTTP error. The response will be 401, which means unauthorized. And the error message will say invalid credentials. Now I keep this error here generic on purpose. I don't say uh, this user doesn't exist. You can do it if you want, but for security, it's a good idea to uh, don't tell whoever is trying to log in that this user doesn't exist because it makes brute force attempts more easy, right? This way, when a user types in a username that doesn't exist, they don't actually know if this user doesn't exist or if the password is just wrong. But this is up to you. You can implement it this way. You can also tell in the error message that this username doesn't exist. But if we found the user, we can go ahead and compare the passwords. So we create a const password match equals await and then we have another bcrypt function that we can use, compare, which can take the raw password, which we are sending over the login body and it can compare it to the hashed password of the user from the database. So even though this password here is hashed and this one is raw, Bcrypt knows how to compare them and tell us if they actually match. This is the cool thing about this library. It hides all this complexity from us. Okay, so below we check if exclamation mark password match. So this is a Boolean that we are getting back. If this is false, the passwords don't match. We want to throw another error. We actually reuse this one here, invalid credentials. If we get below this if block, then everything went well, the user exists, the passwords match, then we can establish a session, which again we do with request dot session. We set the user ID to the ID of the user, but with an underscore that we just compare the passwords with. And lastly, we want to return this user to the front end with a status code of 201 and we send the user as the JSON body so we can use it in our front end right away. Let's save this and register this new route in our user routes file. So below sign up, we create another user.post slash login and we forward this to user controller.login. And then let's try this out in Postman. So I open Postman, change the endpoint here to slash login. We don't need the email address anymore. Let's remove the password for now to see what happens. Um, yeah, we also have to remove this comma here. Parameters missing. Let's add the password back in, but let's make it wrong. Invalid credentials. Let's make the username wrong invalid credentials and now let's use the correct credentials okay and we are getting a user back not only that we are also getting a cookie back this connect.sid is the session cookie from the express session package we just set up and postman actually stores these cookies just like a real browser would so you can see it's stored here there's the key stored in there 
And when we look into our MongoDB database, we will actually find another collection now for the sessions. This is what the Mongo store did for us. So this is the session for our user that's stored in our database with this expires key. And now we can force the user to log out by simply removing the session here. But before we see how this works, we have to add another endpoint where we can retrieve the user data of the currently logged in user so that we see that when we delete the session, this will actually not work anymore. So let's go back into our code and into our user's controller once again. And all the way at the top here, before the sign up body, I want to add another endpoint, which I'm going to call get authenticated user. So here we get our user data from if we are logged in. It's a request handler. It doesn't take any body or anything. So we don't have to uh, declare any types. And as usual, it's an async regress next. And here we want to get the currently logged in user out of the session, which is very simple. We can write const authenticated user and set it to rec.session.userID. If there is a user currently logged in, then this will have the ID of this user. And if there is no user logged in, it will be undefined. And we know that yeah, there is no login session right now. So in the try catch block here, let's add the next call first. We can check if there is no authenticated user. Then we could either just not return anything from the database, but let's actually throw an error here. So throw create HTTP error 401 for not authenticated, user not authenticated. If there is an authenticated user, we can return it here. And we can call this endpoint, for example, later when we open our website. So we open the website and of course we don't want to log in every time. Instead, we want to see if there is a session that exists and a key that's stored in the session cookie. And then we can just return the user right away. So below, we want to retrieve the logged in user from the database. So const user equals await user model dot find. This time we can use find by ID because we have the idea stored in the session. So between parentheses, we pass authenticated user. Mm, I actually want to rename this to authenticated user idea. So rename this one up here as well. We don't need to return the password here because the user doesn't need their own password on the front end, but they probably need their own email address, for example, to show it in the user profile. So we add a select plus email and add exec. And then we want to return the user with a status code of 200 and we send the user in the JSON body. Save this, then set up a route for it. router.get slash, we do it right at the user endpoint, user.controller.get authenticated user. Save this as well, and then let's try it out in Postman. So, Postman, get request to API users. Now we should be getting a user because we have the session cookie stored. Let's look in the body. There it is. Our user with our email address. Let's delete our cookie that we have stored here. Then the session should not work anymore. User not authenticated. Let's log in again. Uh, of course, that's a post. Change this back to get. But before I execute this, I want to delete the session from the database. So we have two now because one for the sign up, one for the login, but they expire after a while. So they don't keep stacking up in the database. After they expire, they will be deleted automatically. But now we delete them manually. And now the session should also be invalid, even though the cookie is still stored. User not authenticated. So this is how sessions work. There are two pieces. There are the cookies, which are basically the keys to your session and the session entry in the database. And by deleting a session from the database, you can force the user to log out. But of course, the user should also have a way to log out themselves without us having to delete them from the database. 
so let's add another route for that. Let's add the route itself right away and then set it up afterwards. So router.post slash logout and we will forward this to user controller dot logout which we haven't created yet but we will do this next. Now you could also make logout a get endpoint because we are not sending any body to the server but I think it's more correct to make this a post because we are changing something on our side on the backend side. There are different opinions about that but I think post is appropriate. So let's go into the user's controller. Let's put it at the bottom. Export const log out request handler regrest next. And then we have this reg.session.destroy function we can call to destroy a session. Now this doesn't return a promise, so we can't use await and try catch in here. Instead we have to use a callback here, but that's fine. It's not a lot of code anyway. So destroy attempts to destroy the session. If there is anything that goes wrong, it will pass us an error in this callback. So we add error, a write error, and the function body here in curly braces. We check if the error exists. Then we want to forward it to our error handler as usual. And if the error does not exist, we just send a status code of 200 to indicate that the logout went successful. And again, since we don't send a JSON body, you have to use send status instead of just status. Okay, and that's our last authentication route we need. Let's try it out in Postman once again. Let's log in first, slash user slash login. There's our session. Let's try retrieving the logged in user. Works as well. Let's log out. We got our status of 200. And let's try to retrieve the user again. Oops. And it doesn't work because we are not authenticated anymore. And there should be no session in the database. Yeah, the session is gone as well. Okay, so we just implemented authentication into our app using Express Session. If you found this helpful, please leave a like on this video. And the next step is to use these new endpoints on our front end so that we can actually sign in and log in and retrieve our user data in our React app rather than in Postman. All right, we will need a model for our user on our front end as well, right? So let's close all these tabs here for now and go into our front end code. Here front end, source, models, and here we want to add a new file, which we call user.ts. That's just a simple interface that we want to export, which we call user so that we have a type that we can work with. It will contain the username and the email of the user. We don't need a password here because there's no reason why we need this in any way in our front end. We probably want to display the username somewhere and maybe the email address so the user can see it and change it, but we don't want to do anything with the password on the front end. Now let's add all the endpoints that we need to our notes API file the endpoints for retrieving user data, logging in, signing up, and so on. I'm going to put this all the way at the top here, but below fetch data right here. And you can also create different files for the API endpoints for the nodes and for users and other stuff. But since they aren't too many right now, I'm going to put them into the same file. So the first one is export async functional get logged in user. I think the name is self-explaining. It will return a promise with our user type here, which we have to import properly. In here we write const response equals await fetch data. The endpoint is slash API slash users. And this will be a, a get request. 
Now since both the front end and the back end are on the same URL, this will actually send the cookies to the back end automatically. So we don't have to do anything special in here. We will either get the user if we are logged in or we will get a 401 response if we aren't. So here we can simply return the JSON body of the response, which will contain the user data if we are logged in. This works since the front end and the back end are on the same URL. If they are on different domains or subdomains, then you have to include the credentials explicitly, which you do in the fetch configuration here. So there is a credentials include property for that, but you have to Google it because I don't remember the exact syntax for that right now. But you have to add this to the fetch call. But our front end and back end are on the same URL, so the cookies will be sent automatically. But we also need endpoints for signing up logging in and logging out. So for sign up, we will need some input. So let's create another interface for that, which we call sign up credentials, similar to how we created this node input interface earlier. We will also use this in our sign up form later. The sign up credentials consist of a username, the email and the password. And then we export another async function that we call sign up. And this will take these credentials, these sign up credentials as input. And it will also return a promise of type user because after signing up, we return the sign up user right array. Okay, const response equals await fetch data to slash API slash users slash sign up, comma and some configuration. The method will be post. We send a JSON body, so we need our JSON header here. So let's copy this, insert it here. And the body itself for which we stringify our not create node, but credentials, which we pass to this function. And then if everything went successful, we want to return response.json, which is the data of the newly signed up user. We need another function for logging in. Again, we need the credentials for which we create another interface, login credentials, because those only consist of the username and the password we don't need to send the email again. So we create this interface and another function, which we call login. It takes the login credentials and it also returns a promise of type user. Let's actually copy this from the sign up function because it's very similar just that we make the request to the login endpoint and the rest is the same. We still send the credentials, we still get the user back. And lastly, we need a function for logging out through our front end. So another export async function, logout, doesn't take any arguments, doesn't return anything. We know that it went successful if fetch data didn't throw. So we simply call await fetch data to slash API slash users slash logout. And the method is post. And that's it. Save everything. Okay, and now we want to create models for logging in and signing up, which of course contain form input, similar to what we already have in our add edit node dialog here. But I said that we want to create reusable components for text input fields. Otherwise we have to uh, repeat the syntax here with form group and form label over and over again and it's quite verbose. So what we do is we create another folder here in the components folder, which we call form. I just want to put form fields into a separate folder for better organization. And then here we create a text input field.tsx file. And we can split this and move this to the right so we can see 
both our files here at the same time. We want to set this up in a way that we get rid of a lot of duplication here when adding these form input fields. So the first step is to uh, create our component function here with the same name, text input field. And above it, we want to define an interface for the arguments that we pass to this component. So text input field props. So every text input field will need a name, which is this part here that we use to register the field with the React form hook library. So we add a name of type string. Also, all of our forms here have a label above it, right? So let's add this as another property. You can make this optional if you want and only show the label for some, but we show labels for all input fields. Then we need to pass this register call here to the text input field. So we add a property that we call register and the type is use form register of type any, like this. We have to set this to any because we don't know yet what fields this register will contain. This way we keep it reusable. We can use it in our sign up form and our add edit node model and so on. And where do I know this return type from that we have to use? Use form register. Again, I just Google this. You just have to figure out stuff like this through Googling. And this way we can pass this register function here to our text input field to register it with react hook form. We will pass this configuration here separately. So we add a register options. And this one is optional because yeah, we can pass register options like we do up here, or we can omit them. So we make this property optional. And the type here is register options. I just think it's more readable to separate the register function and the options rather than passing them as one thing. And we also want to have this error message here. And the type of these errors is field error or undefined. So what we do is we add another property that we call error, but this one is optional and it's of type field error. So we can pass a field error or we can pass undefined, in which case we want to ignore it, just like we did here. And then we add one more property here, which we write like this, square brackets, x colon of type string, like this and then colon any. What does this mean? This basically allows us to pass any other props that we want to our text input field component, even if they are not defined in here. And we do this because these form input fields have a lot of different properties available that we can add or omit. And instead of defining each of them here separately, we just add this syntax, which allows us to pass any array of remaining properties. Then we have to list all these properties again down here. So name, comma, label, comma, register, comma, register options, comma, error. And for these optional props here at the bottom, we write it like this, dot, 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 props, which is the syntax again where it takes something and it destructures it into its single pieces, basically. This just means that we get past each of these props that we add additionally one by one. Could be a bit confusing, but if you just follow along, you will see how this works. And we must not forget to set the type here, text input field props. Let's make this big for a short moment so we can see the whole thing. This is how it looks. And then we want to set up the same way as we did here on the left. So. The outer tag is a form group with this mb3 class name. And we add another property called control idea, this one. And we set it with curly braces to a name plus, and then we append a string input. And then we close this tag. Control ID is a property that does some accessibility stuff. For example, it connects the label that we put into this form group with the input field itself so that we can click the label and it activates the form input field. And it also helps screen readers, for example. This is what this control ID is for. We just have to set it here and we use the name of this input field, which is different for each of them. And we just append input to make it more recognizable. Then let's finish setting up this input field. 
So, we add the form label here, which will contain the label that we pass to this component. You can make this optional if you want by wrapping this with these two Amazon signs as we did earlier, but I don't want to make this optional. Below we add form control, which is the input field itself. Then first we want to pass these props here with these three dots, which we simply do like this. A pair of curly braces and then we write dot 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 props here as well. And this simply takes these optional props and adds them to the form control. And then we can just add them like we add any other props to our component. Just that we don't have to define them up here in our interface. Then we have to do the same with the register like we did earlier. Another pair of curly braces dot 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 register. The first argument will be the name that we pass. That's this property here. Comma and then we pass the register options which we pass separately. And then the same as over here. The is invalid property, which we set to a, to a exclamation marks to turn it into a boolean, and then the error we pass here, which is the field error or undefined. This stuff is a bit complicated and a bit annoying, but you only have to set up this input field once, and then you can reuse them in your app. That's the cool thing about it, and it will be much less verbose than what we have currently here. And then we need this invalid input feedback. Let's copy this, paste it here inside the form group, but change this to error.message because this is already the field error, but it can be undefined, so we add the save call operator. But it has to be error, not errors, because this is the name of the property. And now let's replace these input fields over here in our add edit notes dialog for these newly created text input fields. So I'm going to do this with the browser open so we can see if the new input field looks the same as the old one. So let's not delete the other ones right away, let's first add the new ones. So opening angle bracket, text input field, and we can add the self-closing tag right away. They all need a name, the same one as we used here to register this. So title, they all need a label which will be title. We set the type to text and this is the first example of our rest props here because we didn't define the text as input props because we don't want to pass one down here for the text area. This one is optional but instead of adding an optional property here we use these rest props. This is how this is called. So we can basically pass any property here and they will be put into our text input field. So this is really just a matter of how explicit you want to be. You can add them to the properties interface if you want to make this decision explicit or you can use these rest properties where you can basically add anything you want. It makes sense for something like a form input field because there are so many different properties that we can pass or not and we don't want to specify each of them in our interface. Okay, we uh, want to set a placeholder as well, which is another example of a REST property. It's not in our interface. We want to set this to title tour. We need register. That's required. Here we can simply pass the register that we get returned from React form hook. Register options are optional. And here we have to add two pair of curly braces because what we pass is a JavaScript object and that's why we need another pair of curly braces. We want to set required and use the required string the same as we did before. And now we can already save this and we see our second input field here. The one at the top is the new one through our text input field component. One more thing, we also want to pass the error here which we set to errors from React form hook dot title. So now when we don't add a title, the error is recognized properly. Okay, so we can delete the first input field here of the title. And then we want to create another text input field for the node body area. The name of this one is text the same as we used down here to register it. The label will say text. 
We use as text area. We set the rows. And here you can really see all these different combinations of properties that we can pass that we all want to handle through these rest props here. Because it would be a lot of work to add each of them to the interface and it would be very verbose. We add the placeholder, which will say text, and we register this. But this time we don't need register options and no errors because this is an optional field. We don't have to pass it. And there's our new text field. And now let's delete this one down here. Now the new text input field code is not really that much shorter, but the important part is that we don't have to repeat stuff like adding the correct margin all the time or all these different components. It's just a bit easier to use. And everything that's required, you can just add to the interface. Let's save this and see if adding a node still works. Another node. Blah, blah. And it's here at the bottom, so it still seems to work. Now let's create a sign up model through which we can create a new user account through our front end. Let's close the text input field code and the add edit node dialog code. And the API, we can actually close everything. And then let's create another component front end source components new file. We call it signupmodel.tsx. Copy this name and create a functional component in here. First, we need to define the input props interface. Sign up model props. We need an on dismiss callback so that we can close the model, a function that doesn't return anything. And we need another callback for when the sign up was successful so that we can set the user of our app to the newly signed up user. So on sign up successful. This is a function that gets a user passed to it and doesn't return anything. Then we add these properties down here, the usual way. On dismiss, on sign up successful, of type sign up model props. All right, and now we have to write a little bit of code. So first of all, we need our register form hook and the stuff. So we create a const curly braces, the same as in the add edit node dialog. We need a register. Let's actually add equals use form here at the end, right array, so that we have proper auto completion for these different fields. So we call use form, add this import statement if it didn't automatically. And the type for the input is our sign up credentials that we created in the notes API file earlier. So we add this type argument and call this. And now we have better order completion here. We need handle submit. We need form state, which we destructure to errors and is submitting. This is the exact same stuff we have done in the add edit node model before. Then we need a function that handles submitting this data. So an async function on submit. which will take the sign up credentials as input. We need to try catch block in case something goes wrong. As usual, we do alert with the error and we lock the error in the console. We need a handle to our notes API file. So let's duplicate this line and change this to a star as notes API from the network nodes API file, because we want to use this here. We create a const for the newly signed up user equals await nodes API. And we call our sign up function, which expects the sign up credentials passed to it. And if this went successful, we want to call our on sign up successful callback and pass this newly created user to whoever is showing this sign up model.
Now, even though we don't have a sign up button yet, we can still go into our aptsx file and show the sign up model already so that we can see what we are building while we are adding the form fields. So let's go into aptsx and down here where we already have some models set up. Let's put it here below, another pair of curly braces. And since we don't have a state yet, for now we just write true and to ampersand signs to show this model all the time. And here we want to use our sign up model, which expects the on dismiss callback on and the on sign up successful callback. And for now we just pass empty functions here to ignore these callbacks. But we have to finish our sign up model return statement here first before we can see it on the screen. So let's finish setting this up. This should return a model from the React Bootstrap package. We set show to true as before, and on height will trigger our on dismiss callback. In here we put a model dot header with a close button, and the title will say sign up. Below we put a modal body, which will contain our form. So we import this React Bootstrap form tag. We forward on submit to handle submit from the React hook form package and call on submit here, which is our own submit function. I don't explain this again because this is the same thing we have done in the add edit node dialog before. Now when we save this, we should actually see something on the screen. Nice, it's our empty model right now. And the formatting of the title is not correct yet because we also have to wrap this into a model title, which takes care of using the correct font size and everything. Then let's finish setting up our form down here. So we use our shiny new text input fields. The first one has the name username. The label username as well, just that we start with an uppercase because this will be visible to the outside. We set the type to text. We set the placeholder to username. We pass register from React form hook. We define register options with two pair of curly braces again, because this will be required. And we want to show an error here in case we uh, didn't enter anything into this field, which we get from errors dot username, also from React form hook. And when we save this, we see our first input field. Then we want to add a second one below for the email address and then one for the password. Email and password are very similar, so let's copy this. It takes the same attributes, but the name is email, the label is email, the type will be email as well. And this changes how the browser handles this input field. When we set the type to email, we actually get some simple input validation here which means that Chrome or any other browser that handles this will not accept an email that's not shaped like an email with an ad and everything. That's just a bit more useful than a normal text field, but it does not replace backend validation. Remember, because frontend validation can always be circumvented in one way or another. On the backend, we only check that an email exists. We don't actually check its shape. There are packages that you can use for that, but that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. You can look that up in Google. The placeholder will say email as well. Register is the same. It's also a required field, but for the error, we want to use errors.email. And then let's copy it once again for the password. And we can actually duplicate the code by highlighting it. And then we can press shift alt and the down arrow like this. But you can also just copy paste it the old way like a peasant. Okay, so the name of this field is password. The label is password. The type is password too, and this is pretty cool because it automatically hides the characters here. So these types are handled by the browsers. The placeholder will be password. 
register and register options stay the same and we use Arrow's password down here. Then of course we need a submit button. So below here we add another button which will say sign up and it needs some properties. We set the type to submit again so the browser recognizes this as a form submit button. But this time we don't have to specify the form ID because now we have put the button inside the form tag itself. Remember earlier we put such a submit button outside of the form then we had to connect it manually. But since this is inside the form the browser knows that this submit button belongs to this form. And when we press it it will automatically trigger this on submit callback here. Okay so we want to disable this button while the form is submitting so that we can't submit it twice at the same time. This is our button but I also want to give it a width of 100% so it fills up the full horizontal space. For this we can create another utility CSS class. Let's do that. Let's go over into a utils.module.css Add another class down here which I'm gonna call width 100. I think the name makes sense. And here we set the width to 100%. Save this. Go back into our sign up model and import our utility styles. So import style utils from where is it located? Dot dot styles slash utils dot module dot CSS. And now we can use it down here. Class name styleutils.width100 and looks much better in my opinion. Looks like a real sign up form. Let's format this properly like this and then try it out. So let's enter a new username florian2 florian2 at test.com and a password asd asd sign up now we don't have any feedback yet and the model doesn't close yet, but if everything went successful, we should see our new user in the database and also a session for it. So here is Florian Tour and there should be a, a cookie in our browser yet. Security is not secure is because we are on localhost. It will be secure when we deploy this with HTTPS. And there is our connect SID cookie. And now we should be able to uh, retrieve the user data without having to uh, send our login credentials again, unless we log out. Let's also try this email validation that I was talking about. So the browser yeah, actually recognizes this and shows this you know, error message here, if the email is misshaped. And also password managers recognize these input fields because we set these different types here, password and email and everything. So a password manager like one password or last pass will recognize that this is a password field and suggest your credentials to put in there. Now let's also create a login model. So we create another file here in our components folder. We call it login model and of course you can organize this into another folder if you want. But we don't have that many components in this tutorial so I keep it like this. And create another functional component in here. Let's start with the props interface. Login model props. As usual it's a dialog so it needs an on dismiss callback. And an on login successful callback which again gets the user passed to it so that we can use it in our front end. Then we add these properties down here. On dismiss, on load in successful, log in modal props. And then the setup is very similar to the sign up model. We need to set up our form. So let's write const curly braces equals use form of type login credentials that we put into our notes API file. And then we need register, we need handle submit, and we need form state errors and is submitting. 
we need our async submit function. So async function on submit, which takes the login credentials. Login credentials. Try catch. Alert error. Console error. Error. In try, we want to try logging in. Const user equals await. We need a notes API. Let's copy it from the sign up model here because we are lazy. This one here, notes API. The same location. Dot login. We pass the user login credentials. And if this went successful, we call on login successful and pass back the user. Okay, and then we need more forms. So in here, we create a model show on height. I don't explain this again because we have already done this a few times by now. Oops, what the hell is this? Model.header with a close button. Model.title that says login. Below the header, we put a model.body. And inside here, we put a form. On submit, handle submit, on submit. I heard that you like submits, so we put an on submit into a handle submit into an on submit. This was just a joke, by the way, don't get confused. And we need two text input fields. First one has name, username, label, username, type will be text, placeholder will be username, we set up register, we set up the register options, required, with the warning message required, and for error, we pass errors.username. That's a lot of work. Okay, let's duplicate this. For the password, so name, password, label, password, type password, placeholder, you guessed it, password, and errors.password. And then we need our submit button here as well. Let's copy this again. First of all, we need the style, the style utils, and the submit dot button down here. Copy this as well, go over here, paste it inside the form, just change the text to a login. I never know if it's one word or two word. It's very confusing. And we have to import the React Bootstrap button. Let's take a quick look at our login model. Over here, we set this to false. And we add another true to Amazon Science. Login model, we will later set this up properly. On dismiss and on login successful, for which we pass empty functions for now, just to see this. And as you can see, the browser already suggests to save the password because it recognizes this as sign up and the login form. Okay, here's our login form. Now it doesn't make sense to try this out right now. The cookie is already saved. First of all, we have to set up a navbar, and this navbar will then indicate if a user is logged in or not, because we will see the username in the navbar. Let's set this to false for now, so that we can set up our navbar. And for the navbar, as usual, we will use a React Bootstrap component. This is how these navbars here look. You can add different stuff to them, different colors, different buttons, and so on. So let's add it to our app. So we add another component to the components folder, which we call navbar. 
and I write the bar with an uppercase B like this, because the component from React Bootstrap is also called navbar but with a lowercase b, and this way the names don't clash. So we set up a functional component with the name navbar, and as usual we have to sign up the props interface with the arguments this navbar component will take. This navbar will take the locked in user as an argument so that we can display the name of the locked in user but also the correct buttons, either log in and sign up or log out. For this, we set the type of this to user from our models folder, vertical bar null. So this can be either the locked in user or null if there is no user locked in currently. Now, why don't I make this an optional property like this? Because I want to force the color of this navbar component to pass something here. If we used an optional parameter like this, then we could just omit this property completely. But our navbar doesn't work without a user, even if it's locked out, we need this information. So this is why we declare this type like this. Now we have to pass in a user, even if it's null. And then we need a few callbacks here for our different buttons, log in and out and everything. So the first one is called on sign up clicked. When we click the sign up button, we want to open our sign up model in the aptsx file. Now the question is, why don't we put the authentication models directly into a, the navbar component? Then we wouldn't need a callback to the apptsx file. This is definitely an option, but then you have to keep in mind that you can only open the models from within the navbar code. But you might have other triggers in your app later that also open the sign up or login model. For example, if the user tries to do an action that requires a user account. This is why we want to hoist this to the color of this navbar. Okay, and two more. Let's duplicate this. The second one is on login clicked. And then we have on logout successful. Because we will handle the logout directly in here. And then just notify the aptsx file so that it can remove the user data that's currently stored in the memory. Okay, then we add all these properties here. Locked in user, on sign up clicked, on login clicked, and on lock out successful. And the type is our navbar props. Okay, and then let's start building the navbar here in the return block. We use this navbar tag from React Bootstrap. Again, this one has a lowercase b. That's not our own component, it's the navbar from React Bootstrap. We can do some configuration here. We can set the background color to primary, which is this default blue that React Bootstrap components have. You can customize this with CSS if you want, but we won't do that here. The variant defines the text color. We set this to dark so that we have light text on the blue background. Expand defines at what screen size the navbar turns into this mobile mode, where we have this drop down menu that you will see in a moment. So this navbar is completely responsive and we set this to LG. To what size you set this depends on how many buttons you have in there. If there are a lot of buttons, of course, you have to collapse earlier. Otherwise, there will not be enough room. And we set the sticky attribute to top. This way, the navbar will always be visible, even if we scroll down. But that's up to you and your preference. Okay, inside this navbar, we add a container, which adds some padding so it looks better. And then we have different components available, which again, I know from the documentation. Navbar brand adds a text or an image to the left side, which many websites have. When you click it, you usually get back to the home page. So let's enter a text in here. Cool notes app, but you can also use an image if you want. And let's already display this navbar on our page while we are building it. So we go into the aptsx file, scroll up here, to the notes page container and we want to wrap this into another div because we don't want to put this navbar inside this container we want to put it above it so like this and then here we can use our navbar but this time with an uppercase b because that's our own one that's not a bootstrap one for the locked in user we just pass null right now and for the callbacks we pass empty callbacks 
we will fill this properly later when we have this data. So here we pass an empty function and there's our navbar. Of course it's not finished yet, but we can already see our brand text. Let's actually make this a bit bigger here. As I already mentioned, we want to show different content in our navbar depending if we are logged in or logged out. Because if we are logged out, we want to show a sign up and a login button. And if we are logged in, we want to show the username and the logout button. So now we could cram all of this in here, but it makes sense to extract this into separate files for better organization. So we create another component in our components folder. And we call this navbar locked in view. TSX. I think the name is self-explaining and we create a functional component with the same name. This takes some properties. So interface navbar locked in view props. The first one will be the user from our user models and this time it doesn't have to be nullable because we only show this if there is a user only if we are logged in. But we need a callback for logging out. On logout successful, just a callback that returns void. We add these properties here, user on logout successful of type navbar locked in viewer props. Then we need a function for logging out which we can put directly in this component. There's no real reason to hoist it to the outside, in my opinion, because the navbar is the only place where we have a logout button. So we create an async function that we call logout. Doesn't take any arguments. Try catch as usual, because even for logging out, something can go wrong because it's a post request to our server, which can always fail. In which case we want to lock the error and alert it. Then we need our notes API. So I'm going to copy this import statement here again. Await. It doesn't need to return anything. Notes API dot logout. And if this was successful, we call our callback. So that the apptsx file that contains the navbar can then remove the user from memory. And in here we put the content of the navbar. This will be two elements, the text with the signed in username and the logout button. And we want to display these two elements here in our navbar later. As I already explained, we can't put two elements into a return statement. They need one parent element. We could put this into a diff, but we basically just want to render them as they are inside this navbar here. So we use a fragment as we did earlier. And a fragment allows us to use two or more tags in a place where we could usually just use one. So navbar with a lowercase b, and that's the bootstrap one, dot text. We add a class name, me minus two, which adds some margin to the end of this text. And this will say signed in as colon. And then we use a variable. We want to print user.username. This will be shown in the navbar. And then we add our logout button, which will say logout. And it needs an on click attribute, which will simply call our logout function up here, which will then handle the rest. Now we also need a locked out navbar viewer. So we create another component. Navbar locked out viewer.tsx SFC. This doesn't need a user because there is no user locked in, but it needs callbacks for when we click the login or sign up button. So interface navbar locked out viewer props. And we need two callbacks. On sign up clicked. And can you guess it? On login clicked. We add these here. 
und sign up klickt und login klickt. The type is navbar locked out view props. And then in here we set up this view. Again, we create a fragment that will contain two buttons. The first one triggers our on sign up clicked callback and it says sign up. The second button triggers our on login clicked callback and the text says login. That's it for the navbar locked out view. Now let's go back to the navbar tsx file and finish this. So below navbar brand, we add navbar.toggle. This is this button that will later appear when the screen is small, where we can expand and collapse the menu in mobile view. This needs a property called area controls which defines what menu this toggle is responsible for. It will be responsible for the main navbar. So we type it in like this. And then below we add a navbar.collapse, which we give the same ID here. So this connects this toggle with this navbar collapse, which is the collapsible menu. So we set the ID to main navbar here as well. You can set any name you want. They just have to be identical. Close this, and in here we put this nav tag, which just aligns the elements properly. We give it a class name of MS Auto, which adds a margin start of auto to it, which means that these buttons and these elements will be moved all the way to the right. So they will be at the end here of our navbar. So we close this as well. And then what we show in here is either our navbar locked in or our locked out view depending if we are locked in or not. So we add a pair of curly braces and check our locked in user, which we pass to this navbar. In the next line, we add a question mark. If there is a locked in user, we want to show our navbar locked in view, which expects some arguments. It expects the user, which is the locked in user, which now can't be null anymore because we have this check up here. And our on logout successful callback, which we forward to on logout successful, which is the property that we pass to the navbar component. Now, as you can see, when you have components and other components, you often have to forward properties like this. So we have on logout successful in the navbar, but then we also have it in the navbar locked in view. To a certain point, this is okay. This is called prop drilling because you drill these props into different layers. If this gets too much, there are ways around this. For example, your React context, which you can Google. There's also something called React Query, which gives some convenience functions and hooks for when you fetch data from an API. But this is beyond the scope of this tutorial. Here we use good old prop drilling because you need to get a feel for how this works when you are a beginner. And below this line, we write colon for when the user is null. Then we want to show the navbar locked out view, which needs the on login clicked callback, which we forward to on login clicked. And the same for on sign up clicked. Okay, and after saving this, we can see that our toggle menu here appears. Let's make this bigger because at a certain point, this will not collapse anymore. Again, the size depends on what you want to put in here. We can actually make this expand point smaller because we only have these two buttons here. So let's set this to SM, which should be small. So now it should collapse a little bit later. So you can still, it's still expanded. And here it then collapses. I think that's more appropriate. You can set this back to LG if you add more stuff to the navbar that just gets too long. So now we actually want to check if the user is logged in and only show the nodes in this case. Again, we have to handle this in the apptsx file, but I actually want to organize the code that shows our nodes into a separate file because it doesn't really belong into apptsx. It's not good organization. And also it will make the code messy when we now have to add another conditional that checks if the user is null or not. 
So what we do is we create another component in the components folder, which we call notes page locked in viewer.tsx. Create a functional component with the same name. And then we want to cut out some code from the apptsx file and move it over there. The authentication models will stay in the apptsx file, but all these added and add notes dialogs belong to our new locked in view because they should only be available if a user is locked in. So we cut out notes to edit, show add notes dialog, the loading spinners and everything all the way up here to this button, cut this out, paste it over here. But since those are multiple elements, we have to put it into a fragment like this. Now we have to fix some import statements and you can do this by just removing the last letter and then auto completion will help you importing this again, at least for the components. Add edit note dialog. The other stuff here is mostly still over here. We need to copy over some states, basically all of those. Move them in here. Import use state. Mm, auto completion doesn't work. Let's copy it from over here. We need our node model. Yeah, we have to import this manually as well because of the name. So we copy this line, put it in here. We have to fix the folder where it's coming from. I think we only have to add a dot here. Yeah, that works. And we need our style utils. Let's copy this as well. Paste it here, fix the import as well. Should look like this, I think. Import a spinner from React Bootstrap. And our node grid is still over there. Of course, we need that as well. And we also need our delete node and load nodes functions. Actually, the whole use effect. So we cut out use effect with load nodes. We cut out delete node and our whole node grid. And even though it's a bit messy right now, it will be much better organized after we have done this. So let's paste this here. Still some imports missing. Notes API. Styles is missing. This one here, notes page. This is by the way, why I call this notes page module CSS and not app module CSS, because I knew that we have to refactor this later. Okay, and we need to import a row from React Bootstrap and call and our node component. And this looks good. I think we got everything. So let's organize the import statements properly for which there is a shortcut, Shift Alt O, which organizes them properly and gets rid of the one we don't use. Let's format and save the file and let's do the same over here. Shift Alt O, Shift Alt F to uh, align everything properly and let's save this. Then we want to create a little notes page locked out view, but don't worry, this will be uh, fast because we just print some text there. So uh, another component, notes page locked out view.tsx. We create a functional component. This one doesn't need to take any arguments. And it will return a paragraph tag, which says, please log in to see your notes. Of course, you can always make this more sophisticated in your real app, but for this tutorial, this will suffice. Okay, and now we have to connect everything in our apptsx file, set up the models and fetch the user and everything. And then we will be able to log in and out from our front end. So this was a lot of work, but we are almost done with this part. Okay, first of all, we need a state for the locked in user. 
When we open our page, which always executes this app component, we will try to fetch the logged in user from the backend by making a request to the get authenticated user endpoint. And remember, we are automatically sending our credential cookies. So we either get the user back if we are logged in, or we get a 401 response if we are not logged in, in which case we will just ignore this. And then we can use our website as a not logged in user. So we call this logged in user and the setter set locked in user which is a use state we have to import this again from react let's copy it from over here we will need the use effect as well use state of type user or null if there is no user locked in and we initialize this with null and we have to import our user type here. We will also do states that indicate if the sign up or the login model are showing. So below const show sign up model and set show sign up model. which is a use state that we initialize with false and we duplicate this for login. So show login model and set show login model like this. Then we need a use effect because as I said, as soon as we open this page, we wanna try loading the user, which is a side effect. So we add a use effect like this and before we forget it, we add an empty array down here so that we only execute this one time when we open the page. In here, we put an async function that we call fetch locked in user. Doesn't need any arguments. And below, we call this function. And I explained earlier where we have to do this because we can't make this function that we pass to use effect async. We have to do it over this intermediate function. And this gets a try catch block. If there is an error, including our 401 response, we actually don't want to show a dialog to the user. We just want to lock the error to the console because otherwise every time the page is opened without cookies, it would show an error message, which we don't want. Now later, we will implement a way to distinguish between different errors so that we could still show an error message if it is not a 401 response, but for now this is sufficient. And here we will try to fetch the user and save the return value in a variable. So const user equals await user. Notes API, we have to import this. Dot get locked in user which we have set up earlier, or the import statement is not correct. Like this. Doesn't need any input because again, it will automatically send the cookie that we have stored. And if this went without an error, then we want to set our locked in user state to what we get back. And we are almost done. To our navbar down here, we want to pass the locked in user. And the navbar will then use this information to uh, decide what content to show. But we will see this in a bit. On login clicked, we'll set show login model to true. And on sign up clicked, we'll set show sign up model to true. And in on logout successful, we know that we successfully destroyed the session. Then we want to set locked in user back to null. And the beauty of the declarative UI is that all of this will stay in sync automatically. When we set the locked in user to null, our navbar will automatically be re-rendered with the null locked in user and the same after locking in. But you will see this in action in a short moment. Here for sign up model, we use our show sign up model state and here show lock in model. And up here, we want to show the content of this page depending if we are locked in or not. So we have to add a fragment because otherwise we can't add this conditional here. Here we check for the locked in user. If there is a locked in user, we want to display the notes page locked in viewer. And otherwise, 
the notes page locked out view. Again, this automatically re-renders when this locked in user state changes. And these two components don't take any props because they are completely self-contained, they handle their own state. Let's actually take these models and move them out of this container. It doesn't matter because the models are not affected by the container, but for better overview, I want to have them in this outer div here. And now that I saved this file, you can see that our navbar already displays the locked in view. Really cool. But we still have to fill these callbacks down here. So on this miss in the signup model, we'll set show signup model back to false. On this miss down here, we'll set show login model to false. And remember when we sign in or log in, then we get the user back from the API so that we don't have to run our fetch locked in user again. Instead, we can set our user state directly from the return value. So both of them get a user passed back because this is what we defined here in this callback. In both of them, we want to set the locked in user to the return value. So I duplicate the cursor like this and I type set locked in user and I pass the return value like this. And we also want to close the models again. So set show signup model false and set show lock in model false and then we save everything. Okay, and now let's try the different states. So when we lock out, the user should be set to null if it went successful and our nodes should disappear and we should see the locked out view. There it is. We will fix the padding later, but for now this is cool. Let's try to log in Florian tour with a wrong password first invalid credentials. We will put this error message into the log and dialog later instead of this alert dialog because this is a bit annoying, but for now this is fine. Log in. It works. The browser suggests to save the password. Don't want to do this right now. And now we can see our notes again and the navbar updates. And again, this is the beauty of declarative UI. Everything is synchronized through our state automatically, basically, as long as we declare it correctly. Of course, right now, nodes are not tied to a specific user yet. So if I log out with Florian 2 and log in with Florian 1 or just Florian, then we see the same nodes. Oh, I forgot my credentials. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Yeah. Then we see the same nodes as in the other account. We will make it so that each user has their own nodes later in this tutorial, but at least signing in and out works already. Let's also try out if the cookie expiration works. So I go into our backend code once again, and I'm gonna set this to, uh, I don't know, 20 seconds, but I will reword this in a moment just to see if this expires correctly. So I save this, I log out here, then I log in again to create a new session. And then I wait 20 seconds and refresh the page and see if we are still logged in. We shouldn't because I set the cookie max age to 20 seconds, but this will automatically refresh the session if we do something on the page while the session is still valid. But if we don't do anything, this will expire. Okay, 20 seconds have passed and when I refresh this, we are not locked in anymore because the session expired. But I want to keep this at one hour or however long you want. You can also increase this value. And yeah, the next step is to actually tie nodes to a specific user accounts. So that's what we will do now. In order to tie a node to a specific user, we have to make a little change to the node schema in our backend code. So let's search for the nodes model in our backend here. Here we want to add one additional field to the schema. I'm going to put it at the top. You can also put it somewhere else. doesn't matter. We want to store the ID of the user that created this node. So later when we retrieve nodes, we can only retrieve the nodes for a particular user. The type of this field will be mongoose's object ID type that we already used earlier. That's the one we store in our session. So we already have schema here imported, so we can just type schema.types 
dot object id and we set require to true so that every node needs a user id attached to it comma and then we save these changes and then in our nodes routes we want to do the same as we did in our get authenticated user function inside the users controller we want to check the idea that's stored in the session and if there is no id stored in the session we want to return a 401 response because the user is not authenticated and they shouldn't be able to retrieve or update or delete nodes but this means that we have to repeat this piece of code with the same error message in many different endpoints. Instead of repeating this for every endpoint, it makes sense to extract this logic into our own middleware. And then we can use this middleware like we used any other middleware by attaching it to the routes that we want to protect. So let's do that now. In the source folder of our backend, we create a new folder, which we call middleware. Here you can store all kinds of middleware that you create yourself. And let's call it off.ts. A middleware is basically just a request handler, just like our endpoint controllers. So we create an export const. Let's call it requires off. Off type request handler. Rec rest next. We already know that. And in here we simply check if there is a session in the request object that contains the user ID. In other words, if a user is logged in. That's what we did in get authenticated user earlier up here. Then we want to call next and next without an error simply calls the next middleware. So it forwards the request and the response object to the next middleware in the row, which will then be the endpoints itself. Else, if there is no authenticated user, we want to throw an HTTP error. Now we could wrap this into a try catch block and throw an error here, but we can also just call next and forward the error directly. And since we don't have any other code in here that can throw, this is more concise. Remember, we trigger our error middleware at the very end simply by passing the error to the next function. This is also what we did in all our endpoints just that those were the errors that we caught in the try-catch block. But we can also forward an error to the next function directly. Yeah, and here we want to use our 401 error that says user not authenticated with the correct spelling, of course. And now we can use this middleware on all endpoints that we want to protect and we don't have to repeat this code. And now let's use this for our endpoints and let's start with our get authenticated user endpoint here. So what we do is we remove this check here. This will be replaced by our new middleware. And then we can also remove this intermediate variable. We can keep it, but we can also just pass rec.session.userID here directly because we don't use it in another place. We save this, then we go to the user's routes and use this middleware here. We want to use it for the get authenticated user endpoint. Let's see if auto import works. It does. Requires off. It adds this import here at the top. And the order of these middlewares of course matter. We first want to check if the user is authenticated before we call our endpoint handler. Otherwise this one here would be executed first and then we would check for off which doesn't make much sense. So to see if this still works, let's save our code and then open our website again. So the session has timed out meanwhile. Let's refresh the page and it says user not authenticated. So we are still getting our 401 response, but we shouldn't get it anymore after logging in. So let's refresh it once again and we get our authenticated user with a 200 response. So it seems like our endpoint still works properly, just that we extracted the authentication logic into this middleware. And now we can reuse it on other endpoints as well. And we basically want to use it on all nodes endpoints, right? Because you can't really interact with nodes if you are not authenticated. 
So let's do that now. And now we can decide if we want to add our requires of middleware only to specific node endpoints, in which case we could add them here. But we actually want to add it to all of them. So we can make it easier and add it one level higher. We can add a middleware right here before we forward to any of our nodes routes. So here before nodes routes, we also call requires of. And now, just like that, all our nodes endpoints are protected by our authentication middleware. Let's try it out in Postman. First of all, let's remove this once again for a short moment just to see that we can still retrieve all nodes if we don't have this middleware. So we want to make a get request to slash api slash nodes. Yeah, which returns us all nodes right now. Now let's put the middleware back in. And there are no cookies set right now, so we shouldn't be authenticated. And now it says user not authenticated with a 401 response, which is triggered by our middleware. And this should also work for creating new nodes, updating or deleting nodes, and everything else we add to the nodes routes. So let's try deleting a node from our database. I already refreshed this. Just take a random node here. This idea, slash nodes, slash this idea a delete request, we are not authenticated, user not authenticated. But right now this only means that a user has to be logged in to interact with the nodes. But once they are logged in, every user can still interact with all nodes. Because we haven't added any logic that allows a user to only retrieve their own nodes or modify their own nodes. So let's do that now in our nodes controller. So the authentication check is already in place. We only reach this endpoint if we are authenticated. So now what we want to do is we want to get the authenticated user idea. So const authenticated user idea from the session. So rec.session.user idea. But now we still have a little bit of a type problem because authenticated user ID could be possibly undefined. There is no guarantee that we set the user ID on the session. Now we kind of know that there is a user ID because we have this middleware in between that checks for the user ID and throws a 401 error if there is none. But for one, TypeScript doesn't know this. It's not smart enough to uh, recognize the middleware and say, okay, the user ID will definitely be defined. But secondly, even we can't really know it because we can accidentally remove this middleware. And then this user ID could be undefined. And as I explained earlier, using undefined values in our code is a bit dangerous because it could make our app misbehave. So one way to handle this is just to uh, be confident that we added our middleware everywhere. And whenever we can't use an undefined value, we can use the non-null assertion operator, the exclamation mark. But it's actually better to have another check in place that makes sure that the user ID actually has a value. So for this reason, I want to create another function that does this check. We put this into the util folder of our backend code. New file, let's call it assert is defined.ts and let's copy the name because the function that we put in there will have the same name. From here we want to export one function with this name and this function will take a generic type argument which we do like this with a pair of angle brackets and a big T in between. And then in between the parentheses we write val colon t val is just a variable name you can give this any name you want and if you haven't worked with generic types before which is a feature that many languages have this t basically allows us to pass any type to this function so why don't we use any instead of t because we actually want to get a non-nullable type back there is a feature for that in typescript which we do like this we add a colon for the return type but instead of defining a simple type we write asserts, which is a special TypeScript keyword. Asserts val is non-nullable and then again of this type tier. And then we add curly braces for the function body. Now, if this is confusing to you, don't worry. You don't need to understand this in detail and this function will be very small. It's just a nice feature to use. But as a simple explanation, this function allows us to pass any type to it and then it will check that this type is not null. And then on the outside where we use this function, we get the non-nullable type back. That's basically it. And this also works for undefined. So if we use this for our possibly undefined user ID here, we can use this function and then know that it is indeed an object ID. 
otherwise this function will throw an error, which we do in the function body. So here we check if exclamation mark val. So if val is undefined or null, then we want to throw an error. Because again, it's better to throw an error if there's something wrong in our code rather than using the wrong value and having the server misbehave. And in here we pass an error message, something that allows us to later identify the error. So let's write expected and then in single quotes val to be defined but received and then we can add val itself which will then say null or undefined depending on what the value is. And that's all for this function. If you want to learn more about the syntax, you can read the documentation, but for our example here, this is all we need. And in here we want to use this new function. Let's put it into the try block so that if this function throws, our whole server doesn't crash, only this endpoint here will return a 500 response, which is appropriate because we messed something up in our code when this happens. So we call assert is defined and pass the authenticated user ID. And this is actually all we have to do. When we use this authenticated user ID afterwards, it will have the appropriate type because TypeScript is smart enough to now infer this type because of this special syntax here. This function asserts that authenticated user ID is defined, so it has a value. Again, you don't have to do this, but it's a nice security measure and I think it's a cool TypeScript feature to learn about. And now in our find call down here, we only want to return the nodes for that specific user. So we add a pair of curly braces to add a filter here. We want to check the user ID of our node model that we just added a moment ago. And we want to compare it with the authenticated user ID, which now definitely has a value because we are past this assert as defined check. Before we add this to the remaining endpoints, let's quickly try it out. Let's remove the requires of middleware from the nodes routes once again. And let's try to make a get request without being authenticated. An unknown error occurred. It's a 500 response with this generic error message because it's not a HTTP error we threw here. And in our apt-s file, we only handle HTTP errors and otherwise we fall back to this an unknown error occurred message. But I think this is fine because when an error like this happens, the user doesn't really need to know what happened in our code. Instead, we just lock this error, which will print the whole message to the console. So it should be visible in our backend terminal. Yeah, expect this value to be defined, but received undefined. And as long as we know it, everything is fine. The user doesn't have to see this error message. Now let's add this to our remaining endpoints here. Get node is the next one. Here we also want to get the authenticated user ID. So let's copy paste this line. Then at the start of the try block, we want to check assert is defined to make sure this has a value. So we have to reuse this everywhere. And then we have to add some code that only allows a user to access this node if the user IDs fit, right? So after the node was found, we can check if this node belongs to this user. So we do if exclamation mark node dot user ID, which is of type object ID. And to compare objects IDs, we have this equals function here that belongs to this type. We want to compare it with the authenticated user ID. So exclamation mark, so if they don't match, then we want to throw another error. Throw create HTTP error for a one response for not authorized. You cannot access this node. Maybe without the exclamation mark. And now this node endpoint is protected properly. The next one is create node. Again, we need to extract the authenticated user ID from the session. Let's do it here. We need to check that it's defined. So we copy this as well, the start of our try block. And now when we create this node, we also have to pass the user ID. It's a required field now. So this wouldn't work without the user ID. And since we have our off middleware, we shouldn't be able to get to this create nodes function unless we are authenticated. So we want to store the authenticated user ID in the node as well. 
then we copy this authenticated user ID once again. For update node, we copy assert as defined, put it here. And then we want to do the same thing as we did for get node. We want to copy this block here. You cannot access this node. And do this check after we checked if this node actually exists. Now, of course, you can always extract some of this validation logic into a separate function that you can put, for example, directly into this controller file. For simplicity, I will just copy paste the code that we need on different endpoints, because maybe you also want to use different error messages for the different endpoints, in which case you have to write the stuff over and over again. And one more time for delete node. So again, we copy this line, paste it here. We copy assert as defined. Paste it here and we need our check for the user ID as well after we check that the node exists and save everything. So now after saving everything, when we refresh our front end, these nodes here should disappear because they are not tied to a user. They don't have a user ID attached to them. But now we only get nodes with our authenticated user ID back which is stored in the session cookie, this one. So let's refresh this page. You don't have any nodes yet. Let's create a node for this user, authenticated node. This is my private node. Okay, there's still something off with the formatting. I know why, we will fix this in a moment. For now, let's log out with this user, with Florian. Log in with Lorian2. Who doesn't see this node? Because it's now tied to a specific user account. Florian2's node. This node is secret. So again, this is attached to this user account. Log out into the other one. And we won't see this node. Only our own one. Nice. Now let's fix this formatting here real quick. Earlier in our notes page module CSS file, we created this notes grid class with width 100, but we never used it anywhere. So we go into our notes page locked in viewer. And when we scroll down, we have a typo here. We called it note grid, but the class is called notes grid. Now it should be fixed. Yeah. It looks better now. Let's add a second node. Authenticated node number two. And the layout looks good now. And when we look into our database, we will see that our new nodes now have a user ID attached to them. Our old nodes don't because we created them before we required the user ID. But here our new nodes have this user ID. So these other nodes are basically orphaned now. No one will be able to receive them. You can delete them from the database. You can keep them as a memory. I don't care. And our backend code is finished for now. We now created a fully blown server with user authentication and different endpoints. Of course, there are more features and little things you can add, but you can always figure this out yourself or keep an eye open for my future courses that I'm building where I also want to cover more advanced topics. But this is already pretty cool. The course is not quite over yet because we still have to make some improvements to our front end. First of all, the styling isn't great yet. There are still some problems here, we like the missing padding. But even more important, there are some improvements we want to make to the way we handle errors so that we don't only always show the alert dialog, which is really annoying. And I also want to show you how you can navigate between different pages in React because we haven't done this yet. We only have this one page right now. We will add additional pages and then navigate between them so that they are even represented in relative URLs on our front end, like localhost 3000 slash privacy, for example. And remember, after that, there is another video waiting for you on Linode's channel where we deploy this whole thing to a real server. 
And if you want to put this project into your portfolio, for example, to get hired later, it's a good idea to actually deploy something to production rather than only putting the project on your GitHub profile. Because this way you can prove that the thing you build actually works and it's easier for recruiters and employers to uh, access your project and try it out without access to your GitHub account. So you don't want to miss out on the part where we deploy this whole thing. To navigate between different pages in our React app, we can use this very popular package called React Router. Because remember, in a React app, everything is one single page, basically. And the only thing we can really do is replacing components that are rendered on the screen. But React Router basically gives this process more structure by mapping different components that we use as pages to different relative URLs so that we can have something like a slash privacy page where we render the page component for the privacy policy, slash nodes, and so on. As usual, the documentation for this package is humongous, but we don't need to know all of this. You can just follow along, but we need to install it. So let's open the terminal for the front end. So I'm gonna ZD into the front end and we run NPMI react router dom that's the name of the whole package that we need install this sucker and right now here in our aptsx file our notes page is hard coded yeah into the page what we want to do is we want to extract this into a separate file so that we can replace this part here when we navigate to different pages so let's create a new folder in our front end source folder here, which we call pages. And inside this pages folder, we create a file called notes page.tsx, where we want to extract this piece of code here into. So let's split the editor, create a functional component with the same name. And then we cut out this container here, put it over here, fix the import statements, container from React Bootstrap, notes page locked in viewer from our own components, and the locked out viewer. We also need the styles, which we can cut out here, paste here. But this page needs the currently logged in user to know which of the views here to render. So we have to pass this as a property. So we create an interface, notes page props, which receives the logged in user, which can be logged in or not. So it's either user or null if the user isn't logged in. And then we add the prop down here locked in user and the type of these props is notes page props. And now the same as before, we check this user to decide if we render the locked in view or the locked out view and the rest works the same as before. We can also remove these unused import statements over here, shift alt o and they are gone. Before we set this up, let's create another page that we can navigate to. I'm gonna close this and create another file in the pages folder, which I call privacy page.tsx. We create a functional component with the same name. And I actually hired a lawyer just to make this course that came up with a elaborate privacy policy. He told me to write this. We care about your privacy promise. This way you are safe and no one can ever sue you. Of course, that's a joke. I can't take any liability for your privacy policy or any other legal topics. This is not legal advice. Let's save this and let's actually create a third page. I want to have a fallback page for when we try to access a URL that doesn't exist. So we want a page not found page. So we create another file in the pages folder, which we call not found page tsx again this contains a diff with a paragraph that says page not found of course you can make this always more elaborate 
Okay, back into our app TSX file. In order to implement React Router DOM, we have to wrap this whole div here into this browser router tag. This basically activates this routing functionality. And this is the place where we want to navigate between our different pages. The navbar is unaffected by this because the navbar stays in place no matter what page we are on, right? And our models can also show on any page because they are triggered by the buttons in our navbar. So in between these two parts where our notes page code was before, we add a container from React Bootstrap. Again, container centers the content and gives it some padding. And also I want to add some styling to it later. And in here we add this routes tag. This one here, routes from React Router. As the name implies, this allows us to set up routes in here between which we can navigate. And now registering these different routes is actually quite easy. For each route, we create a route tag. This time it's not routes, it's route. We close this tag and then we give it two attributes. The first one is the path, so the relative URL to this page. For the first one, we just use a slash because we want to show our notes page on the base URL. You can also put this on slash notes and add a different home page, but that's something you can do yourself. Then we have to define the element, which is the component that we want to render for this page. So between curly braces, we pass our notes page component that we created earlier, which takes the locked in user as a prop. And then let's add the other pages as well. So we create another route. The second one will go to a slash privacy. And for the element, we want to render the privacy page. And for any URL that we didn't specify, we want to fall back to our not found page, which you can do like this. We add another route, but for the path, we pass slash and a star. This fits any URL, but before it checks this one, it checks the ones above it. So if none of these match, it will fall back to this one here. And for the element, we pass our not found page. And as simple as that, our routes are set up. Let's save everything open our cool notes app and there seems to be something wrong with an import here in the notes page tsx file and the import to the css module is wrong so notes page dot tsx i guess that's two dots now let's try it out yeah, and now it works again so let's try it out manually let's type in slash privacy in the url and here's our nice privacy policy. Of course, the styling is not good. You can improve this yourself if you want. And then let's type in a URL that doesn't exist and we fall back to our page not found page. And now before we go to the next step, let's fix the padding here. So what we can do is we can take the container of this page and just add some padding to the top and it will be applied to all our pages here. So back into apptsx, we need a new CSS module for our apptsx file because all the other CSS move to these different pages and components we created. So we create another file in styles, which we call app.module.css. And again, this module will be scoped to the apptsx file and not clash with any other class names. And here I want to create a page container class on which we set a padding. Gonna use 32 pixels for the first value, which are the vertical values, so top and bottom. And for the left and right side, I'm gonna use zero because everything is centered anyway. And then we import this in apptsx. Import styles from dot slash styles slash app dot module dot CSS. And then we scroll down to our container here and add this class styles.pagecontainer. 
And now when we save this and open our cool notes app again, we have this padding here applied, which will work on any page now. Looks much better. Now let's add a menu point to our navbar with which we can navigate to our privacy page. And let's make this brand text here behave like a link too, so we can click it to get back to our notes page. So back into our code, we want to go into our navbar component. So above this nav with MS Auto, we create another nav tag. We put it outside of this part here because these buttons will be on the right side and I want to have the links on the left side. This is why it goes outside of this margin start auto tag here. And also from Bootstrap, we have these nav link components, which just add a properly styled link to the nav bar that looks good. This one will say privacy and it needs an href attribute, which is the link where we want to link this to. We want to go to slash privacy. So let's save this and try it out. We now have this link up here and when we click it, we go to the privacy page. But if you pay close attention, the way this works is not quite optimal yet. Since this is a normal link, it will actually refresh the whole page which means that the user that we stored in memory disappears for a moment and we also see the navbar flashing up because the whole page is replaced. Let's take a look at it again. It looks weird. You can see that we are locked out for a moment, so to speak. Why? Because it's fetching the user again. We don't want it to behave like this. Instead, we want this to behave like a real app where the navbar stays in place and only these parts down here are replaced, right? This is why we can't use a normal href link for internal app navigation because it will always refresh the page. To handle this internal app navigation, we want to use a special link component from the React router package. We have to import this manually. I checked it a moment ago. The auto completion didn't work. So we import it like this. Link between curly braces from React router DOM down here. And then we go inside the nav link and we wrap this privacy text into this React router DOM link. And then we cut out the slash privacy here, remove the href attribute because we want to let the React router DOM link navigate, which we do via this tour prop. Now the syntax is very verbose with this nav link and this link inside it. We will actually improve this in a moment, but for simplicity, I want to show it like this first. So we go to the cool notes app again, and now the styling is completely off. As you can see, the color doesn't work properly anymore, which is the case because we nested these different components, but we will fix this in a moment. The important thing is when we now click this, we will navigate to the privacy page, but the navbar will not refresh and the user will stay locked in. Click it, and as you can see, it's a much smoother transition. And even when we press the back button, the behavior is the same. It doesn't refresh the whole page. But now let's fix the styling here. What we can do is we can keep using the nav link, but we can render it as a link from the React Router DOM package. And again, I figured this out through Google. This is a special syntax that we can use on these bootstrap components. And this feature is called render props. It's a certain design pattern in React that you can also build yourself if you need it. And some packages like React Bootstrap use that for certain components. So what we can do is on the nav link, we can pass this as prop with one as, not two. And here we can tell React Bootstrap to use the styling and everything from the nav link, but actually render a different component when this is displayed on the screen. And in here we can pass the link from React Router DOM. And the cool thing is, now that we render this as a React Router DOM link, it also behaves like a React Router DOM link. This is why we now see this error that tells us that we need this two attribute. That's the two attribute down here. Now that we render this link up here, we have to pass this two attribute here as well. And now we can remove this intermediate link here in between. And now basically we are using a React Router DOM link but we are using the styling of a normal bootstrap nav link. So when we save this and go back to our app, now the styling is correct again and it behaves like a React router link. 
Okay, now let's also make the cool notes app brand text here clickable. So we go into navbar brand and here we use this as attribute as well. We want to render a react router link and we want to navigate to slash as a string. So this is just the home page. And that's already it. Can save this, try it out. And now this one here is clickable as well. You can go to privacy and back to the home page. Cool stuff. Okay, our page itself is almost complete, but there's one more important topic I wanna teach you and that's how we can distinguish between different errors on our front end. Because right now, for every error, we do the exact same thing. We lock the error message and show an alert dialog, but you might wanna handle different errors differently. So that's what we will learn next. Distinguishing between different errors on the front end allows us to handle them differently. For example, when we try to log in with invalid credentials and we get a 401 error back, then we probably want to display this differently than internal Zora errors, for example. So if the credentials are incorrect, we want to display a little error text here above the input fields. So what we do is we go into our front end code and create a new file here. We put it into a front end source. Here we create a new folder first, which we call errors. And in here we create a file called HTTP errors.ts. And in here we define some classes that allow us to distinguish between different errors that we receive. Now I guess we could also use the HTTP errors package that we used on the back end, but I think this is a bit overkill because it has all these functions to create errors. But on the front end we don't want to create errors, we only receive them and want to distinguish between them. So I think we don't need to add this package, instead we will just create some small classes that allow us to uh, distinguish between these different errors. So what we do is we create a class called HTTP error extends error. We use a class instead of an interface this time because error is also a class and we want to extend the normal error to add our own fields to it. In here we add a constructor. If you have any programming experience then you know what a constructor is. The same as the normal error class, our class will take an optional message that we can store in this error and show later. So question mark colon, it will be of type string. And then we want to pass this message to the super class to store it in the normal error message field. So we call super and pass the message here. The reason why we overwrite the constructor is because we also want to set the name attribute of the error and set it to this.constructor.name. And this means that when we create a subclass of HTTP error, it will use the name of the class itself and put it into this name field. And now below we want to do exactly that. We want to create a few subclasses of HTTP error that then allow us to distinguish between different error codes. And we export these because we want to use them on the outside. We don't want to use the generic HTTP error on the outside. Only the subclasses are meant to be used throughout our code. So we write export class and the first one is for 401 responses when we are not authorized. So we call it unauthorized error and it extends our HTTP error class. And again, all our HTTP error class does is basically putting the name of unauthorized error into the name field of the error class. And every class needs a body, but we can keep this body empty because we don't want to do anything special in here. We just need this name to distinguish between the different error codes. And we will also add a documentation comment here with a slash and two star symbols. And here we can write a message that we will then see when we hover over this class. Just gonna set this to a 401. So now when we hover over unauthorized error, we can see 401. Or actually, let's write status code 401. This just makes it a bit easier later to uh, remember what the status code each error was. And then we create a second one below. Export class. 
we call this one conflict error, which we use for 409 responses. For example, when we try to sign up with an email that already exists. It also extends HTTP error with an empty body. And we add a documentation comment here as well, status code 409. And I'm also going to add another comment here at the bottom, which will say, add more error classes if you need distinction. This is just a reminder for you that you can always add more error classes here. Then we go into our notes API file here in our network folder and all the way up into fetch data where we now want to distinguish between these different errors because right now we always throw this generic error class. So we go above this line and we simply check for the status code so that we know which error we have to throw. So if response.status is equal to 401, then we want to throw an unauthorized error, which will also contain the error message. And we actually have to add the new keyword here in front of it. For normal errors, you don't have to do this. You can if you want. But since this is our own custom class, we have to add a new keyword in order to instantiate it. Then we do an else if, because now we want to check if response.status is equal to 409. In which case we want to throw a conflict error, which will also take the error message. And only if both of those are not the case, we want to go to the else block and throw our normal error. And we can also make the error message a bit more elaborate. So we see which status code we got from the error message itself. So I'm going to pass a string that says request failed with status colon. Then I append response.status and add something more to the string. Message colon and the error message. You don't have to do this, but I think it's a good idea. Now let's save this and update a few places in our app. First of all, let's go into our login model. And instead of always showing this alert message, when we get a 401 response back because the password or the username was wrong, we want to show an error message that is embedded in the dialog directly instead. So first of all, we need a state for this that decides if this error message is shown or not. So const, let's call it error text and set error text equals use state. Auto import often doesn't work for use state. I don't know why. Let's take it from somewhere else. Here, use state. We actually don't need use effect. We call use state. We set the type to string or null, because if there is no error, we want to set this to null. Then here in the catch block, we want to check if error instance of, which is a keyword that we can use to uh, compare the type of this error. If this is an instance of unauthorized error, which has the status code 401, we can remember this by hovering over it. Then we want to set the error text to error.message. And if this is any other type of error, we want to do the same as before. We want to show the alert dialog or just lock it or whatever you want. And we will lock the error in both cases. So we put it outside of the if block. And now we also need an element in the model body here that actually displays this error. Let's put it here inside the model body, but above the form. We check if error text is defined. So error text and two ampersand signs. Then we want to show an alert, which is another bootstrap component. And this alert will show the error text from the state. And we set the variant to danger, which gives this some nice styling. It makes it red. Let's save it and try it out. Let's go to our cool notes app 
and try to log in with invalid credentials and now we see this message here instead. But any error that's not a 401 error will just show the usual alert dialog as we had before. Let's do the same for our sign up model. So we open the sign up model TSX file. Again, we need a state, const, error text and set error text. Use state, again, we have to import this manually. Use state of type string or null and we initialize it with null. And then down here, we want to check if error instance of, and this time we use conflict error, which is the status code that we return when the username or the email is already in use, right? 409. Then we want to set the error text to error.message. Else we want to use the same alert as we had before, and we want to lock the error in both cases. Again, we need our alert warning here in the model body. So error text to ampersand science alert variant danger and for the text we display the error text. Okay, let's try this out as well. So we open the sign up model and I use a username that already exists. Uh, test at test.com. We try to sign up and we see username already taken. Please choose a different one or log in instead. And this is the error message that's coming from our server, from our user controller. Username already taken and the other one, which you can try out as well. So we use a different username, but an email that already exists. I forgot which email I used earlier, florian2 at test.com. A user with this email address already exists. And we get the error message directly from the server because we read it from the response body and then pass it to our error here. And then we display this in the UI through this error.message field. And of course, you can use the same approach to distinguish between different errors in different places in your app and this way decide what you want to do with them. All right, we have successfully created our first MERN app. This is a special moment that you will always remember. And of course, you will like this video and share it with someone that could need it because this helps me. And you are a very thankful person that wants to give back. Or so I heard. Remember that there is another video where we deploy this whole thing on Linode's channel. You can find the link in the video description below. You definitely have to watch this as well because building this app and then not deploying it would be a waste. Also, of course, there are a lot more features we could add to our Mern app. And keep an eye open on this channel because I want to make more web development tutorials. So subscribe if you haven't yet. And if you build a cool project on top of our Mern app we built here, if you have some cool features that you added or a project that you deployed or added to your portfolio, then I would be very happy if you tag me on Twitter and just show it to me. Tag me at either at coding and flow or flow underscore Walter, which is my personal account. Doesn't matter which one. And then I wish you best of luck and happy coding. Take care.